Good morning, everyone. The conference will be starting in few minutes. A very good morning to one and all present here. I welcome you all to the second day of ninth Go Green Summit on December 29th and 30th, 2023, organized by BioLix, Kurukshetra University, University Malaysia Kalendan, Global Forum for Sustainable Development, GFSRD, our academic partner, and United Innovators, our research partner. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce and welcome the keynote speakers for today. M. Rajesh, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, the American College, India. Dr. Mazrina Binti Mahat Nadzi, Senior Lecturer, Manager, School of Chemical Engineering, University of Science, Malaysia. Dr. Kushal Majai, Assistant Professor, School of Planning and Architecture, India. Dr. Sunita Dalal, Professor, Department of Biotechnology, Kripshetra University, India. Dr. Makamat Muktada Ali Khan, Associate Professor, Faculty of Earth Science, University Malaysia, Kalantan. I would like to welcome and introduce the session charts from Kurukshetra University for today. E.R. Shivani Gad, Assistant Professor. Dr. Hardik Rai Sharma, Assistant Professor. Dr. Sandeep Gupta, Assistant Professor. Now, I would like to welcome all the participants and we are looking forward to our active participation today. I would like to thank each and every one of you who have gathered here. Now, 
I would like to welcome our first keynote speaker of the day. I request Mr. Uh -huh. M. Rajesh to render the lecture. Sir. So, thank you, ma'am. Uh -huh. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, shall I share the screen, ma'am? Yes, sir. Sure. We'll stop sharing. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. We can able to see a slide. Could you please uh, share in full screen mode, sir? Yes, okay, sir. Ma Fine. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Out, out, so, uh, my sincere thank to the 9th Go Green Summit organized by BioLeaks. And it's a great pleasure to be a part of this conference, virtual conference. And uh, I also thank the organizer and as well as the uh, collaborator uh, who are involved in making this uh, 9th Go Green Summit visible to everyone in the global. And it is the need of the hour. And uh, everyone must know about green, how we can... I request the body. Sorry, sorry. I request all the body stones to move I request all the body stones to move your cell. Yes, the people are the participants to yes, mute yourself so, so that I can speak. You can hear without any disturbance. Yes, sir. No, you can continue. Okay. Sorry, sir. And uh, uh, I'm happy to be a part of this conference. I, I thank the organizer as well as the collaborators. And I am from American College. And you can see the uh, in the screen, which is a main hall of 142 years old. My college is a 140 years old, uh, started in 1881. And we have, and our management have very much interested in making our college not only a concrete jungle and as well as a green jungle. And we are uh, in our college, we are having more than 1,500 trees, trees are present, including shrubs, herbs, and everything. And also, I am happy to uh, share, we are having 38 species of birds, and which is documented by our uh, zoology students of American College. And uh, every year, it, the number is increasing and new uh, species are uh, coming to our college because our college is having uh, nice residence for them. And as well as we documented more than 45 plus butterfly species in our campus. And not only that, we are having poisonous uh, cobra as well as non-poisonous snakes, which is roaming in, in, in our college. And we are also having a mangoes. We are having a unique uh, white colored mangoes in our campus. And I am happy to uh, share the news of our college is not only of education institution, which provide education to more than 10,000 students, and as well as a rich biodiversity campus. And with this short note, I am going into my topic. And uh, uh, the topic is related, the theme of that uh, Go Green Summit, reshaping the earth with eminent technologies, right? And I'm going to uh, give some outline about how the animals are in global reshaping the earth without introducing the, the latest technology or uh, something you called about eminent technology. 
and I am concentrating on why biodiversity is important. What is the role of biodiversity in reshaping the earth without human interference? Right. And uh, everybody knows healthy environment and that is the foundation of human life. We are only concentrating on human life alone. That is a concentrating on, in, in a, we can see it as a selfish mode. Even though we are uh, concentrating on healthy environment for, um, for us alone, the healthy environment that denotes the overall biodiversity of the globe also. And uh, in that we are having many things, right? And the earth provides with goods and services that we need to uh, survive and thrive. And you can see here what are the things we are getting it from the environment, right? And uh, another important problem we are having it is we are putting planet under enormous pressure, right? And everybody uh, will accept my uh, statement. We are over exploiting the earth resources. That is why this kind of conference is uh, uh, coming and uh, this conference will tell about the problems of us, that is uh, anthrop anthropo uh, anthropological disturbances given to the environment. So the man is the real culprit in making the uh, earth which is not good for the future generation unless otherwise we uh, look on look on it and uh, repair the damages and we can't live if you are not repairing the damages we can't live maybe uh, our future generation uh, will will live up to 2070 and after that there will be a big question mark for even for us to live Okay, uh, we are depleting all the resources, right? We are uh, digging the earth like anything. Uh, like you can see, even uh, every house has a bore wells, right? We are digging the, the earth for uh, water, not only for water, for other resources, okay? And uh, we are wasting all the resources, right? So that is a main problem. And... Uh, because of that, we are polluting, which makes the climate change. And because of that, the there will be a, many species disappear, vanished in the from the environment. And the main things, what we are doing to the forest, and this is a statement given by the uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, there is a father of uh, Indian nation, right? Father of India. What we are doing to the forests of the world is but a mirror reflection of what we are doing to ourselves and to one another. We must uh, see to the statement, right? Because we are destroying the forest, which means we are destroying ourselves, right? And this statement was given by Gandhi uh, before 1950. But the statement is a yeah, very good reflection of when you are seeing the today's world. Right, coming to the biodiversity. For this is for uh, non-biological uh, people, and biodiversity, which was introduced only in 1988 by Edward Wilson. And uh, what is it? And this is a variety of life forms on the planet. You can see what are the variety of life. Plants, animals, fungi, and microorganism. Not only that, animals alone, and the interaction that exists between them, the interaction between plants and animals, plants, animals, and fungi, plants, animals, fungi, and microorganism. So when there is no interaction, is there, and there will be a question mark. And coming to the distribution of biodiversity. So here you can see so many animals that denote the size, denotes the number of species 
in the world. Okay. And uh, you can see the mammals, which is in, uh, near the, the ant. Okay. You can look into the size of the mammal. And this constitutes the entire, entire mammal species, right? So maybe around 4,000 species of mammals are present in, in the globe. But when you see the insects population, it is more than 1 million species. And still, the new species are invented, right? So uh, even though we are having a smallest and we try to dominate the entire ecosystem. And because of that, we are having so many problems to live in us. And why biodiversity? And uh, what is the role of biodiversity, right? And I think uh, you know about biodiversity, that is a variety of life forms, right? So when there is variety of life forms, it measures the health of life on Earth. It acts like a thermometer. When there is a number of animals started decreasing, it affects the health of life. And also, uh, we discussed not only the presence of variety of animals and interaction between them, and that is the functioning of the ecosystem. When there is no interaction, functioning will be coming to halt, right? When there is no function, there is no ecosystem, and that comes the problem for the life of every animals, including human being. And uh, we are thinking that uh, we alone can survive in the uh, environment. Why we want to uh, see the other animals, but each life form has a unique role. And also they contribute the stability and resilience of the ecosystem. And there's a problem in the survival of any living, any animal or a plant, it affects the whole ecosystem. And that we are going to see in this presentation. That is, uh, you can see here the marine turtles. We do see the marine turtles coming to the shore to lay eggs and they swim into the environment. That too alone we are concentrating and uh, we know that. But you can see the role of marine turtles in ocean. So that is tremendous. I am just giving an example of each and every environment and you can see uh, uh, because of the limited time, I am concentrating only on some animals, and that reflects all the animals are important and they are good for the environment. When their absence, when they become extinct, and that will damage the environment. So see here. So their <clears throat> main food is seagrass, and they maintain healthy seagrass, but. They are uh, eating that and they are controlling the seagrass pet. And because of that, they increase the diversity in coral reefs also. They supply nutrients to beaches. They, when they are coming to the beaches, they lay eggs and uh, eggs are hatched out. The leftover, they into the sand, and from that, the minerals are entered into the soil. And also, they balance the marine food up. And you know that food chain, that is eaters are being eaten. When there's a problem near food chain, it is like a spider web. When spider web is cut off at any area, there is a problem for the survival of spider. So the same thing is happening. When there's a problem in the food chain, when any one animal disappears in the food chain, that will affect the entire food chain. And even it also affects the food web. And also they provide food for the fishes and they also provide habitat for other species also. 
so when you see the barnacles they get attached into the uh, shell of the marine turtles and uh, what is the importance of biodiversity for earth first let us see the importance of biodiversity what biodiversity giving to the earth and as well as for us also and we will see uh, the animals which are responsible for that right it gives us food right and not only food energy also it purify water it purify air and it is very much important in pharmaceuticals textile clothing so each and every area it is very much important also the economic growth of each and every country so biodiversity play major role it helps find new medicine because now nowadays we are getting medicines from uh, many plants right and uh, it helps us fight against climate change also and uh, we'll see how it uh, give us helping us and it is important for the agriculture okay and also food security we are getting uh, food from the agriculture which is the plant diversity and uh, also it fight against diseases and parasites it keeps our atmosphere stable because of the interaction between biotic and abiotic it also helps us to fight against natural disaster i think uh, from the natural disaster uh, which you have seen in uh, tv right uh, tv news some of the animals they sense the uh, problems in the environment when the earthquake came or volcanic eruption you can see some some of the disturbances by looking at the animals right by looking at the animals we can uh, measure something is going to happen and it also helps to fight global warming when biodiversity is there the global warming will be lessened uh, i think um, uh, many of you know about global warming that is a carbon dioxide increase and why it is increasing because of the chlorofluorocarbon and carbon is carbon dioxide is more in the atmosphere and because of the deforestation and cutting out trees in all over area the carbon dioxide is increasing right it is unable to absorb by the plants because we are cutting trees when trees are more global warming we don't have any global warming that will uh, take all the carbon are uh, taken up by the plants for their respiration and all right and also it keeps our ecosystem functional so you can see the food chain herb uh, plants that is eaten by herbivore herbivores are eaten by carnivore and the cycle goes on after death decomposes right so this is the uh, ecosystem is in function when there is any animal is killed or uh, not available in the environment the food chain is broken up and there will be a problem and uh, biodiversity helps us to purify water right so many plants so they are involved in the purifying the water and uh, it provides energy and also uh, that means solar we are getting the energy wind we are getting the energy and thermal we are getting the energy nowadays we are concentrating more on uh, uh, alternate energy because of the fossil fuel there are so many carbon dioxide in uh, entered into the atmosphere and we are having a many problem so we have to use the alternate energy to protect our atmosphere as well as the uh, all the animals and also healthy and active lifestyle and according to the iucn right 150300 species are in the red list so the red list means for the conservation status we are putting it in uh, international union for conservation and nature and you can see 
the latest report of endangered species, amphibians 41%, sharks and rays 37, corals 36, conifers for us 34%, mammals 27 and birds 13%, right? So if you look into the latest data, the number may increase, the percentage may increase. And why we are concentrating more on amphibians, shark, corals, conifers, mammals and birds? Because here the human species is not in danger. So we are we are thinking that we are escaped from that. But when other animals are going to become endangered or extinct, imagine when human alone is present in earth, we can't survive for a long years. And there is a statement given by Einstein. If bees population disappears, within four years, the world will vanish. So each and every animal is important to us. When amphibians are 41 percent, imagine the insect population is not under control. And we are worrying about uh, dengue fever and many fever uh, which is uh, coming from the uh, biting of mosquitoes. Because of the less number of amphibians, the mosquito population is increasing. And because of that, we are having so many diseases and we have to protect amphibians. And shark can raise. So we are uh, eating this kind of fishes in an enormous that is exploiting their natural resources. When they are absent, and there will be a problem to the top level of the food chain, that is man. Corals, so they are getting, uh, they are absorbing more uh, carbons. Now 36% of corals are disappearing, right? And the carbon level in the atmosphere is, will be more. And mammals, so they are the top carnivore. Not only tiger, wolf, and many animals are there. And I think uh, many of uh, uh, Indian uh, population uh, know about the introduction of cheetah by our uh, Prime Minister into uh, India. Many people, uh, they may wonder why it is introducing. Many people may be thinking that. So the cheetah population in oh, our India is present health in trouble. number is very less. Therefore, we will not fear that the earth give way and a mountain fall into the heart of the city, air, sea. Though its water roar and foam, and the mountain quake with a the surging, there is a river whose streams make glad of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her; she will not fail. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is a fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and, shat and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Try Jesu Cotra Blaber Hapadin Cotra Blade, Jesu Gay Paro and Re Melon Boyane Cotra Blade, Jesu Yaiti Ladi Cotra Blade, Shame Cotra and a step Cotra Blade, Yuan Shemakumi Long Cotra Blade, Halagajong, a jing long, Halagajong, a jing slow, Halagajong, a jing jet Cotra. Then, sir, Jesu Cotra Blade, Jesu Thank you. Sally, continue. Yes, okay, and uh, uh, we uh, saw about the biodiversity, the role of biodiversity, and I'm going to concentrate on keystone species, right? And each and every environment, every ecosystem, we are having a keystone species, right? 
right? And what is it? And it is a species with a dramatically larger effect and an ecosystem related to its abundance. So provided this species must be present in environment. Each and every environment, there are many species as keystone. When they disappear and there will be a drastic changes in the ecosystem. And it will also vanish the ecosystem. Okay. And uh, I am going to uh, give some of the examples. Right? What are keynote species? Any species, and this uh, definition given by Robert Pine in 19, 1966, right? Whose removal or reduction from an ecosystem adversely affect the overall diversity, stability, and as well the tropic structure of an ecosystem. So tropic structure, uh, you can call it as a um, producer, herbivores, and uh, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, as well as a decomposer, right? Okay. And um, I am showing some of the animals here, and which is hunted, which should not be there. And there are different types of uh, key keystone species. Some of the keystone species are the predators. You can see the tiger, shark, and grizzly bear, even the starfish, and as well as the wolves. Their disappear, disappearance in that, in that ecosystem that will spoil the entire ecosystem also. And prey. You can see the krill as well as the hare. That also plays important role. And some of the animals are doing the engineer uh, life. They are called as an ecosystem engineer. You can see the elephant of savanna and as well as the beaver. And there, there are some of the animals which are mutualistic, bees and uh, hummingbird. And as well as the uh, producers, fig as well as the cactus. And here uh, I am adding more examples here. The predators, tigers, and as well as starfish. And as prairie dogs, okay. And even the northern grassland. And prey, you can see the krill, which is the krill is a very uh, small animal, but it is the food of blue whale. I think you, you, you know the GN size of the blue whale, right? Which is the uh, biggest uh, mammal on earth, right? And as well as dolphin, dolphins. And snowshoe hare in North America. And ecosystem, what uh, the role of ecosystem engineers? Uh, we we saw the uh, elephant as well as the beaver beaver animal right that keeps ecosystem as such without any disturbance beaver making dam it creates because of the beaver the wetlands are as such right and we are uh, converting many wetlands into some other uh, area but the beaver is making a dam right and African elements in African savanna, okay? And uh, because of it, African elephants, the grassland growth is restricted, okay? And uh, because of the restriction and uh, many animals, many other herbivores are uh, eating the food, eating the uh, like uh, deer population, elk population, right? And hummingbirds and bees, so and we are going to see uh, about this and which are pollinating many plant species. And also food and nesting source, the saguara cactus, right? 
which is in a desert. This is a fort as well as the nesting source for many birds as well as the insect species in a desert ecosystem and fig figures in rainforests. Fruit source for all species throughout the year. Right. And we are uh, going to see about every animal, right? Okay. First, we'll show the shark as a keystone species. What is the role of shark here? And you can see in this uh, structure, okay, this is the hammerhead shark because you can see the hammer-like structure in the head of the shark, okay. And the food of the shark is this uh, cow nose ray, okay? And uh, the food of cow nose rays are you can see the clams, okay? So the many animals are there. Imagine this hammerhead shark is not present. This is the apex predator. Okay. And here in the bottom of the ocean, you can see the bivalves and many arthropod and species. Because of the overfishing, so the hammerhead shark is eliminated. What will happen? This cow nose rays increase in number because there is, there is no predator. Okay? And when, when it is increasing in number, it started eating all these arthropods and bivalves. Right? So, because of the removal of one species here, there is a disappearance of many species. When Hammerhead shark is there, it controls, right? When there is more um, ray feces increasing, this is controlled by hammerhead shark, okay? And these arthropods as well as bivalves, also the number is being balanced, okay? And this is the food chain. And because of that, the ecosystem of this particular environment is in balanced nature. Okay. And uh, another example. I think uh, you know about uh, sea otter. So you can see this is the also a marine environment. Sea otter is the keynote species. And uh, many of you might have seen the sea otter in the uh, freshwater also. And kelp population, this is a plant which is uh, living in the sea. And in the bottom of the ocean, you can see the sea urchin. And the sea urchin is eaten by the sea otters. When there is a decreased number of sea otter, what will happen? The sea urchin population will be more. And because of that sea urchin, it destroys the kelp communities. Okay? And uh, because of the kelp population decreasing, this kelp plant, which is useful for many herbivores, 
and the food for that animals are no more and the survival is under question mark okay and the hideouts and it provides many hideouts you can see uh, uh, in this slide and this is the real kelp plant and you might have seen this plants in uh, finding Nebo movies right so this is the hideouts for many plant many animals and uh, hideouts uh, food for many animals right and that animals will be vanished and this is the uh, uh, bifa okay and you can see the uh, wetland ecosystem this wetland ecosystem is uh, constructed by the check dam of uh, created by this beaver and because of that there will be a water flow running is very perfect and as well as even it is a uh, rich supply of nutrients is in the wetlands and everything is because of this beaver you can see the construction of nest by these beaver and here it is above water level and here it is below water level and this is moving into that and it is uh, getting you can see in this uh, picture at the right hand top getting the log so it is uh, uh, teeth is very sharp okay it cut the many plants surrounding the water and which is uh, uh, used for the construction of this okay and see the animals which are depending on this wetlands and for the wetland production this beaver population is very much essential and, and this is the uh, uh, another uh, keystone species wolves so many of us uh, thinking that wolves uh, they are very uh, uh, carnivorous and it destroy many animals right but before 1950s the wolf population in the yellowstone okay and that is present in the north america right vanished completely right and after that the entire uh, yellowstone biodiversity area loosen its green because the Wolves are the carnivore, which is hunting the deer, and as well as you can see the elk. Yes. Sir, uh, sorry for the interruption. It's a kind request from our side, sir. Please try to conclude the keynote session for us. Yeah, because sure. Other keynotes are also waiting for us. Yeah, okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Within five okay. minutes. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So it does play a key role in regulating the population of other animals also. Okay, there was a study in two thousand one. When wolves went extinct in Yellowstone, the moose population increased five times. So, because of the increase, it ravaged the woody vegetation. It completely vanished woody vegetation. Because of that, the birds, which is depending upon the woody vegetation, lack their home. Right? And because of that, several bird species eliminated. And what are the other benefits from the wolves are they are like scavenger okay so they hunt on their prey and they leave leftover they uh, only uh, human alone take uh, all the food right when some uh, non veg non veg food is uh, in, a, in your table you will be complete you you never leave any leftover but animals are not like that they will take when their stomach is filled but human are not and the leftovers that they, they, they are taken by ravens, magpies, bald eagle, golden eagle, weasels, mink, lynx, cougar, grizzly. See, more than 445 species of beetles also, they are eating the leftover. Just imagine, because of the wolf, so many animals are living. Even the leftover, it also, because of the decomposition, it benefits the soil. So here you can see the environment in the left side. Uh, wolves are absent. You can see 
uh, water running. There is no green here and only minimum number of trees. And on the right side, after the wolf uh, re-entry, you can see the greenery area of uh, the Yellowstone National Park. And well as you can also watching birds, right? This is the situation of this keystone spaces. And uh, another important is pollination. So pollination is most important. Bees are the pollinating, uh, number one pollinating agent. One out of three bites of your, your food depends on pollinators. When bees population is not there, you don't have food. And also it is also good for the grasses. So cattle feed on them and we are getting milk, cheese and many things. And more than 70% of the crops, you can see the data other pollinators like hummingbirds also there, keystone species, and bees support 90% of the world's flowering plant. Imagine, when bees are not there, what happened to these 90% of the flowering plants? And they pollinate. Because of the pollination, we are getting fruits, vegetables, and many crabs. Even food, not only food alone, even clothing, even the fuel, we are getting it because of the bee pollination. Okay? And uh, we are getting so many things, uh, seeds, nuts, berries, fruit, uh, uh, which is useful for many animals as well as uh, for human being also. Okay. So without bees, there will be a problem. And I, as Einstein said, only four years. And uh, before completing this, right? So we ought to maintain, uh, know the importance of keystone. By looking at the species, I, I have given only a few examples. There are many examples of that. So they maintain the structure, function, and stability of ecosystem. They are removal or decline, loss of biodiversity, alteration of ecosystem process, and even collapse of the ecosystem, as we have seen the Yellowstone National Park. And we have to identify and uh, protecting the keystone species, which is essential for the conservation strategy. And these are the animal which is reshaping the earth. Even the technology that won't help. If you protect the species, that alone reshaping the earth in a better possible manner. Thank you for your uh, patient listening. I think I have completed my task for this conference. And uh, you must know biodiversity and know life. Right? When there is no biodiversity, no life. Thank you, uh, participants, as well as the organizer of this conference um, for uh, allowing me to present my uh, topic. And thank you. If you want to interact, you can get my number. And as you can scan my QR code, uh, you get all the details of me. Thank you. Thank you. For uh, thank you. Thank you oh, so please. much, sir, for your wonderful keynote session. Thank you, sir. Participants, if you have any question, you can put it in chat box. The questions will be answered in chat box. So in chat box, I think everyone is asking the question. So another question coming from the botany meta. How staff is, is a keynote species in the predator category? So when the starfish population is decreasing, so I have given an example for other animals, I am not concentrating on starfish. And when starfish is disappearing and there will be a, another population that are prey, that will be booming in the environment, right? And that do harm to the environment and there is no controlling over that. Okay, and this is uh, nothing but a food chain. 
when any animal which is present in the food chain is disappear and the food chain is broken down and the food chain of any environment that will be disappear in due course so that is a thing thank you sir sir can in... you move on to the next keynote session okay thank you thank you ma'am uh, okay sir thank you sir because we are running out of the time sir so i'm like okay thank you okay sir. Uh, can I share my screen? Uh, one second, one second. I'll introduce. Carry on to the next We'll move on to the next keynote speaker of the day. I request Dr. Mazdina Bentri Mohit Nazi to render the lecture. Ma'am, please. Okay, thank you. Uh... Madam Chaperson, can you see the uh, slide? Yes, ma'am, we can see a slide. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Masrina Binti Muhammad Nazir, uh, a senior lecturer and also the manager of talent empowerment and creativity from the School of Chemical Engineering, uh, University of Science Malaysia. Uh, thank you to the organizer of uh, the Go Green Summit for inviting me as one of the keynote speakers. Okay. My talk for today will be on greening of extraction process for sustainable production of active compound. Sorry. Um, I can't go to the next. Okay. Um. Before I go into detail, uh, about my research. Uh, I want to introduce you to University Science Malaysia. Um. Uh, mm, I'm really sorry, there's technical difficulty. I can't control uh, my slide properly. I think I need to unshare and 
Mm. You can use that arrow mark to move to the next slide now. Uh, yes, but I mean, uh, the uh, uh, basically it's hang. Uh, I uh, uh it, yeah. So I can't go to. I can't move the slide. Uh, I need to unshare and reshare again, but I can't unshare this. Hmm. Okay, let me reshare again. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, sure, no problem. Ma'am? Yes. Uh, uh, any problem, ma'am? Yeah. Uh, I will share my... I'm sharing the screen and not PowerPoint. Uh, oh. So I hope it will be... Yeah, ma'am. We can see a slide now. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So um, I'm from University of Science Malaysia Engineering Campus. This is the bird eye view of the engineering campus. And we have six school of chemical a uh, school of engineering at the engineering campus. Um uh, and I'm from the school of chemical engineering. So if you want to know more about the school of chemical engineering, you can scan the QR code or you can go uh, to our social media page, uh, which uh, we are available on Facebook, LinkedIn, and also Instagram. Okay. Um uh, for this particular uh, talk, um, I will be talking about green extraction. For those who are not familiar with extraction, extraction is the process or the step that you, you conduct to separate any products from raw material. For example, if you want to um get vitamin c from the orange peel you use extraction to uh, obtain the vitamin c from the orange peel okay extraction is a very uh, powerful uh, method or a very useful method and it's utilized often in the industry and also in our daily life um, if you see cosmetics if you look at the ingredient a lot of cosmetic product use uh, plant extract as one of their ingredients. This is an example of a, a, cosmetic, uh, a serum. And if you look at the ingredient here, uh, it has sunflower and vermilion extract to slow down the aging process. And it also contains grapeseed extract uh, for the antioxidant properties. And also other than cosmetic, we also, uh, industry, also uh, use plant extract in their food product. And this is an as two examples of the extract obtained from butterfly tea flower and also durian, a popular uh, fruit in Malaysia. Um, so if you look here, both of these products uses ultrasonic solvent extraction. So ultrasonic solvent extraction is on one type of extraction process. 
it's a considered modern uh, extraction process and they use this uh, to get the uh, flower extract and durian extract okay uh, for uh, extraction process the um, the simplest or the common uh, common mechanism of extraction or common step of extraction is to combine solid uh, raw material with fluid or uh, any kind of solvent. So you combine these two together and you, you can extract out the compound that you want. And later, after a certain period of time, you will separate the solid from the liquid that contains the extract. So that's the basic mechanism for extraction. And for uh, extraction, you um, have, we have traditional extraction process and the uh, modern one. So the traditional or the conventional extraction process is still being used today because it is simple to set up and it is cheap. Uh, also, it's easy to conduct the extraction, uh, the conventional or traditional extraction process. However, when we use the conventional extraction process, uh, problems associated with the conventional extraction is that you get mm -hmm. low recovery. So it's, the yield of the compound is really small, uh, really low. If you want to increase the yield, you have to increase the time extraction time. Uh, even uh, the normal extraction time is quite long. So it's time consuming. It may take several hours or several days. And to get, the, to get a higher yield, you have to increase the time. So it's really time consuming and not, uh, not ideal, especially if you want to produce large, uh, large batches or you want to obtain large scale uh, products. And also uh, the conventional process requires large solvent large amount of solvent. And this is um, this will be a problem later on when we want to dispose of the solvent. And also it is not cost effective because you have to buy a lot of solvent to extract the product that you want. And uh, the processes, usually we will expose or we, we will expose heat to, um, we'll, uh, we will subject it to heating uh, to, to increase the efficiency. So longer, long exposure at high temperature will cause uh, some volatile compounds to be lost. Uh, so these are not uh, ideal for uh, for some for quite a lot of uh, applications. So and also it is not green. So how can we make the uh, extraction process greener. Uh, my group, my research group uh, focuses on, one of our focus is on green extraction. And we use this green extraction technologies uh, concept to make the extraction process greener. These are the um, things that we can get if we make the uh, if we use the green extraction technology uh, concept, we can have better isolation, reduce energy consumption, uh, more selectivity. But um, it's very difficult to check all the circles, to tick all the circles. Um, uh, so uh, for our group, for my group, I'm only focusing on four uh, that is using alternative solvent. Uh, we want to get high quality extract because when we use traditional extraction or certain modern extraction process, because of the uh, harsh extraction environment, the quality of the extract deteriorates. It will become, it is not high. So uh, uh, it doesn't mean if you get high yield, the extract quality will be good. So we want to focus on getting high quality extract, um, maintaining the compounds available in the original material. And we want to make sure the process that we are using have low environmental impact. And because we are focusing on have, using alternative solvent, the alternative solvent should, be, should have low environmental impact. It will also ensure the product that we get after the extraction is safe. Okay, the first uh, 
method or strategy that we use to make our process greener is by using solvent-free microwave extraction. This is one of the strategy that we use. We uh, fabricated the solvent-free micro microwave extraction rig. The original one is here, uh, the top one, uh, the top left side. Uh, uh, the schematic drawing, you can see it here. It's much more clearer. So we have, we use a uh, normal microwave. We fabricate, uh, we fabricate, we combine it with a uh, condenser and also glass uh, vessel made out of borosilicate glass uh, to put in the sample. And we have stirrer to stir the sample. Uh, the microwave, uh, uh, the solvent-free microwave extraction can have uh, a knob that uh, that allows us to control the power and the time. And also we have the temperature sensor to measure the temperature uh, inside the uh, extraction environment. Um, there's also a vacuum pump attached to the consent, uh, attached to the rig. So to ensure that uh, all the oxygen is purged out, uh, is, uh, is uh, removed, remove all the oxygen. And the extract when it goes out of the plant it will be in gas in gas phase so it will the gas phase uh, the gas uh, extract will flow down the condenser and it will be cooled by this the water from the cooling system and change in the extract will change into liquid and collect it here in the vessel at the bottom. So the solvent-free microwave extraction, the advantage is that we do not need to add in additional uh, solvent. We do It does not require any solvent because it utilizes the water molecule in that, inside the plant cell for the extraction process. And because we are using microwave, the microwave actually uh, shorten the extraction time. Uh, the mechanism of the... Uh, Solvent-free microwave extraction is shown here. So this is the plant cell. When the microwave irradiate the plant cell, the water molecule will rotate. The water molecule is inside the plant cell. So the rotation will cause the increase of temperature and pressure inside the cell, and it will uh, rupture the cell, the cell wall. And due to the rupture of the cell wall, the compound will be released uh, in the form of gas, and then and they, uh, in the form of gas, and it will be cooled down to liquid uh, when it passes through the condenser. So this is the flow of the extract. You can see here, it comes out of the plant sample, goes through the condenser. From here, change from gas into liquid and collected uh, by the uh, collection vessel. And we rotate the stirrer because we want to ensure all the uh, plant sample is exposed to the microwave irradiation. Okay, for our research, we are focusing on local herbs and plant. Um, so in this case, we are um we are using Centella asiatica. So Centella asiatica is a local herb. It is also known as pegaga in Malaysia, and some other names associated with Centella asiatica is go to cola Indian. Uh, pennywort, asiatic pennywort. So this uh, pegaga or centella asiatica uh, locally in Malaysia is eaten uh, with rice as or uh, as salad uh, or veggies. And we uh, some people also use it uh, to treat disease and wounds. The major active compounds in centella asiatica is acetylcoside and medical coside, medical society. We uh, in our research, we focus on acetylcoside. So we the target compound of uh, my group's research is acetylcoside. Uh, Centella acetica is also rich in vitamins and carotenoids uh, because of it, a, a, a lot of compounds exist in Centella acetica uh, and its benefit to the skin. It is used in a lot of cosmetic products and also uh, health and food products. Okay, so another advantage of the solvent-free microwave extraction, other not 
having to add in solvent when we are doing the extraction is that we do not need to dry and grind the raw materials. Usually in extraction, we need to dry the raw materials because we want to remove all the moisture so that the solvent can uh, extract more effectively all the compounds that we want. And also we need to grind the raw materials to make it small because we want to increase the surface area so that the solvent can uh, diffuse in, uh, can cover a lot of uh, the area. But in our case, we can just put in the fresh sample without needing to grind or dry it uh, because our uh, because we need to use the uh, water molecules inside the plant cell. So if you see here, this is the fresh sample before it goes in before the extraction process and after the extraction process, um, it becomes really dry, really dry because all the moisture already gone. okay And this is the uh, uh, scanning electron microscope image. Um, on the left, you can see this oil sac uh, here. The oil sac uh, it exists for uh, on the fresh sample, but after it after heating, after continuous heating with microwave, the oil sac ruptured, and this allows us to uh, the oil to uh, go out of the cell, and that that is how we able to collect oil from and also other compounds from the plant. We uh, did uh, investigate the effect of several different uh, several parameters um, to the extraction yield. So uh, uh, for this part, we are focusing on the yield of the raw extract. We haven't uh, purified it yet. So the raw extract, um, if you look at the time, the time does not have significant effect uh, after 10 minutes on the extraction yield. So if we increase from 10 to 15 minutes, the extraction yield, uh, not that's not much significant difference in the amount of the yield. And if we increase it much more, uh, the, we won't get any extract because the sample has completely dry. And if we increase the power from 300 to 500, also there's no significant difference in the, in the yield, uh, especially uh, if you see here, since we can monitor the temperature, when we increase the power, the temperature also increases. So uh, at higher, high power, the, uh, the temperature will become higher and this higher temperature cause volatilization and degradation of compounds. And so for the solvent-free microwave extraction, 300 watt is sufficient to get the yield that we want if we want to reduce the uh, power of the microwave and because the power uh, will result uh, if we increase the power it will result in a higher amount of energy being used and that but um, if we conduct the experiment in vacuum and at atmospheric uh, condition there will be a difference in the yield so the yield will be much higher when we conduct it at vac in vacuum uh, because more oxygen sensitive compound will be extracted, was extracted. And if we use stirring, also uh, we can see significant difference in the yield of the extract because when we stir the, uh, the sample, all the plant, plant uh, sample will be exposed to the microwave irradiation. So we can uh, uh, get more uh extract out of the cell uh, out of the plant but if we didn't stir the plant at the bottom part will not be exposed to the microwave and it, uh it will um uh there will be no rupturing of the cell wall uh, therefore the plant at the bottom part uh will maintain is it will not uh be as dry as the one at the top. So stirring is required when we use solvent-free microwave extraction. Um, we uh, try to correlate the uh, yield with the time to understand the extraction kinetics. So basically uh, for the first minute, we, will not, we did not get any extract at all. We cannot recover anything, but starting from one minute until 
uh, 10 minutes, uh, we'll get a, we obtain a lot of extract. So we recover a lot of water and active compound from 1 to 10 minutes. And from 10 to 15 minutes, uh, basically the result is stagnant. The amount that we collected is uh, this, uh, the same. So that actually uh, shows uh, that the extraction can only be conducted until uh, 15 minutes uh, when we are using solvent-free microwave extraction. And for the transfer of the heat and mass uh, for solvent-free microwave extraction, it's from inwards to out. The mass transfer and heat transfer is from the plant cell uh, out, outwards. But for conventional extraction, um, maceration, chocolate, uh, the heat transfer from will be from the outside and will pass through the cell uh, plant cell and this causes it to rupture and the mass the active compound will uh, uh, will go uh, diffuse out from the cell but the heat will be from the outside so that's the main difference compared to the uh, when compared to the solvent free microwave extraction uh, we want to know uh, the uh, basically what um, what kind of uh, compounds that we can get from the extract uh, from the raw extract although we have the target compound that we want which is acetic oxide we still want to know uh, what are the compounds available in the extract so the other available compounds in the extract um, we found it using GCMS so we investigated the raw extract using GCMS analysis and we found that there's three compounds that have the high, uh, high percentage in the raw extract, which are this cyclohexane 1,4-dimethyl-2-octadecyl, which is a polyacetylene. And this can be used as nutraceuticals. We also have two fatty acid, hexadecanoic acid and octadecanoic acid. So these uh, fatty acids are also useful um, uh, uh, one can reduce, can help reduce cardiovascular diseases, and another one uh, can be used in baked goods. So a, a lot of beneficial active compound exists in Centella Asiatica raw uh, extract. And we also want to know whether if we want to use the raw extract without purifying it, will it have any other uh, at, uh, benefits such as antimicrobial activities? because um, uh, if it do have, we can just use the raw extract for whatever application that we want. So we tested the raw extract um, uh, on several bacteria and also fungus and uh, shown here the inhibition zone of uh, towards the bacteria and fungus. The highest inhibition, inhibition was toward uh, bacillus subtilis and it has the lowest inhibition on uh, Tethylococcus aureus. And uh, fungi, uh, it does not have that uh, high inhibition towards fungi. Uh, so we also want to compare uh, uh, the extract that we obtain using solvent-free microwave extraction with the ultrasonic assisted extraction, which is considered as the modern version of extraction and the traditional uh, extraction process, which is chocolate. So we tested the uh, anti we analyzed the antimicrobial activities of the extracts from different extraction processes. And you can see here the inhibition zone. So the one with, uh, which is clear, the area that is clear show inhibition of the bacteria growth. And uh, there are inhibition uh, for all the extract, but the uh, la the diameter of the inhibition is different. So the diameter of the inhibition is shown here. And you can see that for solvent-free microwave extraction, it the inhibition zone for uh, the microbes are much, were much higher compared to the... Uh, traditional one, traditional extraction uh, sample, which is chocolate extraction and also uh, the more modern ultrasonic assisted extraction process. So this shows that our the extract that we obtain using solvent-free microwave extraction has high quality or high antimicrobial activity. Okay, 
then we after we already know that our extract uh it, the raw extract have good inhibition towards my uh microbial activity and uh also we can get a high yield using solvent free microwave extraction we want to know whether we the extract actually contains acetylcholine uh in the in the sample uh we tested the sample uh check it using hplc and compare with the standard and do find the peak for acetylcholine and then we uh, compare the yield for acetylcholine and also the raw extract against uh the other extraction processes which is chocolate and uae the ultrasonic assisted extraction and as shown here for comparing with the other extraction processes are uh, the one with solvent free microwave extraction ma yes and sorry for the interruption ma'am it's a kind request from our side please try to conclude uh, uh for us ma'am because other keynote speakers are waiting for their slots okay sure okay ma'am thank you thank you for the understanding um you can see that the solvent free microwave extraction have a higher extraction method and a higher extraction yield uh, and also higher acetyl side yield and also we have total phenolic uh, higher total phenolic content and also uh, antioxidant activity so this shows that the quality of the solvent free microwave extraction is really good and we also able to obtain the high yield of the extract okay other than the solvent, uh, using solvent free microwave extraction, we also use green designer solvents for the greening the process. Uh, for this uh, green designer solvent, we use MADIS, natural eutectic solvent. And it's uh, the combination between hydrogen bond acceptor and hydrogen bond donor. So NADIS form between the mixture of these two. And for our group, we focus on betaine because it is shown to have less cytotoxicity compared to the other hydrogen bond acceptor. Uh, we use this NADIS because it is uh, simple to prepare and biodegradable and also have low toxicity profile. And uh, the first thing is we have to check whether or not the formulation actually produces NADIS. And to know whether it produces NADIS, we have to check this mixture under microscope after it cools down and the one without any particle inside is this one without any particle is the successful needles uh, formation the one with the particle inside is the unsuccessful unsuccessful needle so we do not use this for our other analysis we use the one that do not have any particle for our other analysis and we also check whether or not uh, when we add in water, it would disrupt the hydrogen bond between the hydrogen bond acceptor and hydrogen bond donor. Uh, because NADIS is really viscous, so we have to we want to reduce the viscosity by adding water. And we, uh, when we add in 30% water, the hydrogen bond still exists between the uh, hydrogen bond acceptor and donor. So it shows that we can add in water in NADIS. For this case, we use ultrasonic assisted extraction uh, with NADIS. And you can see here, when we compare extraction using NADIS with the one using ethanol, ethanol is the normal solvent people use for extraction. We get higher extraction yield uh, uh, when using NADIS. And this relates to the viscosity of the NADIS because when the viscosity is less, uh, it can diffuse more inside the plant cell and uh, extract the compound that we want. But uh, to a, the water that we add in can only be towards until a certain point because we can't add a lot of water. It will disrupt the hydrogen bond between the hydrogen bond acceptor and hydrogen bond donor. So we check until what percentage can we add water. And we see found that we can only add up until 50% of water. If we add more than that, the hydrogen bond will be disrupted and you only get solution, simple mixture of the uh, different different uh, chemicals and not need this. And uh, for the extraction kinetics, we also check the extraction kinetics and we found that um, 
for the extraction kinetics, um, initially, uh, when the acetylcyte, uh, before the extraction, the acetylcyte is at, in, will be at the, at the surface and inner side of the uh, plant cell. When uh, we extract it for 10 minutes, the solvent molecule start to diffuse. And because of the ultrasonic, the cell will start to start to rupture, which allows the uh, the sol solvent to pass through uh, from 10 to 30 minutes. And from 30 to 50 minutes, all the cells, uh, all the acetylcyte inside the cells were able to diffuse out because it dissolved inside the solvent. And that's why we start to get stagnant result uh, for 50 minutes after 50 minutes. Uh, from 30 to 50 minutes because everything has already been extracted at this particular time point. Okay, as a conclusion, you can see that by these are on, the only uh, that there, there are other grain extraction processes, but the processes that we focus on actually are uh, useful and beneficial. Uh, it, 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 we, uh, we were able to extract acetylcyte by using solvent-free microwave extraction and also nadesis. Well, just that uh, the formulation for nadesis need to be checked or screened before you use it. And for solvent-free microwave extraction, uh, we have to use vacuum and stirring system to ensure higher efficiency of the extraction process. Uh, that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for your wonderful keynote session. Thank you so much, ma'am. Shall we move on to the next keynote speaker, ma'am? Now, I would like to request Dr. Kushal Matai to render the lecture. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. So, uh, can you give me the rights to... Oh, okay. It's there. Is my presentation visible? Yes, sir, it is visible. Okay, and am I visible? Yes, uh, I think. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, thank you. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, BioLeagues and Go Green, uh, some organizers, all of them, to you know organizing this event and. Uh, I, all, I would also like to thank you for inviting me to give a keynote session. And I come from an architect for architecture fraternity. So my presentation is going to be more about the building focused and, you know, the uh, urban fabric, how we tackle with the uh, built forms. And I'm not going to go into the complete details of everything because there's a paucity of time. And but I am going to cover the you know new technologies which are available and the specific technology which we are right now focusing on and I'm broadly going to give you the perspective of Indian part where you know what we are doing. But before that, I'll I'm going to you know give you the brief of what is SPA. So School of Planning and Architecture is a very old institution and it is uh, almost eighty one years now. And it is one of the pioneer institutions in architecture and planning, and at uh, Delhi, New Delhi, uh, at uh, you know at the heart of the Delhi. 
the capital of india and uh, these are some some of the photographs that well, what is the life so moving on to that after that i'll just so this is the title of my today's presentation where we are going to talk about the possibilities and pitfalls of solar technology as a sustainable building material so please uh, understand that the context of this presentation is in terms of the building material it is not about the technology part of the solar technology whereas it is about the technique the you know the installation and you know the integration so primarily it is the difference between that now why that because uh, there's a lot of talk about energy consumption and you know net zero and a lot of buzzwords we keep listening around on you know each and every day day to day routine is our day to day routine office routine is filled with that and but uh you know very few of us know that what exactly is in detail when it comes to the photovoltaic installations so the my presentation is going to have you know these kind of uh, structures that one we are going to go for the introduction then there are some key developments which i am going to briefly talk about indian context then installations in buildings and then the bipv and then potential challenges so it's kind of a build up way although i'm be i'll be running a little quick here because of as i already mentioned there has been a delay in this so uh let's quickly jump on to it so introduction like we this is a graph which is showing that global level where the you know energy consumption and economy is growing economies stay so most of us actually are going to consume as you can see here there are a lot of green uh you know dark green colors in this which says that 6% or more still need it so the which actually represents that there is a lot of energy demand which is going to increase now and the the first two bands like 3 to 6% and then 6% and more that's 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 a point of concern now the parity of that with the developed developed versus developing nations is very different than that so this is another graph which is showing the you know per capita consumption and this is actually giving you the idea that it is rising at an exponential rate and i'm not going to go into the numbers right now but this is to just to give you a preview that how critical this issue is now that's why we have been talking about that you know there is in sdg 7 there is affordable the affordable and clean energy and this actually encompasses most of the things like you know the all part of renewable energy from innovation to the new kind of material application and to the uh, new technologies and techniques being implemented there's a lot of research going on at the global level about this now what are the benefits of renewable energy first we need to understand that because for a common person to understand it it is not something which is uh, you know uh, day to day matter going into going in depth into it but by and large if we look at it it's like you know it is an independent form of energy and it is you know it is sustainable it can sustain itself and it is in abundance that means it is it is perpetual so so as to you know to an extent and depending on the technology as well but as far as we talk about sun uh, until and unless we have it it is it is a source of energy which is with us then it has a you know the very compelling point is that it has reduced carbon emissions even for the technology part as well now there are these kind of renewable energy sources by and large which we talk about in general yes there are some kind of you know uh, debates about it that whether some of the components are fall actually into the renewable category category or not but we are not going to go into that so today we are just going to focus on solar so all those uh, who have gone into the research they know that you know the solar uh, there are two components when we try to convert solar energy into you know the usable component there is one is the photovoltaics another is the thermal so photovoltaics works in a form of you know photon energy and it has a certain spectrum which needs to be trapped and you know then the electricity needs to be generated accordingly now if we go for the global scenario then these are the you know uh, some graphic representation based on the figures which we'll get that you know uh, and i'm going to focus on this asia region where uh, i come from so uh, we are 
as you can see here, there's a lot of, you know, uh, potential and the targets, installed targets have been established by the, you know, various, various countries. Now, this actually tells us that it is that much, you know, came into the observation and it is much more critical. Quickly jumping on to the another slide, how it is related to the zero emissions. So we talk about this zero carbon emissions and all those things. In totality, there are some things that we need to understand that it is, uh, you know, a very small amount of geographic area which is needed for this to be done. However, there are there is a paucity of understanding or you know the detail of in-depth study studies which say that whether it is feasible or not. You know, uh, by by feasibility, I mean the you know the 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 portability of the structure, whether it should be decentralized or the centralized one, that is yet to be you know uh, identified. Now coming on to the India Indian context, that there is this uh, you know uh, solar chart which defines that we have a largest amount where we have a, one of the you know fair amount of uh, solar potential, and it is exactly if you say from from the data of NISC, it's seven forty eight gigawatt of potential gigawatt peak of potential. Then what are the developments which have happened at the global level? So if we we'll go have a brief at the history of solar photovoltaic. This technology has been there. And initial levels, sometime it was to a competitive market, it was at 4%. Not today, if we talk about it, it has reached to a, the, the first generation technology has reached to a, some amount of 23 to 6, 25%, uh, which is substantial from the 4% which we talked about. And this graph, if you can see, it is from the NREL. Uh, it shows that, you know, there are different kind of technologies which we have been working on and, you know, the uh, the emerging PVs and, you know, the so they are like first generation, second generation and the third generation photovoltaic technologies which are, which are being worked upon. This is one of the innovative technologies which we use in the uh, uh, building forms and it is actually the replacement of, simply replacement of a glass simple pane glass or whatever kind of glass which we use. I am not going to again go into the detail of it, uh, but briefly and telling you that uh, this glass has one advantage in a layman terms if we talk about it. It can also generate electricity apart from giving all other benefits which a normal glass gives. So, you know, when we talk about high SHGC glass, uh, sorry, low SHGC glass and high VLT glass, this can give all those in addition to that, it can also generate the electricity. So that is the part of it. And then there is this emerging technology, which is perovskite, which is still struggling at the stability level, but efficiency-wise, it has reached to a you know very um, good uh, stage. Then there are other few other thin film technologies. And, you know, like various kind of other technologies, which we talk about, which are easily integratable into the built environment, or rather, I should be saying uh, to start with the buildings and then eventually. Now, we had uh, in India, if we talk about, we had a targets of, you know, large humongous targets uh, of 175 gigawatt, which was the earlier target. And, you know, uh, now the targets have increased as well. It has, it has uh, almost gone to the double of it, what it was. But then uh, there were two sectors which were targeted here. One was the you know land-based solar installations. Another was the rooftop-based solar installations. So the targets which were set, uh, they were uh, in a term that we would be we will be targeting some of the rooftops. But and it actually relates to that potential which is you know which is much higher. If you look at it, there is a lot of potential of solar rooftop. In India. But then somehow it did not work out. As you can see here in the graphs that, you know, these uh, light lines from all these states is uh, the target ones and then the applied ones are the uh, darker ones. But then, uh, so the major reason behind this, which was, uh, which still is still under the study is that it might be uh, the reason of the application because they, the if we talk about application in the buildings, it is cost effective. Uh, you know, it is decentralized. 
uh, form of energy and then it is easier to maintain low low gestation time no additional land is used you uh, needed and you know it has a better grid connectivity and stability as well when it comes to the single household unit uh, it, to an extent local employment generation is there because the you know effective and you know know how of installation or be uh, balance of systems is needed uh, but the major uh, uh, drawback was that you know it occupies your rooftop area which could be used for another another you know activities which actually was the case you know uh, which actually is the case you know the conventional case is that so this is a kind of example of a factory which on which you can do that which is already done but then when it comes to the household unit it is uh, or you know any reknish or any other leisure based spaces this is the purpose of a rooftop and that is why the you know potentially the rooftop uh, had to be rethought that how it needs to be done so when it comes to the, and then other uh, usages like services on the rooftops and on these you cannot install the pv panels because there is a lot of heat getting generated outside which needs to go into you know which needs to be dissipated into the sky and then there are these you know examples of some of the places from you know desert areas in rajasthan and you know nearby places that these are the spaces how they are used then one another compelling study was that uh, which was done by us is that we try to identify that you know urban heat heating effect caused by the solar photovoltaic panels uh, if they are installed on the land or on the buildings facing upwards you know facing towards the sky so these are the installation images that you know the top one shows that the before spv installation and later one shows about after the spv installation so just to give you an idea that my presentation is going to be more of a graphics one not the you know there's many less less text and you know uh, some graphs but then more images now if you will see here there's a you know clear distinct visibility if you can see here the thermal image shows that you know pre spv installation there was much less heating in that region and post spv there is a lot of uh, land surface temperature getting increased similar was the case for the not that aggravated but similar was the case for the building installations as well to an extent so what is the solution that's that comes into the mind that you know if because this shifting towards the sky you know facing towards the sky is kind of a scenario which is not working so what is the need because we know that there are these targets we need to install we need to do these uh, you know we need to use this technology there's no other way because anyways it is much better than coal and it has it has you know um it has been widely accepted and there are potentials so and we need many more functional rooftops as well so the solution probably is this which we move on to is the building integrated photovoltaics we need to think about that uh you know um how these technology this technology can be implemented with better better technique or be made the integral part of the building or maybe you know maybe replaced as a material different building materials can be replaced by uh photovoltaics now that thought was started and with that some of the studies have already started and we also have done we've done some of the work although it's under the focus you know we, this is actually the work which is ongoing and uh, it's it's the feasibility analysis which we are doing right now so the different parts where the this can be done is that roofing facades and the shading devices and glazing then um, if we go into the detail of it that in a inclined rooftop yes Hello. sorry yes anger and over one and a half hours two hours now sorry what sorry sir sorry sir it's just interruption from the participants no problem you can continue sir please uh, put your mics on the mute thank you it will it will save us a lot of time actually yes sorry thank you so the the rooftops if they are inclined it is much easier to deal with it if they you know the uh, 
um, if the solar geometry has been taken into consideration, uh, which I'll come at the later stage in detail, uh, not that detail, but you know, briefly I'll I'll cover the part uh, which I'm trying to convey here. Uh, but then when it is a flat roof, it is it becomes much more challenging because then the tilt and all the angles based on the azimuth and altitude are to be tackled with the balance of systems of SPV installation. So that's where, you know, we need to think about the vertical facades of the building, which here, if you can see, it's a very good example. That's a south facade. And, you know, there is a there is a um, uh, intelligent system which has been installed. It is actually giving you shade as well on the wall. And at the same time, of a, at the same time, it is acting as a thermal barrier and acting as a chimney as well, solar chimney. And not to, you know, forget that, you know, it is generating electricity. Now, this is a very interesting example of cold climatic region where, you know, the you need to uh, increase the heat inside the building as well or in the surroundings. And at the same point of time, you need to generate the electricity as well. So, you know, the color composition and all the, you know, structures. So these all are uh, what you call that uh, solar photovoltaic facade. Similar uh, example, similar kind of example from another cold climatic region. So what I'm trying to convey here is that it is much more focused on, uh, you know, your region specific and the design specific and the building specific uh, type. So that's why it is the more focus is on the technique rather than the technology. So uh, now this is a very uh, basic example, which we must have seen. I mean, it is available a lot of places, and uh, this is just a parking lot, which is trying to give a give your car shade at the same part of time generating electricity. So these are intelligent, uh, you know, what I would say the application ways. This is a tracker based, which can move like a sunflower. You see, it follows the sun. That is that is there, and just a second. I think I lost. Yeah. Then there are these shading devices. Uh, I think this is an example of uh, net zero building Singapore. I guess I'm not sure. Uh, then there is one interesting example of a uh, uh, BIP project with Dyson Sterilized Glass, which has, and on the top, if you look, it has, uh, you know, uh, with a less fill factor, conventional photovoltaic panels. And there's a variation happening there. And then there is the colored part, which is Dyson sensitized glass. Now, the interesting part, once again, if we'll come at the dye sensitized glass, which is an emerging technology we talked about, this is where you, you can go, you know, what is the difference, which I was talking about from the traditional window and the BIP window. If you look at the upper, on the right corner, on the, the upper graph, upper, uh, sorry, uh, image, it shows that there is a solar gain and then less grid electricity in BIP window. Okay, now with the traditional window, if the solar gain is increased and the grid electricity is also uh, increased. So there's a gap which is being maintained because of the generation which is happening from the BIP window. That is the difference between what, uh, you know, a solar PV or solar photovoltaic panel if integrated into the building can achieve. Now the vertical glazing, there's a horizontal glazing. There are a lot of examples which we can do here. This is just a you know, feasibility study. So we are trying to get the potential that what are examples here. This is a very good example uh, based on the you know movement of the sun. If you can see in the left image, you can you can see a glare of the sun. Now that glare, if this facade not had been there, would go inside. And it will be a discomfort, visual discomfort to a human being, you know, people who are working here inside this. So these are dye sensitized glass vertical louvers, which rotate with the, you know, single axis tracker. And throughout day to evening, they trap this sunlight and then generate electricity. Then one more application potential is through, you know, the very basic one, which is a small component in our day-to-day -day life as a railing. So, and it is simply, it's a, if you can look in the lower right corner image, it is a very simple plug-in device, which can be utilized. And there are many more, but I'm just going to, you know, uh, quickly go through the application. So these are the, these are about the Indian context. 
that this is a uh, ministry building which has the installation then there is one lab which is a research lab there underneath this roof there is no 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 roof and it is the only roof so it's actually a pretty integration and people are working under it and then this is a, a retrofit building uh, which is also apparently the center of you know this technologies renovative technologies so uh, before and after if you can see there's a clear difference in that now these are the examples which we have shown you now what are the potentials and challenges like how we can do it so potential is that if we give the facade or the back surface of this inadequate ventilation it is much easier to you know uh, get this then there's a proper design which is required uh, you know based on the local climatic conditions and the environment of that region say for example hot climatic region or you know the cold climatic region there needs to be different color temperature and you know the surface texture which is needed and once again based on the southern or the northern ge geographic region there needs to be a, a regional difference must be designed for the potential so if we are going for high rise buildings or some kind of that then we need to understand the structural barrier of the wind and atmospheric condition based on that how much of a, you know dry winds or you know the dusty winds are in there for example if we talk about the very desert desert regions and we are going to think about going to think about the high rise then we need to very specific and there needs to be structural design which needs to come into place now once again the other point is related to the uh, you know dry regions not just the deserts but the you know cold snowy regions as well that you know areas in dry regions require washing and limit because there is a lot of snow snow collection which happens snow deposition which happens and because of the heating it melts as well so then it can you know converts into water and then it actually resides on it so proper inclination and you know the designing part is needed for that and then the avoidance of obstructions so that mutual shading for example if you look in the first image that you know the first part which you can see here it's not needed because then the other two buildings behind it cannot have a solar pv so one needs to think about it while designing it so it's very site specific or you know the climate context specific design which is needed then another orientation and the angle one needs to think about uh, what our orientations are to be taken into consideration and one needs to understand the potential there is a proper simulation which needs to be done for this as you can see in this image the part where tree is shading that part even the installation is there of bipv it is of no use because it will be develop generating electricity at a lower level lower uh, range but it will not be that efficient so it's not actually the you know the effective cost benefit now what are the current barriers which we have identified here that like, you know there are human resources which are very less the information like the sharing platform which we are creating right now or we are doing it right now like this is the current session which is going that's also one one kind of informative session then the technical know how of it what is the what is the data available what technologies are available how their technique what are the techniques which are available and we are trying to build upon that then the economic facets of it that whether it is feasible or not economically viable or not what is the what is the stability of it and then most of it the policy driven part because the government incentives and you know the drive from the you know various uh, 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 national and international bodies about this particular technology the worth of the movement that is still yet to you know yet to come into the picture at you know in a detailed very specific manner now we can achieve it it's it's a, you know it's a it's a determination based that you know the 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 but that yes there is a paucity that you know there is not much of a statistical information available right now and suitability of solar you know the as i have already mentioned orientation inclination location and the you know potential performance of portable system system in the environment as well that needs to be looked into the detail on the very specific uh, you know climatic regions and then the limited correction you know the construction material what will the wastage how the you know historical sites you know the existing sites will be taken into consideration what are the what is the build form what is the ratio of the build form versus the you know standing uh, you know new construction that also needs to be assessed so sort of in a manner you know the building bylaws also needs to address this 
and this is one you know very interesting part where you know we we can look at it that you know as we move from this uh installation to integration the uh, you know the more expertise higher level of architectural coordination or you know the designing part needs to come into the picture so that is one image very interesting which we can do and this is actually you know it's as i said it's an ongoing research so now these are the barriers on the left side just to give you the graphical information that you know product efficiency at the technology part we saw in this is sort of a summary of this presentation uh that these are the barriers then product and the project demonstration databases are needs to be developed education you know the amount of education which needs to be there needs to be imparted then the economy needs to be taken into consideration gap between uh, you know pv and building industry management part of it but how can we do it that's also mentioned that you know research development is a core uh, you know area with collaboration of educational programs and the you know active governmental interventions can come into the picture and public awareness like the session which we are doing right now is of utmost criticality because when most of the people will know about it that the more you know loud scream will happen about it and then there will be a lot of discussions a lot of mind will come into the uh, you know uh, discussion then international professional management and collaboration once again is a very inclusive part uh, some days back i was in australia uh, giving the presentation about my similar kind of research work in uh, similar sort of conference so similar kind of effects need to be taken into consideration then there is this ai like uh, you know i we are then this is the another part of it which we are doing that how we can do it so with the artificial intelligence the you know stability of the grid and all the predictive models can be understood and the recycling process which we have talked about all these things they can the data assimilation can happen and we can collate the information that exactly how we are going to use it and where it is applicable so i think that's it from my side if you have any questions please go ahead thank you once again thank you for giving me this opportunity and thank you for listening to me over to the uh, moderators please thank you thank you sir thank you so much for the wonderful shall i start uh, so these are my details shall i stop presenting now yes sir participants okay. if you have any question you can put it in chat box okay i sorry i did not get okay uh, are there any questions i think there there are none no. i think no questions in the chat box so uh thank you if there are any questions uh, uh afterwards please let me know no, uh please. you have my sure. email id please that can be you know uh questions can be shared on that and i'll respond sure sir thank you thank you sir Now we will move on to the next keynote speaker of the day. Now I request Dr. Sunita Dalla to render the lecture. Ma'am, please. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Okay. A very good morning to everybody in India, and uh, I think ma it's a new time in the rest of the eastern countries of the globe. Uh, thank you for giving me opportunity. Uh, for presenting my research and my ideology on go green aspects of the science and need of the time uh, because of the pollution the non sustainable thought process of the people around us so thank you so much the go green summit thank you and i hope this uh, talk will be very helpful for the students who are aspiring to take their research in the field of uh, 
microbial biotechnology or sustainable development through it. Mm. I'm not able to catch my uh, how to take my slide over there. Uh -huh. Yes. Actually at the bottom of the meeting, you can find uh -huh. the share screen option now. Share, I am able to select. The tab. Let me check. Um, click the tab and then do share money. That I'm already doing. Cancel. Uh, then I have to share the screen because I'm opening it. The entire screen. Share. Fine. Yes. And now I'm taking slide. Fine. Is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma it is visible now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great. Uh, the topic of my talk is today about uh, definitely close to the desire of the summit, and that is the agriculture sustainable. We all are aware that uh, the ecosystem or the environment is very much intertwined with the agriculture. So taking that concern, I have selected a topic on rethinking agriculture. It's an innovation in the rice straw management for the environmental sustainability. We all are aware India is one of the culturally diverse country and a home of nearly 1.4 billion people and agriculture is the real backbone of the country, of the precisely the Indian economy, the GDP. So the right wheat cropping system covers about 13.5 million hectares in the indo gigantic plains. That's the major food hub for the Indian subcontinent, not only to the India, but major part of the globe as well. But feeding this ever-increasing population has its own challenging and uh, it has uh, its own challenges and put enormous pressure to our natural ecosystem. So addressing the environmental challenges in agriculture is important for various reasons. The agriculture sector is deeply intertwined with the environment. I'll try to justify more of the points in the upcoming slides. So coming up with it. Uh, People around here, precisely, I am professor at the University of uh, Kurukshetra, and in this region, this is a uh, rice belt, majorly wheat and the rice belt because of the fertility of the soil and the composition of the soil. But it's a very common scene that the farmers burning their farms around here by the end of the November. Uh, initially, it was used to be blamed on Diwali, but the recent studies have provided the substantial evidence that it's all because of the burning of the, uh, the straw, paddy straw standing or pending line not picked up from the farms. Uh, that is the reason the farmers just opt the easy option to burn them off in the farms and that leads to high contribution of so much pollutants in the environment around us. Why is, what is the reason behind this burning of the farmers? Why don't they sell it off or they stock them for their uh, feeds of the fodder as, as a fodder for their cattle and all that? Because that is not issue for the rest of the crops they sow there. And obviously the stubble or the straws are generated from the other crops as well. So this red, collection indicates the major reason of the option of burning the uh, rice straw. First of all, there is a, a small, very narrow window of only 20, 15 to 20 days of uh, uh, harvesting and uh, then sowing of the upcoming uh, crop, that is the wheat. Another is that rice straw it has relatively very high silica content. That is need of the survival of this plant also that I'll, I'll show in the upcoming videos. But rest of the crops like the wheat straw or the barley straw, the oat or the major straw, whatever the rest of the crops grown in the area, they do not have that much high silica content as is visible from this slide. So 
that is the major concern or problem of my research work in the laboratory. My research scholars are undertaking this issue very seriously, and I am going through a, a project also sanctioned by Haryana State Government. So the agriculture sector is deeply intertwined since the concern of this uh, summit is regarding the environmental concern. And I have taken the agriculture sector. So just to justify my address uh, to this uh, environmental challenge, I have taken this and show and made an effort to show this, how the emission generated from the agriculture sector contributes to the pollution into the environment. So it involves adopting practices that promote harmony with the environment. You can protect the natural resources and contribute to the overall well-being of the planet and its inhabitants. That is the concern of the sustainability or that is the concern of this summit and the people around us nowadays just to uh, tickle the brains of the youth to, to feel them that sustainable development is the need of the time. So the key reasons highlighting the importance of addressing the environmental challenge in the agriculture are because there is a need of the sustainable resource management. So we are to use precisely this problem of uh, uh, straw uh, lying uh, useless in the farms and force the farmers to get it, burn it off, is to generate a method where they could be reused. They could be renewable sources. And uh, that could help in preventing the ecosystem services because ecosystem is not what we see around us. There are so many micro since a person of the uh, microbial biotechnology, I focus on the flora and fauna, microbial flora precisely of the uh, health, uh, good health of the soil. That too is staked or damaged when burning is opted by the farmers. And there is a climate change mitigation since the last slide indicated the how much release of the toxins or the pollutants is generated or the greenhouse gases are released in the environment that causes the health issues to the people around there and definitely the health of the cattle and the animal living in that a few kilometers of the area where a farm is burnt and the biodiversity conservation. It's around the small animals, the pest or the other small animals living in that area because of the uncontrolled generation of the fire at times leads to the de uh, destruction of this biodiversity uh, also. As talked about the soil health, that is very uh, uh, important or significant for the upcoming crop in that respected form. Then definitely water quality, there's no direct correlation with the water quality, but when there is a ton of the ash lying in the burnt off form, then where that is going to be washed off on watering of the upcoming field or if there is a rain or the water lodging, definitely that further generates to the uh, release of that uh, uh, polluted water in the surrounding water resources. And already talked about the environmental pollution, then the food security and the livelihood, human health and the safety is very common, the eye irritation, the throat issues and the lung issues. So these are the significant importance of addressing these concerns of precisely burning the uh, stables or the rice straw in the fields. Now, how you can manage this sustainable rice straw management? That is the uh, target of the today's talk. You can definitely avoid the open burning. It's okay if you do not burn it, what next? Definitely, uh, it's a punishment offense by the state governments, and it has been very strictly implemented at some district levels that you are not allowed to burn the rice uh, stables or the straw lying panning in the fields. So uh, one has to avoid this open burning of those uh, open burning precisely here because open burning here concern for the burning in the open fields here because of pyrolysis or some other method is taken up where a closed burning it could be used as a fuel that is a separate issue but here we are talking about the open burning and it is incorporation to, into the soil at times that is the in uh, merged uh, into the soil but the issue here is that the size of the straw generated by the big uh, technique big tech machines uh, that is uh, that generates uh, physical inability of those sized straws or the staples to be dumped into the soil. 
Another is the, the sustainable method is the bioenergy production or biorefinery process where we talk about the biogas generation or the bioethanol, the biodiesel. If some fermentation microbial technology could be opted so that these leftover rice tables or the straws could be uh, useful, valuable resources for the uh, fermentation industry. Another is the mushroom cultivation. Some countries have opted it, where uh, there's a high proportion uh, of the mushroom cultivation at the commercial level things are taken, that uh, you need a straw uh, base for the cultivation of the generation of the fungus uh, at the initial stage of the mushroom uh, cultivation. Another is the animal feed. Here comes the problem we I talked of showed in the second slide. The reason being it is not opted in the animal feed or acted as an animal fodder is that uh, uh, it has very high concentration of the silica. So in a way, silica is beneficial for the water lodged crop like rice. But secondly, when a uh, leftover straw is generated, it is a uh, uh, very bad or the villain reason being high concentration of the silica it is not digestible or it is nutrient insufficient so the farmers or the um, cattle don't prefer consuming it as their feed in spite of having rest of the sufficient substances but the silica prevents its taste not good taste for the animals and they avoid it so silage is a method where it could be consumed. That too is the upcoming microbial biotechnology aspect where the uh, rice straw can be utilized for the animal fodder um, by definitely through a process of initial some treatments, the microbial treatments are undertaken away. Then comes the paper and packaging production. Paper and packaging production is mostly focused on the cellulose, the lignin, their degradation, definitely. But that degradation has to release the silica, first of all, because the silica molecules are embedded among those tissues. And uh, unless until the silica has been uh, some at, at an optimum level, not declined, uh, then that causes the aberrations or the hardness or the difficulties in the paper and packaging production as well. Then silage production, as I told, that is all connected with the animal feed and the other are the community-based initiatives. So the improper rice management, particularly like uh, these open burnings and the insufficient leads to all this, I've already uh, talked about it, that is the pollution, the greenhouse emission, the soil health and the nutrient imbalance of the soil as well. These are the various aspects already talked about. So what exactly are the innovative technologies ongoing or looking towards is that is the biorefinery that is the biogas production or the biofuel generation this is the typical here uh, the other here we are talking about other organics i got this image from the uh, google but it is not precisely talking about the rice straw but the organic matters are the rice straw so so there is a mixing or mulching of the uh, cow waste or the uh, animals waste or the uh, shit released by the poops of uh, released by the cattle and they are uh, that slurry is merged with these organics this organic resource is in case is opted as a raw straw so they are mulched or the mixed thoroughly and these are the various uh, two-step digester are shown and how the biogas is generated and it's a, it's a model system how a biogas could be generated so precisely these digesters, here we talk about the microbiology. These digesters are something where the inoculums of the microorganisms are added and uh, these are acting as a source of the culturing of those uh, methanogenic uh, bacteria. They are eating these the, as a sucrose, the nitrogen and other sources obtained from these. Just to alert the silica here, the slurry is added. So there is no pure job involvement of the rice straw management here also. You have to add proportionately the other organic uh, resources also. So there is no overall consumption of the rice straw by this method also. So here you have the ability to create the biofuels, the biochemicals and biomaterials. This is the basic uh, framework or the, uh, the model system where to generate these various uh, high value products from the uh, utility to some extent of these rice straw 
should have been picked up from the farms so they could be prevented by the farmers to be burnt off in the open space then uh, comes the pyrolysis pyrolysis is a very high temperature decomposition process where there is a release of the biochar the bioil again these are the by products obtained when there is a high pressure very high more than 500 degrees centigrade by high temperature uh, under vacuum there is a conversion of uh, definitely the organic carbon substances present in the respective organic substance to be re creating uh, other products like the biochar the bio oil and the synthetic gases so the rice straw pulp is could be used as a paper and the packaging here the problem again is the reason being the abrasions caused by the silica which is in high concentration uh, in uh, high concentration in the uh, straw Again, they are uh, practical or the MDF boards in solution. And these are again connected to this uh, methodology that is the paper industry. They fall under this board and paper and uh, furniture industry. Here, the major concern is the silica. Overall, the focus is that how to decline this silica. Here, I told you the upcoming slides regarding the significance of the silica. The, uh, the breeders uh, generated the rice uh, uh, hybrids in a way that they have a high concentration of silica long back ago that was all uh, in the green uh, revolution it was all planned so that the, the rice uh, pla uh, plants remain standard up um, up standard correctly so that on the high uh, heavy rains or with the high speed uh, winds, they do not fall off in onto the ground. So silica uh, hybrids were intentionally created for the good growth and development of the rice plants because they provide the structural support. They also provide the disease resistance because since they are repulsive for the animal feed, definitely they are repulsive to certain extent to many infectious uh, organisms also. So in a way, they are preventing the infections generated in the crop of the rice. Finally, the pest resistance also, the uh, abiotic stress, I told you, the water or the high wind flow, they are all, uh, the most of the rice varieties remain standby, reason being of the silica uh, naturally generated in them after creating the hybrid um, the species. And there is the mineral nutrition also that is held, water regulation also held, and the heat tolerance. These uh, mineral nutrition, water regulation, and heat tolerance are exploited by man also. Reason being, at very fine, when very fine, manually, when finds uh, very physically small sizes of the straw are created and they are left unburnt or as such as on the beds of the uh, field. If they are left for a few months or one month or two months, definitely they help in retention of the water of the soil in the farms also. They help in retention of the mineral nutrition as well as the high extreme temperatures and the surrounding region or the very low temperature. That too are cushioned or prevented because of this uh, chopped rice straw lying there and all leads to the contribution of the silica present in that straw. So in a way, it's a bliss also being silica there is a bliss, but problem is that that is preventing its commercial application because of its abrasive nature. So there is all biorefinery or bioenergy processes. It is causing, causing the animal feed quality. The biodegradation rate is also slowed down. If you leave uh, in a, a heap of the wheat straw or a heap of uh, a rice straw in the similar conditions in the farm, you will find there is delay in the uh, degradation, natural organic degradation of the rice straw is highly delayed as compared to the other straws. So because that all is contributed by the silica. So in a way, it's a bliss as well as it's a flaw. Uh, so how, uh, now we have to check out or and then how we can resolve this issue by definitely if we uh, decline the concentration of the silica because we are aware of the so many uh, economical yeah, commercial co uh, attributes of the other uh, uh, um, crops uh, straw but that is not possible that much with the rice straw so the main villain is the silica so in that case we have to decline the silica concentration so what are the various methods or the options uh, 
um, available. First is that you can generate the new rice varieties where there is uh, low silica rice varieties, but still contributing, not staking the strength or the physical strength and the other attributes of that respective variety. Then there are chemical and mechanical processes. There is a high chemical treatment of the acid and alkali sulfuric acid treatment and alkali treatment, anionic treatment in a very high concentration. That too is a successful in declining or releasing of the silica from that uh, straw. But our lab is focusing on the biological treatment. We are talking about the eco-friendly talk, the sustainable methods, where there is, it's a green method. We are, talking, we are talking in a go green summit. So definitely our option or our desire is to get some greener methods. So we, uh, my laboratory is undertaking this job that is the silica degrading microbes. We are to search, explore in our surroundings certain microbes which have a potential of releasing silica embedded in the tissue of the straw of the uh, rice so that the uh, silica declined or the silica lesson or uh, relatively silica free uh, straw could be uh, uh, a wonderful resource for so many commercial applications. So the scheme is not to use the silica alone, but in combination, we have taken the, if you can decline the use of these chemicals, uh, but uh, still taking the advantage of the go, go green, if not 100% go green, we can still have a synergism uh, tendency to so that a concentration of the chemical treatments could be declined. So this is the typical preview of the pretreatment of the rice straw. You have the chemical treatment method or the enzymatic treatment. We are focusing on these two methods. So these are the different harsh chemicals which are conventionally utilized in the chemical pretreatment of the rice straw. So that the resource generated after this pretreatment and the rice straw when free of the silica, it's a wonderful resource for the bio uh, fermentation industry or it's a wonderful for the animal feed for the uh, biodiesel, biorefinery uh, generation, and definitely most important is the biofeed or the fodder for the animals since it is uh, now, it, has, it is free or very low concentration of the silica. So these are the targets of our, uh, our lab that is enzymatic pretreatment or the chemical, some partial chemical could be opted so that definitely uh, this could be declined to some extent along with the combination because when we think about the enzymatic treatments, we take it a very expensive or a time consuming. So in a way, our lab has challenged these two parameters. So this, uh, the silicase enzyme, which, which has been, uh, uh, which degrades the silica, it not exactly degrade, it releases off the silica from the tissue, which is held among the cellulose, hemicellulose of the stem or any other uh, plant uh, uh, product. So silicases can hydrolyze the silicon dioxide to form the silicon acid that is released in the surrounding. Due to the reversibility of the reaction, silicases can also synthesize silicon dioxide and silicons and other silicium products from various purposes. The study also related to the use of the silicase activity for modification of these because silica is used here. Silica is very important, commercially important compound. So if you leach out silica from the rice straw, that's uh, the waste product, which is not uh, named as the silica, but it is not technically a waste, waste product. You are, in a way, separating the two substances, though both are very viable and need of the time. That is the, the straw free of the silica and the silica as such uh, obtained. That could be utilized in the modification of the glass, the computer chips, the wool, the optic fibers, and all these products definitely need the pure silica if we are successfully sieve off or leach out the silica from the rice straw. So the aim is first in, in the ongoing project of our laboratory here, the aim is to isolation of the silicase producing microorganisms from the soil samples. The enzyme thus produced could be used in some agro-based applications such as the removal of silica from the agro-based paddocking. This is how the lignin and cellulose and hemicellulose are intertwined or uh, embedding the silica molecules. And definitely when there is breakage of these tissues, there is release of the conversion of the silica into silicic acid. That is a substance which is leached out of it. So definitely we are looking for a uh, method where uh, the microorganisms uh, 
treat them, this tissue release it and then release of the silica from it. So what exactly were the objectives and the methodology our laboratory is taking are the isolation of the silica is producing. This is the typical method where the uh, first of all, uh, the resource from where the bacteria or the fungi or the microorganism should be taken off. The resource should be something where there is already a stressed environment for that particular substance. So normally we took the soil of the uh, rice farms or the grasses around there because we feel that area have by default in organic way the silica is lying there. And the microorganisms tend to survive in, in that survival mode if they are finding silica around them abundantly relative to the other places. They definitely have a stress response and generated some enzymes for this survival because otherwise they would be stressed. They would be abiotic stress on them because of the silica. So that the best places or the resources for any degradation or for most of the environment related solution are the places where the problem lies. There only you find the solution. The microorganisms were collected, are planned to be collected from the rice fields or the heaps of the uh, rice straw lying uh, in the farms, vacating, uh, and that is the place. And how these are the typical microbiology laboratory methods. They were grown, the pure colonies were, they were analyzed. Uh, the silica media was created in the petri plates. That's a typical uh, screening method, screening methodology of uh, isolating the, definitely when you pick up the soil or the sample, there are so many different types of the bacteria or the fungi there. So, but you are looking for precisely the silica degrading. So definitely the plate should be precisely rich in the silica, which has a tendency to degrade it. So this is how the silicase activity is looked into. That is the enzyme assay. The silicases from the silicolytic microbes are, was detected quantitatively by calorimetric method. They are the typical protocols. There is a prerequisite is in cultivating the microbe in a suitable production media at optimum condition. So next upcoming slides are regarding the optimum condition that has been undertaken in our laboratory so that the maximum enzyme, first of there was screening, followed by now you have shortlisted the microorganisms which have a silicase activity, but how you will look into those silicase activities, the silicase production should be enhanced and that too in a sustainable way, that too in an economic way also. So we tried for the many other in general economic uh, sources that could be used. So in, a, uh, in the present work, the two silicolytic micro, uh, so one from the paddy field, paddy we all in India call it as the rice field, and from the endophytic isolates of the wild grafts were chosen for the silicase production. And the both bacteria exhibited almost same enzyme activity as well as the diameter of the zone. That is the qualitative production that was the diameter of the zone of dilution is, the, that is not exactly the quantitative, uh, that is only uh, quanti uh, qualitative, sorry, that's not a quantitative uh, production. So it was found that the silicase activity for the bacteria isolate from the Paddy field samples, it was around 0 0.88 units. So these are the enzyme activity. These are the traditional enzyme activity units. And from this, so they were, they means both are very much close to uh, potential of the enzyme activity. So the enzyme production was taken. The silicate media was used for the silicase production. And the ways, as I told you, they have the tendency to degrade the silica lying in the medium. Not only we can check out if the enzyme is present in the uh, respective microorganism or not. The media was inoculated for culturing microorganisms and then it was incubated at uh, uh, 37 degrees centigrade. So it's not uh, upraised to uh, zero. The culture obtained was centrifuged and the cell free supernatant was used as an enzyme. So this is how a crude enzyme source was generated to check out if how much uh, silica was released from the rice straw. So these are the various optimized conditions where the total sample of the soil was taken. The, uh, in the paddy fields, there was the maximum silicolytic activity of the microorganisms was found. And this is the percentage of the silicolytic uh, 
uh, available there. So it is clearly from the paddy fields, the relative abundance in the paddy field and, uh, paddy field and the wild grasses was high for the microorganisms present. It's, since we opted for the different habitats from where the bacteria having the potential of breaking or releasing, uh, having the sil uh, silicase activity were worked on. So the study of the relative abundance of different silicolytic, this is how the transparent or the zone, clean zone are obtained by this method. So these are the various grasses from which, uh, from the roots of these are the endophytes from which the silicate solubilizing up to this potential, high potential were obtained. And this is a typical uh, qualitative, means whether the bacteria has a potential or not that was opted. And then spectroscopically, the exact how much pers pers uh, percentage of the silica has been. There are other indirect methods also, burning, taking of the ashes, ashes uh, uh, from after post-treatment of the uh, rice straw from these uh, bacteria, that too is different. So an identification of the bacteria was conducted, the, uh, the, it was found to be Klebsella species and they have been verified by the bioinformatics tools, that is the BLAST and all that. And now we are talking about what exactly are the optimizers. Once the shortlisting of the microbe has been generated, now we are to generate a conditions where in the best possible way, maximum amount of the silicase production could be uh, created. So this is how these are polymerized silica. Uh, suppose this is the silicase enzyme it will be targeting this silica uh, compound. And this is how the pre-silicic acid is generated from this polymerized silica. So different process and parameters were uh, taken studied for. That is the inoculum age, since microorganism has a typical graph of its growth. So accordingly, a particular inoculum age where it's uh, Metabolic activity is at its best and in the growth phase, definitely the size, how much oculum you need to take that towards tenderize the incubation period for the converting or the best culturing where the silicase maximum amount could be cultivated in the, uh, the conical class, the incubation temperature, the pH of the medium, the carbon sources, the nitrogen sources, the metal lines, if they are supportive or inhibitors, some certain chemical additives, these are very conventional methods which are opted in typical uh, fermentation industry or when we talk about the culturing of the microbes at the industrial level. So they were the standard methods opted for. This is the media selected finalized after thorough study that this is the basic media in which the selected silicolytic bacteria would be cultured uh, pertaining to the other conditions where they could be changed in the uh, studied pH, the temperature and other things we talked about here in this slide, the incubation time. But this was the finally decided media in which the production of the enzyme to be taken care of the two shortlisted uh, bacteria. So the age and the size of the inoculum was uh, taken into consideration. As could be found, it was achieved with an inoculum age of 24 hours, that is 0.62 units per ml per minute. Similarly, was taken for the 1% of the culture of the silicase activity was maximum for 0.58 units. So it may cause the overcrowding of the bacteria population. That is the because the more the time is taken now, less is the uh, silicase activity was created. So at 24 hours, the best silicase activity of this much unit was released. So in a way, as optimization of the standard for the creation or the release or the synthesis or generation of the silicase uh, in the test tube was obtained to be 24 hours with the inoculum, inoculum size of the 1%. They are final the results, although the different combinations the work was taken. Then this is the siliceous agro waste substrates. So in spite of taking the pure sucrose or some other, we opted for the agro waste substrates also where they could be best production of the silicase enzyme. So these are the different, as mentioned, rice straw, the rice husk, sugarcane trash, fly ash, wheat straw, sarkanda, or sarkanda is uh, definitely again um, uh, industry and uh, farm waste. So these are the different uh, siliceous substrates taken off. And uh, thankfully, since the bacteria isolated was also from the rice fields, so there is compatibility of the bacteria to be optimized or in the good production of its silicase generation in case of the uh, rice straw in itself. So rice straw has the best silicase activity when it was taken as a substrate for the production. 
regarding the ph at which the production of the silicates was best it was found to be 7 ph that in uh, it's a neutral ph and the silicates activity was maximum it was found to be 0.82 units per ml per minute then regarding the temperature that was found to be best in the 20 degrees centigrade although it was taken for the waste this uh, sorry not 20 degrees centigrade it was uh, it reached maximum at the 35 uh, degrees centigrade some ways stagnant between the 35 to means there was a rise up to 35 degrees centigrade so in a way this could be the band where the best uh, release or production of the silicates was expected it could be expected for the uh, um, next level uh, generation at the commercial level or at the bigger level. The optimization of the incubation time period for the, the biosolutive bacteria culture should silicase activity up to this period, it was uh, uh, um, rising substantially by the fourth day of the incubation. It gave the maximum silicase activity, but then there was a decline in the silicase production. So it means uh, here after four days of the inoculum of the shocklisted bacteria in the uh, earlier conditions of that pH or that temperature or that inoculum size of that inoculum culture day, the after four days of incubation, uh, there is maximum generation of the production or the release of the uh, silica, silicase enzyme. We now we're talking about the silicase enzyme. These are the various sugar uh, sources for the production media and again found to be the sucrose was among the best. The carbon source for the silicase production as is maximum silicase activity was 0.76 units per ml per minute then followed by the maltose and then starch and the xylose, glucose and galactose. So this is how the uh, final uh, the source of the sugar was shortlisted. Regarding the nitrogen sources, that is the inorganic one precisely, the highest silicase activities was reported to be 0.83, and that too was in the urea. Uh, that was in the urea. Here is the U for the urea. Uh, uh, other uh, nitrogen sources were potassium nitrate, ammonium chloride, ammonium sulfate, sodium nitrate, and ammonium nitrate. The urea was found to be the best nitrogen source for the culturing of the nitro uh, of the silicates producing um, bacteria along with their substantial generation or release of the because certain conditions are to be give uh, to be given to the microorganisms so they could uh, generate your desirable product so definitely this is another optimized situation where the highest silica was uh, created by utilizing urea as an inorganic nitrogen source the other nitrogen sources for the production of media were the yeast extract as is visible for from the slide for the organic constituents the yeast extract, extract beef extract and soybean meal we opted for an uh, organic uh, commercial uh, organic source of the nitrogen as well that was the soybean meal the result of the three indicated that um, yeast extract gave slightly high silicase activity so it was not that much variation. So I've been mean, willing to could be opted since it is available at uh, normal grocery stores also or in the cheap form also they could be uh, useful for the uh, commercial purpose. So it was selected as organic component for the production in the present study. We are talking about the present study, what to be shortlisted and we, what we came up with the results. So serving meal too is a good option, but uh, precisely when comparing the yeast extract, uh, extract was found to be relatively good because maybe the reason could be because of its good source of the B-complex vitamins present in it. And they could be providing the essential amino acids uh, for the uh, potential good growth of the silicolytic bacteria and definitely finally leading to the production of the silicates. Uh, the other metal ion sources for the production of, uh, since they could be preventing or supporting the production of the silicates enzyme. So it was found that potassium chloride was followed by the zinc dust, KL. Here is the potassium chloride uh, that is found to be best. And then it was uh, followed by the zinc the cadmium, uh, these are the different metal ion sources that too were expected contributing to the mechanism, the metabolic mechanism, where there is a production of the silicase by those silicolytic producing enzyme and uh, bacteria. <laughs> Definitely, the metal ions do uh, play a significant role in activating the 
metabolic pathway enzyme activity is finally which may be leading to the production of the silicase enzyme so our target was here to generate maximum amount of the silicase activity creation of the but definitely if more is enzyme produced by that silicolytic bacteria and providing them favorable conditions for culturing they have a high tendency to generate or synthesize them silicase then the other uh, additives for the production were the triton x10 they are typically laboratory chemicals the edta twin 80 triton x10 was found to be best among them uh, for production the medium that was uh, 0.58 units per ml per minute and the edta had 0.56 so definitely edta was comparatively uh, 33% less than the triton x10 so the little emission shows the potential of the enzyme for its application in the flax rating and plant DNA extraction where EDT is used as a chelating agent. So these are the ways where you have to focus on the points because DNA extraction, you have to add the EDTA and EDTA is not that way here, supportive in the production media for generation of the silicase from the uh, culture uh, of the silicolytic victim. So finally, this comes up for the enzymatic treatment. When the straw was taken, uh, these were the parameters shortlisted from the earlier one, but what the results came up, this is that these were the final, the conditions, the optimized conditions were when taken care of, the dose optimization for the enzymatic pretreatment of the rice straw was taking. The, uh, this is the result obtained, that is the lignin percentage, was this much decline? Uh, these are and then the hemicellulose percentage, cellulose, the ash, and the silica. These were the different dose optimizations of the enzymatic pretreatment before they are uh, treatment. The, these are the typical uh, parameters present in the straw. So I think by this, what you people must be have some idea what exactly our laboratory or the results to have taken up the problem. Yes, please. Sorry for the interruption, ma'am. It's ma a kind request from our side. Can you please conclude for us, ma'am? Yeah, this is last, this is last slide. This no, is last slide. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The significance of this research work now came out to be because there is a high amount of the silica in the paddy straw. It is very difficult to decompose it. In the present circumstances, there are no perfect uh, methodologies available to release off or to decline the percentage of the silica present in the rice straw and so that they could be optimally used as a feedstock or for various other industrial purposes. So burning causes the various health issues in the human and as well as animals. They affect the soil fertility, loss of the nutrients, etc., etc. And this, if there is enhancement in the removal of the silica with the help of this silicase from the rice straw, it makes more suitable for the value added purposes. Uh, silase could be generated uh, that could be used as a for, uh, fodder for the animals and that to our uh, paper making industry or in the bio refinery or biofuel industry they could be used if there is less of the silica present in the rice straw so they are very valuable resources the rice straw is very valuable resources for this purpose uh, until now no research has been conducted on the silica enzyme mediated removal of the silica from the rice straw so to cover the research gap, our research study was conducted and majorly reaction, reduction of the silica was done using silicase alone or in combination with some mild chemicals. So that was the last, last slide and I hope the picture clearly indicates these are supposedly the pending leftovers, the rice straws lying in the fields. We want no no for this burning because that could so many complications he is a child from the north india who is serving that you bring the straw we will uh, give you the solution and that will lead to these products that is the uh, biofuels the biodiesel the paper making industry the cardboard industry and the silage that is now the father could consume it if the process is taken like this we are uh, trying to work on it and these are the silica crystal, the graphite silica. They are uh, the pure compounds, the silica uh, molecules. They are the pure molecules that could be of significant importance in the commercial industry. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. presentation. 
participants if yes. you have any question you can put it in chat box the yes. questions will be answered in chat box yes. in chat box ah there is one question uh, am i audible yes ma'am uh, bhumiraj has mentioned one question uh, how silica has been removed it is trapped in the network of the tissues of the lignin uh, cellulose and hemicellulose it has been released we have not collected the silico when after treatment we check the composition of the silica in the rice straw there was tremendous fall or the decline in the silica composition okay bhumiraj is it clear so in a way we have, we have validated we have not sieved off or collected the silica released from it presently we are focusing on declining the concentration of silica uh, otherwise struck in the uh, rice straw that we have tested there is uh, there are typical methods or the test the burning how much cellulose hemicellulose or the silica available they are the biochemical test or the methods so there there was high percentage of the fall in the silica composition after treatment it was observed yes ma'am yes ma'am i think he replied in chat box that saying okay ma'am okay ma'am Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I request <coughs> Dr. Mohammad Muktada Ali Khan to render the lecture. Uh, good morning, everyone. Is I'm audible? Good morning, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. My slide is uh, visible. Yes, sir, it is visible. Okay. Uh, uh, so thank you very much, uh, especially Balik, uh, to invited me as a, one of the speaker of the today conference. Thank you. Sir. Uh, uh, and also, uh, I am also one of the co-organizing secretary of this conference. So, on behalf of this, as a secretary, I say so apologize to everyone due to some delay. So, uh, I will try my. Uh, presentation finish within the time as much as possible because we are already getting delay supposed to be the technical session start by 20 past 11 uh, so uh, 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 the topic of uh, my uh, presentation is secret of groundwater as we know the theme of this conference is go green the name of the conference and reshaping the earth uh, so many components uh, involved when we want to uh, make our earth our loving earth green. So one of the component is water, especially the groundwater. Uh, uh, most I see the list. Most of the uh, our participant from India, and also actually I'm also from India. Now I'm in India in the uh, very can say a very uh, the weather is very cool huh? and uh, the fog is very thick in my area in North India. <clears throat> so the 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 topic. Is what is the secret? Why the groundwater is important for us to make this this earth green? And the subtopic I choose is one of the case study from Malaysia. Uh, so uh, this is my outline of the presentation. Uh, the first I will be share some of the the data around the world how the groundwater uh, using in different sectors and what are the possible threats for this groundwater and and then I will be moved to one of the case study in Malaysia. Uh, then finally, we will come up some of the recommendation and what are the possible solutions to, to make this groundwater resource as a sustainable. So as we know, uh, I'm, I'm going to very short due to the time. I'm not uh, going to uh, delay uh, this presentation. Uh, as we know, uh, uh, this, uh, what I can say without water there is no life those uh, in india having this type of uh, uh, experience i think they can realize how this water resource is important for us so water uh, as per the uh, groundwater scientists the possibility of the next world war based on the water 
uh, so uh, <clears throat> there is there is uh, nothing uh, can be developed without the water in every sector if we see every sector we need the water uh, from uh, if we see from morning to night everything we need water for our daily activities for our drinking everything without water uh, we cannot we can't be perform our activities so land are water are the most vital resources around which overall development of a country rest the strong interaction between the two and their dependence on other components of the socio ecological system highlights the need for putting groundwater resource at the center of any developmental effort so this is the distribution overall distribution of uh, sorry <clears throat> overall distribution of the world water resources so as we know we are covering around the ocean so 97% is ocean the remaining 3% this divided water into different categories from uh, ice caps glacier rivers lakes so from the 3% 30% of is our groundwater and we see the surface water which include your lakes which include your rivers which include your swampies only 0.3% so in simple words we have a lot of groundwater storage but the point is how we are using this resource so we <clears throat> sorry okay this is some of the data uh, from european economic commission of groundwater as a drinking water supply so we can see the in australia uh, about 100% they are using australia denmark and malta and over 90% using the groundwater in italy and this is the data uh, so what uh, in simple words can say many countries they totally depend on our uh, groundwater uh, system the strict water legislation in some countries such as bulgaria hungary russia whereby fresh groundwater is for domestic and drinking water supply only uh, they cannot be used uh, uh, for other purposes except the drinking and the uh, <clears throat> the supply so in malaysia uh, uh, so far we are using uh, less than 3% this is, i will be correct sorry this is my typo error less than 3% still we are using only groundwater so what i can say in respect to malaysia is still a lot of groundwater is stored in the in the aquifers okay this is the what statistic of uh, groundwater <clears throat> groundwater development covers approximately 50% of drinking water needs 20% of irrigation and 40% of other uh, industries <clears throat> groundwater is the world most extracted raw material and break down of the that figure into percentage used per sector so for drinking water we are using 65% for irrigation and livestock we are using 20% and the industry and mining we are using this 15% uh, groundwater and for different one of the global map <clears throat> which uh, we can see in terms of the the precipitation I'm sorry maybe we can go down this this one is uh, showing the long term groundwater recharge uh, based on the rainfall so some of the area are very good rainfall and some of the area they are the, the rainfall is very minimal amount so this is the global map which is showing different recharge values recharge means how much this rainfall especially rainfall going into the groundwater system as a storage so they have different colors uh, which is from the brown uh, and the green the green one representing the highest amount of groundwater uh system is, is their maximum storage so we can see different countries uh having a different recharge rate so uh in case of malaysia uh, if we see the malaysia 
this is the Malaysia, this representing the green color, what we can say, the we in the Malaysian groundwater system has a sufficient storage of this uh, groundwater recharge. If we compare with other countries, for example, this is the India, the one I put it by black color, we can see in India has showing some of the color, uh, blue, purple color, and some of the orange color. So uh, the orange color means the rainfall, uh, the, the recharge rate is very less. Means in the system, groundwater is not is not uh, sufficient. That's why always we can uh, see the news of different type of uh, issues. Okay, this is the uh, uh, global water usage and global population in terms of population and in terms of the water usage. So we can see the three uh, line in the graph. The first is uh, <clears throat> the the thick blue color is the water withdrawal, <clears throat> and uh, another one is uh, water consumption, and the third one is the population. This graph projected by until two thousand. 25. So we can see even the in 2025, the line of population is not same as the water withdrawal and water consumption. So uh, we can see how much we are using this groundwater resource for our activities. This is the uh, bar graph, which uh, representing uh, in different country means comparison between surface water and groundwater use. So uh, we can see based on this graph, uh, many countries totally depend on the groundwater. For example, the Munich, for example, Hamburg, they are totally depend on these uh, groundwater uh, resources. Okay, this is the slide which is representing about the uh, water stress. Water stress, how much the stress of uh, in the groundwater uh, system. So people living in areas of water stress, for example, we can see a different graph. So uh, the first two graphs, first two bar graph is uh, brick. Uh, this of some of the country, which is under the part of the brick and this rest of the world and the OECD also the group of some of the countries. So what, uh, what uh, in this uh, uh, slide I want to highlight here in terms of the stress of the groundwater system. So this color showing, if the color is uh, uh, very red, means the severe, and if the color is the yellow color, light, uh, light brown or light yellow color, is representing the very stress level is very low, means the, the on the groundwater system, the either severe, medium, or the, the low. So we can see in different countries here, uh, this is the um, scenario, until the 2040 water stress ratio of withdrawal to supply until 2040 they project, uh, projected. We can see based on the different colors here. So in case of uh, Malaysia, uh, we can see this is the Malaysia. We can bring into the uh, not, not the uh, in this range, uh, which is uh, uh, 20 to uh, 40 to 80 percent as using but certain parts of the world which is totally extremely high we are already uh, can say over 80 percent the stress on the on their groundwater uh, system so the uh, sorry sorry in malaysia we can see uh, this is the one uh, which uh, one is uh, 10 to 20 percent actually Okay, this is the uh, in terms of poverty uh, the country uh, okay this is the in terms of poverty but i uh, told in the in the, in the starting uh, everything depend okay. on the on the water if we have water, uh, good water supply in our area, good proper management, so we can be can see the prosperity in the area. Uh, we have good agriculture system, we have good uh, uh, crops, we have other things, uh, because everything finally depends on the water. 
So if no water uh, is depend is is also impact our our personal life. Huh? So we can see from the photographs here. Uh, uh, if let's say the well is very far, how difficult to bring the water. Huh? If the well is within our house, how easy the life huh? in terms of time saving everything. So this is the chart. Uh, in the chart uh, we can see the top. The top is the Finland. And the last is the uh, Haiti. So this uh, graph showing how they are managing. So in Finland, uh, totally no poverty for water. Uh, they are very prosperous uh, in regards of the uh, what with, with respect to uh, this groundwater storages. Okay, this is some of the example uh, how the groundwater is stores in the uh, our earth. Uh, they have different type of aquifers. I'm not going to detail here uh, because this is not a top part of the topic, but this also based on the geology of the area. So certain geological condition, if we have any store the uh, find the water. Okay, these are the common threats uh, around us uh, of the groundwater. So what I can say from this slide, we we are the responsible. Uh, no other person. Everyone is responsible how we protect this groundwater resources. Uh, from each one, if we blame, uh, can I, may I repeat the person, please unmute your phone, please. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. So the uh, we can understand every single person or every single individual is responsible to protect this groundwater resource. This is a very valuable resource. So if everybody will make a strong promise from our own, yes, I have to protect this groundwater resource, then slowly, slowly will be cycled and we will not be, uh, will not go to the, the, the thing when we will not go to the time, it will be problem for us. So around us, we can see very simply, these are the activities going on and how they are uh, spreading and putting the things and how this contamination finally goes over groundwater system. And then so many health issues, so many groundwater uh, related quantity issue, quality issues, uh, we already know very well. Huh? Okay, this is the another example in terms of the, uh, if we uh, withdraw a lot of water, huh? another two, we have two type of problem. One is the quality problem. Another one is the quantity problem. Both are important for us. So the previous slide mostly representing the quality, but this slide representing mostly the quality. So one of the picture we can see the the bottle. In the bottle has a straw. One of the boy is uh, try to sucking the water from the bottle, but there is no water. So same thing going on around the world. Uh, our groundwater already. Finish. We are taking water from the well. Wells are dry, especially when the time of uh, summer. So, but if we have the proper resource management, then we can be not uh, face this type of uh, problem. Second issue is especially in the area, coastal area. Malaysia is a part of the coastal area. Uh, so, if we are taking also a lot of water, then the this uh, groundwater, uh, sorry, the seawater into into the groundwater. This is another issue. And the third issue, common issue, is around the earth is the sinking. If we taking the so much amount of groundwater without any monitoring, without any proper planning, so the the ports will be empty and the ground our um, ground will be uh, sink. And whatever on the top of the building is also affected. So this is uh, some of the, um, no, sorry, I will be put back on the top. <clears throat> this is the how the groundwater is uh, development. So we can see some of the photograph here. The, when our forefathers time, the, the water level is very shallow. Then comes our father time, then more deep. Now our time or maybe our future, our children, our son, grandson time, the groundwater level is going deep and deep. So when the things like this, if the groundwater from the deep, we need a lot of energy to take this water. It means we need a lot of electricity. We need a heavy pump. We need to wait. If any problem, we need to be... Uh, we spend more time. So everything depends how we are using this groundwater actually. So this is the main purpose to 
show this uh, of the slide eh? control on groundwater development okay this is one of the scenario in malaysia groundwater in malaysia so in uh, one of the state malaysia has many states but one of the state which is using uh, mostly groundwater uh, which is around 43% uh, okay this is one of the uh, study in respect to Malaysia in resources in Peninsula Malaysia. So uh, this is the very important uh, <clears throat> in respect to Malaysia. Groundwater is a key component of the water cycle. So rain, if the rainfall if the rainfall is uh, this amount 2496 millimeter uh, so from this rainfall evaporation of this value and the surface runoff this amount and groundwater recharge of this amount 148 uh, millimeter so the sustainable groundwater pumpage we can be do uh, by this value 10 to 10 to the power 9 cubic meter or 27322 meter liter per day so this is the sum of the calculation okay in another and then finally, uh, we have the storage 2653 into 10 to the power 9 cubic meter. Okay, in the another uh, scenario, let's say there is no rainfall because we know the climate is uh, getting changing every day. So many climatic issues. Huh? So we uh, should be ready if uh, there is problem come tomorrow, draft problem. So how we can be settled. So in that case, we predict there is no rainfall. With no rainfall, there is no surface runoff, no evaporation, no groundwater recharge, and we have this storage only. So from this storage, we need to do the water pumping sustainability. We need to we need to know how much amount of water we can be used to fulfill our requirements. So this uh, type of prediction is very important everywhere in the part of the world. How much today we have, and if something happened tomorrow, how we are going to use this is the part of the work management. This is some of the case study uh, of Malaysia. Uh, when we drill a well, after a well, we get a good uh, amount of water. Um, okay, this is the uh, one of the case study. Uh, sorry, I'm going to share very fast. Uh, this is the location map of the area and has a uh, we have uh, two type of wells there, uh, some shallow wells, which is mostly using by the uh, domestic per domestic wells. We can say domestic wells or using by the people. And some of the wells is a deep well, which mostly used by the different industries and also the groundwater department to to supply the water. So, but this that in this study, I mostly focus on the shallow water uh, because uh, want to see the in terms of quality mainly uh, how the surrounding activities impact on the the shallow water in the domestic wells okay the present issue the present issue uh, in Kalantan in Malaysia is the case study uh, according to the review of the national water resource study they predicted 2000 to 2050 and they come up uh, they come up to this value 2010, 2070, and 443 million liters per day. The amount of water, the requirement of water using from 2020 to 2050. So we can see from 2020 to 2050, the water amount mostly double. 2010 to 443, we can see. So in view of the alarming possibility of groundwater demand doubling in about 30 years. So when we can see in 30 years, the amount of groundwater withdrawal is double. So this consider one of the issue, uh, how we are going to uh, manage. So it is almost certainly the quality and quantity of groundwater aquifers would be a major environmental hazard to be handled in the, in the future. So that's why a lot of study going on in terms of quality, in terms of quantity, uh, and and also coming different different type of uh, solutions. So this is the area uh, has a uh, um, uh, using this groundwater uh, groundwater uh, for different activities. And this is their mostly their domestic wells. Uh, the wells are not very deep, maybe maximum ten meters. Uh, 
So the sum of the wells, they put the pump and they take the water from boring from the pump. And some of the well is still, uh, they're using the traditional method, you put the bucket and they take the water. But this is uh, pure domestic wells. This is some of the material methods, uh, common material methods we use. Uh, we did uh, many studies actually we did uh, for physical parameters, we do it for chemical, we also did for isotopes, huh? isotope level. But in this, uh, uh, today I will show just uh, common only uh, our results. So this is the, the land use uh, for different years from 2015 and 2000. Uh, five two different uh, time of land uses so we can see uh, the changes here uh, maybe can refer my presentation later uh, because there is now no time to present uh, all the tables and the values so but uh, we can see there is a uh, changes in terms of the settlements uh, from 2005 to and from 2015 some of the values is increasing some of the values is uh, decreasing so this is the uh, the some of the results of the water level water level measurement the end of the water level of two different season. This study actually did by two different uh, season. One is the pre monsoon season, and another one is the post monsoon season. So this is the uh, after collecting the some of the water level data, we can see the water level contour map, which representing in three D some of the areas where we can see a depression. In this depression, basically representing the high withdrawal of water, and the area where which can see the peaks, that area representing uh, there is a sufficient amount of water in that area. So is a is a combination of uh, discharge and the recharge. This is some of the water quality data, which we uh, take it from different well. And when we compare it, so, so based on this uh, WHO, uh, Ministry of Health, and all the values, most of the values are within the permissible limit. There is uh, not much, uh, uh, I think except the iron and the magnets, the other values are most of the within the permissible limit. So this is the one of the map of potential uh, solid, uh, which we can see uh, uh, different values, uh, but all the values within the permissible limit. There is uh, no any issue which can be uh, handled now. The present days. Okay, this is some of the examples. Uh, okay, this is also one of the uh, classification of groundwater in terms of uh, how how the this major ion uh, means uh, cations and the anions are attracted each other in different season. For example, the first uh, photograph in uh, um, by sodium and the chloride, and the second photograph also in sodium and chloride, but these two in different season. One is pre-monsoon season, one is uh, the post-monsoon season. How we can see the chemically, the, the groundwater quality is changing with two different time periods. This one also with other uh, relationship between other anions and the, and the cations. Okay, and finally, uh, we come up with a different type of uh, type of water with what we can see in the hydrogeology term groundwater facies. So we can see here uh, in the picture, which is on my right hand, the groundwater type is uh, mostly is sodium rich and bicarbonate type. But when we reach on the pre monsoon season, uh, means after rain, this groundwater not same as the previous, already has changes due to the, due to the interaction 
with the rainwater. Okay, we enter this another uh, LL diagram, uh, also representing the, the two seasons of the quality criteria. So in simple words, we can be mentioned with time the quality is changing. It's not mean the quality is same forever, no. With time, quality can be changes, either can be worse, either can be improves what is the factor there. So this one is based on the for the irrigation purpose. Uh, also prepare the two uh, different season of diagrams. So most of the samples, uh, what you can say is okay under low salinity hazard. Uh, in uh, only one sample is here has uh, showing the medium salinity hazard. Uh, but if we see on the post monsoon, this sample already come bring in here. Uh, so the uh, overall, we can say the water is not a problem for the use of agriculture. Okay, so uh, this is also some of the study by trace elements. Uh, we can see some of the elements has a higher more than the permissible limit, iron, uh, manganese, and the lead, and also strontium. So the possible reason of this is uh, due to some uh, geogenic factors and also uh, some activities around the areas. So, uh, what, sorry. Okay, this is the reason. Okay, this is one of the case study, another case study uh, around the landfill area uh, because the area is filled by, with the landfill and they are surrounded by area. They are using the some shallow wells. So I'm not going to in detail, just want to share the result. We can get the idea. So the, the values uh, in green color and the yellow color is exceed the permissible limit of WHO as well as simulation health standards. How this landfill affecting the uh, shallow water. So groundwater development, we need a proper development and proper investigation. If we not use the scientific, proper scientific method, so the chances is something wrong in our this uh, in this system. So we need, uh, wherever we are, we need a proper expertise and proper investigation to, to identify and to withdraw this groundwater resources. So do not lose hope when report is stated that area has no groundwater. It is another study uh, for in terms of the identification of water. So we use different uh, geophysical methods, especially electrical resistivity method and identify the proper place where the driller should drill the well and to take the and to withdraw the high amount of the groundwater. This is some of the scenario possible uh, solutions. What are the methods we can use to improve our water? quality around the area, artificial recharge, we should have recharge ponds, we should have control by pumping, we should have canal. So we have rainwater harvesting system, I think. Some of the area, for example, in India, uh, we are using in some of the area rainwater harvesting. So this depends area to area, wherever we are, and uh, we should find the proper investigation and proper way of uh, treatment. Okay, finally, the recommendation, uh, uh, there is a need to mobilize groundwater professional together with water resource managers and irrigation engineers, soil scientists to identify transsectoral governance and management response for improving resource sustainability. Because nowadays, uh, we cannot do work alone. Uh, if we do work alone, maybe something wrong. So we need to work together yeah. and we will uh, get the more proper understanding and result. So at the last, uh, water is a gift of God. Uh, so we should always uh, pray yeah. to thanks to God. Yes, please. So sorry for the interruption, sir. Can you please uh, conclude for us? Yeah, the, we are getting late for the technical yeah, the, session. This is the last slide. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So water is a gift of God. And uh, we always thanks to God, our God. And how we thanks to God? By three ways, we should respect the resource, we should save the resource, and we should protect the resource. The from tongue is not sufficient. 
we should be thanks to our God with action. So there are three actions, respect, save, and uh, uh, protect. So this is uh, the, the home-taking message from one of the philosophers. Ignorance is the mother of poverty. So by this, thank you very much. Is there any question? Please, you can uh, put in the chat box or also can maybe ask uh, later. Has any question? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your keynote session. Participants, you. if you have any question, you can put it in chat box. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anyone have any question? I think no one has any questions. Sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Kind attention to everyone. We have important announcement. Now we are glad to announce our ninth Govering Summit Award category and winners. Winners of the We'll announce the winners now. Winners of the Green Achiever Award category. Dr. Manmohan Bhak, Founder and Director, NGO, Abhinandan Swacha Seva Sangha, Balahi, India, Ravi, Ravindran Chandran, Tamil Nadu Agricultural University, India, Congratulations to the winners of Green Achiever Award. Now, winners of the Green Initiator Champion Award category. Dr. Kalyani Supriya, Assistant Professor, Department of Environmental Science, Himachal Pradesh University, Summer Hill, Shimla, India. Dr. Shivani Sanjeev Gavendi, Professor, Kayachi Kitsa, Parul Institute of Ayurveda and Research, India. Fatime Sadat Mer Mohammad Mahi, Department of Food Science and Technology, Science and Research Branch, Islamic Azad University, Tehran, Iran. Tehran, Iran. MD Rezwan Ahmad Mehdi, Komala University, Bangladesh. Congratulations to the winners of the Green Initiated Champion Award. Now, winners of the Women Excellence Award category. Gayatri J, Environmental Sciences, ICAR, Indian Agricultural Research Institute, India. R. Madonna Mary, Assistant Professor, The American College, India. Dr. P. Varalakshmi, Associate Professor, Department of Molecular Microbiology, Madurai Kamraj University, India. Congratulations to the winners of the Women Excellence Award. Now, winners of Environmental Excellence Award category. M. Rajesh, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, The American College, India. Bhumi Raj K., Associate Professor, Environmental Sciences, Tamil Nadu Agricultural University, India. Congratulations to the winners of Environmental Excellence Award. Thank you all. Now we'll move on to the technical session.
Now, I would like to welcome our session chairs for the day. E.R. Shivani Ghak, Assistant Professor, Kurukshetra University, India. Dr. Hardeep Prashama, Assistant Professor, Kurukshetra University, India. Dr. Sandeep Gupta, Assistant Professor, Kurukshetra University, India. Ma'am and sir, shall we start the session? Yes, we can start. Yes. Now I would like to call the first presenter of the day, P.K. Rayanga. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. I'll just load my presentation. Just hold on. Yes, okay. Okay, maybe you just move to the second presenter as I'm getting myself ready because of time. Okay. We'll move on to the next presenter of the day, Dr. Jichendra Pavara. Yes, I will unmute. One sec. What is happening, Nimeda? Jitendra Pavara, are you here? Next participant, Dr. Ranjini Bayas. Dr. Ranjina. Monica. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Good morning to everyone from Romania. <laughs> yes, Are you ready, ma'am? Yes, just a second, please. Okay, sure. Thank you. It can be seen, my presentation? Yes, ma'am, it is visible. Okay. I want to present a work about, about uh, bio-inspired materials for development of more stable and specific proteolytic enzymes. Uh, the work was prepared together with my colleagues. All my colleagues are read in, in the author box. Uh, I want to talk today about the enzymes as efficient biocatalysts for uh, green technologies bio-inspired materials used in immobilization techniques and the proteolytic enzymes immob immobilized in biocompatible matrices. Uh, it is known that the enzymes are the key of life in every living cell, but nowadays the biotechnological industry needs fast, selective, and very efficient catalysts outside living uh, cells. Um, Considering the reaction needed by the enzymes, like uh, milk condi uh, conditions, uh, pH and uh, optimum temperature very close to the physiological one. Uh, also, the industry needs biodegradable catalyst and uh, environmentally acceptable solvents, uh, like the water that the uh, enzyme needs. Uh, the they... Sorry? Uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, on kind request to the session chairs, mm, I request all the session chairs to turn on their video for the interactive session, please. It's request from our side. Sorry? It can't be seen? No, no, ma'am. This is the request to session chairs. You can is start present, ma'am. You can continue. Okay. All the enzymes have high activities and the more important have chemo regio and stereoselectivity needed by all the technological bioapplications. 
uh, uh, biocatalyst application can be found in all the domain, like food and animal feed, pharmaceuticals, also in medicine, especially for analytical purposes, uh, in diagnostics, also to obtain detergents, biofuels, and in environmental technology, the enzymes can be found as very good biocatalysts. Uh, considering the... Um, uh, high quality of uh, enzymes as a catalyst, we can say that there are di some disadvantages of these soluble enzymes because they can be unsoluble in the, in the media, in the reaction media. Uh, they are very difficult to recover as active protein for reuse. And uh, sometimes it uh, can be expensive, all the process can be expensive. So the solution can be the immobilized biocatalyst. Uh, there are many techniques to immobilize biocatalysts for um, uh, soluble enzymes. Uh, they can be binding to the insoluble ca uh, carrier by different methods, physical, electrostatic, or, or covalent bindings. Cross-linking is another method to, to immobilize enzymes uh, by um, connecting to bifunctional regions or multifunctional regions. And the most important that I want to mention here, and I want to talk about the entrapment of the enzymes in gel matrices especially. Uh, entrapment is a very promising method uh, because uh, different variety of biocatalysts can be immobilized in gel matrices uh, that can be polysaccharides, protein, or synthetic polymers. Uh, the entrapment method is based on polymerization or precipitation reaction in the presence of the enzymes. The result is that the enzymes are captured in the pores of the network uh, because there are not um, bindings be between the immobilization matrix and the enzymes. The structure of the enzymes and the conformation is not affected or is less affected because sometimes activity may lose um, loss of activity may happen in uh, for the enzymes uh, the big disadvantage of the entrapment is that the substrate or the product molecule can diffuse to the gel towards from the catalyst the disadvantage uh, the main disadvantage being the um, diffusional limitation to the polymeric matrix to the enzymes also, inorganic materials can be materials can be used to immobilize the enzymes uh, based on their uh, big quality, like uh, uh, high mechanical stability, high resistance to microbial attack, and uh, uh, no toxicity towards the bioactive molecules. Uh, the results of using these different materials, organic or inorganic materials, uh, results in obtaining bio-inspired. Uh, inorganic, organic, inorganic hybrid developed gels with proper physicochemical properties. Uh, one of the methods to obtain these uh, bio uh, inspired biomaterials is the soil gel pro uh, process. Um, what is this process? Is synthesis of silica glasses at room temperature. Um, entrapment of functional active biomolecules in this. Um, in, in silico synthesis of the glasses. And um, it can be seen that by this process, it's possible to introduce and retain the bi biological activity into the silica glasses. The uh, environment of these uh, matrices is very close to the environment in uh, living cells. Considering the uh, low temperature, the room temperature for the synthesis of these uh, biomaterials, uh, it can be a very, very, very promising process uh, for um, um, immobilization of bioactive compounds. Uh, using this uh, way, it can be combined um, the new generation materials with biology. Uh, this kind of materials, biomaterials of time obtained by soldier processes, uh, has uh, very good mechanical properties and are biocompatible with, with um, biological active molecules. Uh, this process is uh, known for many years because Dickey in 1955 um, 
real, realized for the first time the entrapment of enzymes in silica gels. But unfortunately, for more than 25 years, the method was uh, forgot. And um, starting with 19 years of near um, realized the entrapment of protein molecules using alkoxide precursor based on this sol gel method. Since then, a lot of uh, biological species have been entrapments, not only enzymes, but also antibodies, membrane proteins, nucleic acids, and also living cells. Uh, for this process, two steps can be used, obtaining the sols in uh, in acid catalysis and the gel in base catalysis uh, for a very good uh, properties of the xerogels containing the enzymes immobilized. Different parameters have to be in, um, optimized like water alkoxide ratio, the pH of the reaction mixture, uh, the temperature of the process, the organic solvent used to obtain this uh, xerogel and also the presence or absence of different additives to control the porosity of gels. Uh, the precursor for sol gel process are many, many, many. Some of them are uh, presented here. The most important are uh, in red, methoxy and toxyalkoxides. Um, during the years, many different enzymes were uh, entrapment in um, by this process in uh, silica gels. Uh, the first one, Avnir, tried to uh, use tetraetoxysilane to entrap the alkaline phosphatases. And uh, it was shown that the entrapped enzymes retain its activity uh, up to mounts and the thermal stability wow. of the enzymes was uh, improved. Also, another very important author published in this domain was Reds. Uh, he used a large variety of the uh, sites uh, to immobilize microbial lipases. Um, the enzyme activity was enhanced in the gel. It was observed an increasing the amount of the hydrophobic silanes and uh, the alkyl chain length of the hydrophobic silanes. Um, he used uh, the authors used uh, to increase the enzymes of uh, the activity of the enzymes uh, different additives with uh, macromolecules like polyethylene glycol polyvinyl alcohol albumin and gelatin uh, it was demonstrated that these uh, additives have a protective um, action on the enzymes uh, from the natural effects during the silanes. Also, the properties of the gels um, from porosity and pore diameter point of view was changed, and the uh, enzymes was stabilized during the reaction in organic solvents. Also, these uh, entrapped enzymes could be uh, used uh, for many times uh, in different reaction cycles. Um, another author who used this kind of soldier process to entrap enzymes was uh, Livage. He uh, entrapped lipases uh, using different uh, different precursors. Uh, the entrapped lipases was used successfully in organic chemistry, food industry, and oil processing. Um, Way and the co-authors used um, deglucosis for uh, ad as additive to improve the activity of enzymes and to increase the, uh, its stability. Um, with my colleagues, we try to do the same for bacillus, pro uh, bacillus lichenniformis proteases. Uh, we entrapped using two different precursors, uh, tetraetoxysilane and tetramethoxysilane, by sample entrapment or entrapment in the presence of the glucose, or using a combined method entrapment deposition on uh, ceramics. It uh, was demonstrated that the glucose as additive uh, have a um, positive effect on the protease activity on the immobilization yield for both for both of the precursors or used uh, in the process. Also, uh, we immobilized the um, alkalase, another microbial diseases, no. in um, no. silica. No. 
Yes. Sorry for the interruption. Try to conclude fast, ma'am. For oral presentation, only 10 minutes, ma'am. Ah, okay. Thank you. Okay, sure. We also used alginate. The best results obtained com comparative with the soil gels was for the alginate. Um, and uh, the same results was obtained for another uh, uh, proteolytic enzymes from vegetable origins, papain. Uh, many different uh, precursors were used by the authors like uh, Tetrakis or Tios um, with very good results for uh, reutilization in three different cycles of reutilization. Also ketosan alginate and uh, combined hybrid ketosan alginate coated or silica gel coated alginates were used. And the uh, literature mention, mention of uh, all of this uh, procedure. Of course, the properties of the biocatalyst was changed after immobilization. Our uh, group uh, had a lot of um, um, studies uh, about this uh, property change, about uh, immobilization, and uh, good results was obtained for all of um, these properties. Kinetic studies to measure the catalytic efficiency and the affinity of the uh, substrate for the enzymes after immobilization was studied. Uh, we can conclude that the biomaterials obtained by soil gel methods are suitable for many biotransformation, allowing the entrapped enzymes to retain all biological activity, and the soil gel technology is both simple and in inexpensive. The immobilization technique is low cost, creating the possibility of employing it to other biological systems. I would like to thank you to my colleague for this experimental results, uh, to thank you for your attention and to thank to the organizers uh, for the opportunity to present my work here in this uh, nine Co Green Summit. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your presentation. Session chairs, you have any question to the presenter? No question, Niveda. You can proceed on the next. Participant. Oh, okay, thank you. We'll thank you. Next mm. Jitendra Pavlets, Dr. Jitendra Pavlets, are you here? Yes, sir. Could you please share your screen in full screen? Full screen mode, sir. Yes, ma'am. Is my screen is visible? Oh, yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. Kindly share it in full screen. Oh, okay, sir. Fine now. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, can I start, ma'am? Hello? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Yes, sir. Can I start, ma'am? Yes, sir. Sure, please. You can start so, now. Okay. Good morning. Peori. And please uh, uh, consider the time. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I will complete within a, uh, within a, that uh, stipulated time. Thank you. Okay. Good morning to everyone. Myself, Dr. Jitendra M. Paura, Assistant Professor in the Department of Chemistry, Sangu Karnatakur Arts, Commerce and Science College, New Panvel. And uh, I am here to uh, present my research work. And the title is Synthesis Characterization in uh, Yttrium Oxide Y23 Nanoparticles. It's Synthesis Characterization and Application via Thermal Decomposition of YCUP2 Glycine Twice H2 Complexes. In the ninth, in the ninth go green, in the ninth go green summit 29, 2023, virtually. So uh, we have synthesized the ligand yttrium complexes. So for the preparation of these complexes, the I have used the primary ligand, and the name of that primary ligand is cupron, and I have taken the yttrium chloride hexahydrate as a metal, and I have taken the secondary ligand amino acid, and the name of that amino acid is glycine. Then these three components were mixed in a suitable solvent and that were heated for about 10 to 20 minutes and the obtained complex were dried and sent for characterization. Then after that, once that uh, complex was synthesized, uh, approximately 0.5 gram of newly synthesized yttrium complexes were uh, sent to thermal decomposition process in an oven for about 400 degrees Celsius temperature for the duration 30 minutes. 
and this thermal treatment yielded the powder white of indicating the successful production of y 3 nanoparticle so subsequently the resultant powder was allowed to naturally cool at a room temperature followed by the meticulous washing with ethanol multi multiple times to eliminate and eliminate the impurity so ultimately this prepared y 3 nanoparticle was subjected to oven drying process resulting into the attainment of dry and stable form and after that this prepared nanoparticle were, were sent for characterization and for potential application. So in this table, this table shows the antibacterial activity of my synthesized complexes and its nanoparticle. And I have used this four different strain of microorganism that is S. aureus, C. diphtheri, S. stephi and originasa. So out of this, this, uh, this complexes effective against the S. aureus as compared to the P. aerogenesa and this nanoparticle shows the maximum zone of inhibition against P. aerogenesa. Uh, this table shows the minimum inhibitory concentration of my synthesized complexes as well as nanoparticle. Nanoparticles are showing the better activity as compared to complexes and I have used this four different strains and uh, this is the MIC concentration of complex uh, salt that is YCl3 and cupron and we have used the tetracycline as a standard and this uh, spectra shows the U, this spectra shows the UV spectrum of my synthesized complexes and the single peak around single peak around the 288 nanometer, 288 nanometer indicates the presence of YC bond and it confirms the formation of Y203 nanoparticle. These are the same images of my complexes and Y203 nanoparticle. The size is for nanoparticle is 10 nanometer and the size for the complex is about 200 nanometer. It confirms the formation of y 3 nanoparticle. These are the same images of my complexes as well as y 3 nanoparticle. The average particle size of nanopar average particle size of y 3 nanoparticle is 15 nanometer, and for the complexes, it is about 300 nanometer. So these images confirm the formation of y 3 nanoparticle, and this uh, slide shows the XRD pattern of my y 3 nanoparticle, the peak at 29.2, 33.8, and 57.6 correspond to 220, 440, 440, and 622 plane, reflecting the cubic Y203 nanoparticle respectively. And in conclusion, uh, we have developed uh, the uh, in we have developed the novel complexes. Novel complexes that is YQP, GLY, twice 4H2O, and we have subjected that complexes for thermal decomposition. And the electronic spectra were taken in the methanol as a solvent, and it revealed that the, there is a formation of the uh, nanoparticle takes place. And FTR spectra shows that the complexes for uh, there is a uh, FTR spectra shows that there is a formation of bond between the metal and the ligand. XRD shows that the crystalline nature of nanoparticle. Same time images shows that the uh, complexes are, uh, sorry, the nanoparticles are formed between two, between the 10 to 15 uh, particle size range. And this is all about my, uh, this today's presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your presentation. Session chess, you have any question to the presenter? No question. Okay. We'll move on to the next presenter, ma'am. Yes, sure. Okay. Arayan, are you here? Can you be able to present now? Okay. Ranjni, Dr. Ranjni. Actually, Dr. 
Hardeep uh, Rai uh, want to ask something and uh, he is unable to uh, unmute his mic. He is asking his questions in the chat box. You can okay. read that question. Can you try now? Here. Can you try now? Actually, I get access already. Hardeep sir, can you hear me? Actually, I gave access, man, but I don't know what is the error. Can we move on to the presenter, ma'am? Next present. No. Shivani, now. Hello. Uh, actually, I was also unable to unmute. Uh, no, ma I gave access, actually. Niveda, uh, you can uh, also read the question from the chat box uh, okay, for I'll the participants. The sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, question for Jitendra. For what application you will use Y203 nanoparticles in future? Jijendra, are you here, sir? Okay, move on to the I next participant. In the meeting, ma'am. Okay. Twinkle Jenna. Mom, I gave access. Twinkle, Twinkle Jana, ma'am, I gave access. Hello. Meha Kumari. Uh, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, can you present now? Uh, okay. Okay. Share your screen. Almost like visible. Hello. Yes, ma'am. It is visible. Is it moving? Yes, ma'am. It is moving. Uh, good afternoon to one and all present. Myself, Megha Kumari, PhD agronomy, second year student. And I welcome you all in my presentation, which is on the topic, Impact of Conservation Agriculture on Soil Organic Carbon Dynamics. In today's era of intensive agriculture, which involves the use of agrochemical, there is increased mechanization, which has led to the increased carbon mineralization, which has led to the loss of soil organic carbon. It is estimated. Uh, it is estimated. Uh, sir, can you please move uh, the mic? Uh, Professor Dr. Sanjay K. Patil. It is uh, estimated that around 1,417 billion tons of soil organic carbon is stored in the first meter of the soil and around 2,500 billion tons at the uh, two meter soil depth. Since 1850, it is estimated that around 66 billion tons of uh, soil organic carbon is lost mainly because of the land use changes. As we can see on the map, 
Uh, most of the countries in the world, they are facing the loss of soil organic carbon. In India also, we are facing uh, soil organic carbon is less. It is mainly 0.4 to 0.6 percent, which is far less than the optimum. Sustainable Development Goal, which was started in 2015, and it was adopted by the United Nations members. Uh, conserving soil organic carbon, it uh, contributes to the maintenance of five SDGs, that is zero hunger, uh, good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation, life on land, and also the climate change. At the COP21, uh, a voluntary action plan, that is four per mile initiative was started in which it was uh, initiated that soil organic carbon of the world should be increased at a rate of 0.4% per year to a depth of 40, uh, 40 centimeter. The soil organic carbon of India has came down to 0.3 to 0.6%. Now the global carbon cycle. Uh, there are basically five pools of the carbon, uh, carbon pools, that is ocean, soil, vegetation, atmosphere, and the carbon, it circulates among themselves. Now the soil organic matter and soil organic carbon. In soil, 25% of the area is occupied by air, 25% by water, and 45% by mineral particles. And the remaining 5%, it is occupied by organic matter. And then the organic matter, it is further subdivided, that is 65% is occupied by humus, 15% by resistant organic matter, 10% by fresh residues, and 10% by the living organism. Living organism, And we could calculate our soil organic matter from soil organic carbon by multiplying it with uh, 1.724, that is the Van Demlin factor. Now the constituents of the soil carbon pool. Uh, the carbon pool it is mainly divided into soil organic carbon and the soil inorganic carbon. Uh, the soil organic carbon is divided into dissolved, that is sugar, and the solid. Uh, and the solid is further divided into protected SOC and the unprotected SOC. In the unprotected soil organic carbon, it is contained in the coarse silt and sand fraction, and the protected SOC it is contained in clay and fine silt particles. And the protection mechanism is as follows, that is physical, in which it is encapsulated within the stable microaggregate, chemical, in which there is the formation of weak acid compound, uh, biological, in which there is the microbial exudates that repel each other, and ecological, that is coupled cycling of carbon with other constituents. And the soil inorganic carbon, it is divided into the dissolved bicarbonate, that is leached into shallow groundwater, and the solid carbonates. Now the soil fraction, on the basis of the turnover time, they are divided into the labile, slow, and the stable. The labile soil organic matter, they are available between one to five years, and they constitute particulate organic matter, fresh residue, and living organism. The slow soil organic matter, it uh, it, its turnover time is 20 to 40 years. It constitute humus, organic carbon, resident residue, and they are physically protected. And the stable soil organic matter, uh, their turnover time is 5,000 to 1,000 years, and they constitute resistant organic carbon, protected humus, and the charcoal. Now, let us see what are the benefits of the soil organic carbon. It has various benefits, that is the physical, chemical, biological, and ecological. The physical benefits include that it increases uh, water retention, it decreases the drought, it improves the infiltration in structure. It improves the aggregation. It improves the aeration and also improves the tilth. In chemical, it acts as a plant reservoir and it increases the nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. While the biological properties include, it improves the soil biota and provides energy and, and it also increases MBC. And the ecological uh, properties include, it improves the cycling, that is the nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And in totality, it increases the productivity, produce quality, and it lasts enhanced stability. So now the question arises that how could we conserve soil organic carbon? The soil organic carbon could be conserved through one such practice, that is the conservation agriculture. 
Conservation agriculture, it is a concept for resource-saving agricultural crop production that strives to achieve uh, acceptable profit together with high and sustained production level while concurrently conserving the environment. It is based on enhancing natural biological process above and also the below the ground. The area has been expanding at an annual rate of more than 10 million hectares per year since 2008 and 2009. Globally, a total of 205 million hectares, which is corresponding to 14.7 of the cropland area, is under conservation agriculture. India, ranked 8 in terms of area in conservation agriculture, corresponds to 3.5 million hectares. There are various practices which could be included in the conservation agriculture, such as laser land leveling, in which the land is leveled to uh, plus minus two millimeters from the average, and crop residue, which could be managed either via incorporation or residue retention. And in bed planting, the crops are planted on a raised bed on a, uh, a bed width of 0 0.6 to 1 meter, and two to three crops are grown. And in brown manuring, rice, and crops such as Sesbania and Dhacha, they are grown and at the age of 25 to 30 days after sowing, they are killed by the means of an herbicide. Conservation tillage, it is an umbrella term which constitutes no tillage, minimum tillage, etc. And in crop diversification, crops are grown either simultaneously or in crop rotation on a single piece of land. Now, what are the principles of conservation agriculture? Conservation agriculture, it has mainly three principles. That is the crop diversification, minimum soil movement, and uh, soil coverage with residue of the previous crop, cover crop, or both. There are various benefits such as it reduces the occurrence of pests and diseases by interrupting their cycle. It controls the weed. It uh, adequately distributes nutrient in the soil profile. It reduces the climatic risk. And the minimum soil movement, that is the reduced tillage, it has a benefit such as avoid compaction and soil surface seeding. It reduces the erosion and reduces the greenhouse gas emission. Whereas soil coverage with residue of the previous crop or cover crop, it has benefits such as higher water infiltration, less evaporation, increased biological activity, and soil organic matter increased. And now, what are the potential benefits following the conservation agriculture adoption and the soil organic carbon increase? There is increased in the soil structural stability and decreased erosion. There is increased water infiltration and the soil water storage. There is increased soil biological abundance and diversity and yield and the profitability is increased. Now, what are the future needs to increase conservation agriculture adoption and soil organic carbon? We need to identify locally appropriate crop rotation and management and equipment to deal with the agronomic challenges. We need to identify a removal of social, cultural, and institutional barriers to uptake. There needs to be an improvement of system profitability and removal of structural barriers to production. And we should see the availability and supply of balanced plant nutrition. Now let us come to the first principle of the conservation agriculture, that is the tillage management. Tilling the soil, it leads to a loss of soil organic carbon as it breaks up the soil and exposes the organic matter which were uh, previously protected in the soil microaggregate to the microbial decay. Uh, when we decrease the amount of tillage or it introduce no tillage, it has potential to decrease the amount of soil organic carbon which are lost from the profile but decreasing the turnover rate of the macro aggregate and increase the physical protection of the particulate organic material and reducing the soil to residue contact. Now, the second principle of conservation agriculture, that is the residue management. Uh, in some system, it is seen that uh, the soil organic carbon increases linearly with increase in the rate of the residue at attention. Uh, while it is seen that the uh, where production system is low, uh, it has uh, due to the low soil fertility or the presence of soil constraint, there can be insufficient residue retention under conservation agriculture that positively impact the soil organic carbon. And in some situation also, it can negatively affect conservation agriculture that is due to the lower soil temperature, compaction or greater disease, weed, pest, pressure, etc. 
Now coming to the third principle of conservation agriculture, that is the crop diversification. Uh, the different crop may have different effect on the quantity, quality, and the periodicity of carbon input and modify the soil in different ways. That is by the means of rate of water extraction, nutrient use, etc., which can influence mineral mineralization rate and the growth of subsequent crop. In some system where legumes are included, they can also add additional nitrogen in the system, which can enhance the soil fertility and the subsequent crop biomass production. Now, these are the examples of the worldwide estimates of the soil organic carbon change following the incorporation of conservation agriculture practices, that is the no tillage plus residue retention with or without crop diversification. In this, we can see in most of the cases, soil organic carbon is increased. In India also, in the IGP, that is the indo gametic plain, where wheat and rice crop rotation was practiced for a time span of two, to two, uh, two years to 26 years, the soil organic carbon increased at the rate of 0.54 megagram uh, per hectare. Now coming to the conclusion, Conservation agriculture system, if well adapted to local condition, they can improve the soil organic content of many soil compared to conventional system by significant improvement in the soil physical, chemical, and biological properties. At the rate of accumulation of organic carbon in soil is site-specific and depends upon climate, soil properties, and plant species. And to increase the adoption of conservation agriculture worldwide, it is critical that the system be adapted to specific climate, soil types, and communities, particularly considering the farmer's investment capacity and the availability of resources. There needs to be a flexibility in approach to adapt the agronomic management practices to local circumstances that consider not only the technical aspect of conservation agriculture, but also the socio-economic factors that make conservation agriculture cost-effective and attractive to the farmer. And with this, I come to an end to a presentation. Thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, ma'am. Session do you have any question to the presenter? No question from my side. Nadeep, sir. Sir, actually, I gave the access. Now you can unmute. Hello. Okay. Rania, are you here? See the chat box and uh, read uh, his question okay. from the chat box for the participant. Okay. okay. Mm. Question to Twinkle. What is your research topic in IAR? Actually, I think she is uh, mega. Who who is uh, presenting uh, right now? Mm -hmm. Okay, ma'am. Uh, Twinkle was unable to uh, mute, unmute his mic at that time. Okay, ma'am. Sure. Then shall we move to the next presenter? Yes, sure. Okay. Vishranti. Vishranti Rath. Are you here? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Can you present now? Yeah, ma'am. Yes, sir. Please share your screen. Uh, Nivadha, yes, I'm ready. Maybe I can do next after her. Okay, I'm sure. No problem. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, it is visible. You can start now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Vishranti Rao. And uh, my topic is a literature review on green HR stimulates and supports the sustainable use of resource and preserve the natural environment. So basically, uh, this is a literature uh, review uh, presentation. So uh, green HR, we are seeing uh, this uh, topic green HR or green initiatives everywhere. We are hearing this topic. We are, we are hearing this uh, uh, word green HR everywhere. So what is actually green HR? 
So green HR uh, over the fa past few decades, um, we are seeing that the environmental and the impact and the repercussions have become a major concern for you know, government, organizations, stakeholders, and customers. So this topic is becoming a very uh, sensitive matter and because of which the organization are becoming alert. So this uh, concern has become a major call to various organizations to apply more effective environmental practices and increase uh, this awareness and experience in dealing with various environmental issues. So basically green HR is the use of HRM policies uh, to promote the sustainable use of resources within the organization and more generally promotes the cause of environmental sustainability. So basically this includes environmental friendly HR practices and the preservation of organization knowledge or knowledge capital. Uh, the need of green HR has been seen why the organization basically need this uh, green HR should be implemented in various uh, organizations and business organizations. So green HR basically focuses on converting regular uh, work environment uh, into more conscious and more eco-friendly environment. An organization and where to uh, always you know, um, and also to achieve the organization goal and ultimately contribute significantly to environmental sustainability. So um, now green HRM actually basically uh, is required in organization uh, which helps in reduction in ecologic, ecological footprints. Uh, it concentrated more on social and environmental factors. It helps the organization and the employees you know, to uh, positively come together and uh, the green HR can be implemented as well as employees are more committed and satisfied. There are base, uh, various reach, uh, green HRM practices which uh, are being carried out uh, under various organizations in various organizations. They are basically green recruitment, green performance management, green training and development, and green rewards. So basically, the green recruitment means that uh, means a paper-free and recruitment process with a minimal environmental impact. So as we see that we are basically more into uh, no, a paper uh, thing uh, work everywhere we use paper, papers, papers, and that is actually not green environment. So if we want to uh, really go for green uh, HRM, we should um, uh, no, uh, go for minimal use of papers while the recruitment process is happening. Uh, Applicants should be invited online rather than uh, no, uh, inviting hard copies that can be invited through emails and online applications. That, and there are various other platforms available online to which we can uh, initiate green HRM. And it is also uh, possible uh, to go for uh, telephonic or video-based interviews rather than calling the uh, candidates uh, physically and uh, uh, no, uh, the wastage of time and can be happened there. So we can minimize this also by uh, uh, going for telephonic and video conferences interviews, which helps again uh, in uh, towards the green HRM. Next uh, initiative or practices that will be carried by the organization is green performance management. So it consists of issues related to environmental concerns and policies of company. It concentrate on use of environmental responsibilities like role of manager in achieving these goals is included in appraisals, uh, green standards for all the departments such as waste reduction, etc. penalties for non-compliances of the goal. So um, uh, when we are saying that we want to implement green HRM in the organization, it is obviously not an easy task because we want Everyone should contribute equally and full dedica dedicatedly. So how we can uh, you know, motivate the employee, we can motivate the employee by setting the targets, by giving them appraisals. If they are really uh, contributing uh, from their sides uh, in implementing and initiating the green HR in the organization. So to keep the employees motivated towards these initiatives, the manager should uh, give them appraisals who are really following the green HRM practices. Certain standards should be mentioned all the checks should be going, uh, should be go like uh, there should be no wastage or there should be less to less uh, no wastage in the organization should happen. And if the employees are not following, then the penalty should be given on the employee, should be laid on the employees. Uh, next practices has been carried by uh, the organization. HRM team is the green training and development program. Green in training and development is conducted to the employee in order to educate them about the environment because we are talking about green initiative, green environment. So basically, uh, no, uh, most of the employees are unaware that, that what is basically the uh, no, green HRM initiative and how we should carry it on in the organization. So organization should carry out certain workshops or training sessions or development sessions, you know, wherein 
the employee should be you know, clear about the idea that what actually they want to do or they have to do uh, you know, towards these green initiatives. So creating an environmental awareness among the workforce by conducting seminars, workshops at organization level. So it's also important to achieve good environmental performance. Train the employer as how the energy can be conserved, the training them with the best business practices into as in, uh, into as in the green initiative practices within the uh, employees. Green rewards, the sustainability of organizations, environmental performance is highly dependent on green rewards management practices of the organization. So to motivate the uh, managers and non-managerial employees and on corporate environmental management initiatives, green rewards management has significant contributions. So as we know that if we want to keep our employees motivated, dedicated towards uh, any of the initiatives, any of the practices, uh, these measures should be followed by giving them rewards. Those who are really contributing uh, good towards the green initiative, they should be given certain rewards as mentioned by the organization. An organization can practice it in two ways, such as financial and non-financial rewards. They can financial rewards, they can be non-financial rewards also. The financial rewards can be both like incentives, bonus, cash rewards, and non-financial can be like appraisals given to the, uh, like, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, appraising them in front of uh, employees, in front of departments, so that they can feel good that uh, no, uh, they are contributing towards the organization and our organization is appraising them. So every time financial rewards uh, don't motivate the employees, many times non-financial rewards also motivate the employees towards the objective and goal of the organization. So there are certain uh, no advantages as well as there are certain disadvantages also. Uh, of the Green HRM. So Green HRM basically helps in creating a healthy environment in the organization. So obviously, if we are going for paperless work, if we are going for environmental friendly envi uh, no, workplace, so it uh, obviously helps to create a good healthy environment. Uh, uh, there is uh, no great uh, reduction in the cost, cost of the organization. Then there is a great ecological balance. Flexibility in work can be achieved through green HRM practices. There can be, if organization is really contributing towards the green HRM initiatives, certain rebates and you know, um, uh, benefits can be given uh, in the taxes to the organization. So as there are benefits, there are few disadvantages also. Conversion of expenses. Now, if we are saying that we have to carry out green HRM practices, it is not a very easy step. We have to uh, do, uh, the organization need to do certain sort of arrangements which can create, which can uh, incur uh, certain expenses that may organization you know, try to avoid. So it is expensive, a little expensive at the initial stage, costlier. Uh, lack of support, many times it happens that um, if organization want to implement any changes, uh, they don't get support from the management or they don't get you know, uh, positive support from the employee also. So lack of support can also be one of the, the cause of not able to implement doing HRM practices in the organization. And going paperless, again, it is a little a tedious start. It's not that easy uh, because everything uh, can uh, cannot be done online or everything cannot be go uh, on a uh, uh, paperless mode. So uh, 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 as uh, far as I've gone through several uh, no, research papers, I have found that the green HR are still in the initial stage. Many of the organizations have still not implemented uh, the green HRM practices, though it is mandatory, though it is made uh, no, compulsory by the government that we should practice green HRM. But there are many organizations and still it is an initial stage. Still green HR is on a growing stage within the organization of a significance of green issues have compelled them to embrace environment friendly HR practices with a specific focus on waste management, recycling, reducing carbon footprints and using and producing green. The future of green HRM appears promising for all the stakeholders of HRM, be it the employer, employee, practitioner, or academician. So if organization really implement, it not only help the organization, but also help to everyone, each and every uh, person in the, in the world, if we really go for green HRM practices in the organization. So uh, this is my conclusion. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your insightful presentation. And there is a question for you. Can you mention yeah, some basic green HR practice? Green? Green HR practices? Green HR, HR practices. practices. Okay. Uh, ma'am, uh, 
there are a few brain hrm practices which can be uh, you know uh, carried out like uh, 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 organization can uh, make the environment green by planting more trees as well as they can go for paperless interviews uh, there are organization uh, those uh, are carrying out paperless uh, paperless interviews like inviting applications online they yeah. are uh, conducting interviews online and uh, you know, many meetings are being conducted through the zoom meeting like we are you know holding this conference today we are holding the conference you know, through the zoom meeting so this is also an uh, example of uh, ghrm being initiated so uh, but uh, i will i will not say that a major of the organization or the 50% there are less than 50% organization who are really uh, you know um, inculcating this green hrm practices in the organization so still we are really in a very basic uh, stage or very initial stage where in green hrm should be implemented thank you ma'am uh, any other question no you can proceed to the next participant thank you ma'am thank you ma'am okay. uh, the next participant is linima bk Actually, uh, Twinkle is asking to represent. Can I come in, ma'am? Because I'm the first presenter, actually, because of technical glitch. So, but now it's fine. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, okay. You can proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this time you've given to me. Uh, I am Professor P. K. Ringa from the Department of Geography, as you've seen in my slide. My presentation for today is on urban farming, a sustainable way path for urban growth and development. So as we all see that uh, in the next uh, slide, I hope you can see the next slide. Uh, ma'am, no, ma'am, it's not visible. It's not visible. Ma'am, it's visible, but you can, uh, I, we couldn't change the uh, next slide. We couldn't see the next slide. You can't see the next slide? Yes, ma'am. Okay, anyway, as I'm trying, but let me just uh, discuss at the same time. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, we are doing urban farming is as we know that there's so much of a rapid uh, urbanization then uh, what we see is that the urban areas is so filled with the uh, uh, population and also the, the the housing and of which it has really pushed uh, the development into a, a corner to which that there is uh, looking for options of how to bring in growth and development so therefore we have uh, uh, overpopulated okay population and so also we have lack of green spaces in cities because of rapid urbanization so uh, then what we see is in the late 2010 we have seen that our urban farming in india has started to mushroom particularly after 2015 where we have seen that there's an alternative for having our own food supply for having our own uh, uh, organic food because uh, nowadays people are more health conscious so therefore urban farming picked up in india particularly after 2015 and we have seen that uh, all over india now we have farms in the cities uh, perhaps uh, COVID-19, we can say it is a blessing in disguise because after COVID-19, perhaps there is so much of a, you know, a picking up or we see a, a speed of uh, development, particularly in urban farming, which we see that there is a positive response towards the urban farming. So therefore, uh, we have seen that uh, over the two, three years of the impact of COVID-19, we have seen that urban agriculture is the savior of rapid urbanization. So as my uh, study suggested that, you know, looking into the case studies of uh, different areas, al although I'll not pick up many, it's just a few. We are starting first with Hyderabad. We've seen that Hyderabad was the first one to pick up urban uh, farming. Yes, it started way back in 2017 by the company called Urban Kisan. And for them also, they started with the urban roof farming, where they have started first with hydroponic system that would allow uh, them to grow their own uh, fresh vegetables and fruits. 
So also, Urban Kisan has really kicked off and have given a, a kickstart to many others who started the urban agriculture in Hyderabad everywhere when we look in terms of its development till today. So also we have seen that uh, this uh, the the rooftop that what I've uh, just said the urban rooftop farming also has been done in CDMA building where they had uh, uh, as you've seen the picture there's so much of uh, blooming the greens in the midst of the city's uh, you know high populated areas also in Bangalore what we have seen also they have also picked up uh, urban farming and it has gained popularity yes. Yes, we have seen this is just uh, I've picked up from uh, one of the clippings in the Hindus that means in the newspaper on 23rd November 2023 we have seen the green lush uh, not only vegetation but then they are fruits vegetables which are very healthy because they are organic and also there is another uh, way of coming up with the urban farming in Bangalore and also in Chennai and many in other places Jaipur as well where uh, uh, an, an, a farmland is being acquired and people can have those plots to have, uh, you know, the farmhouses. Uh, but then they, these are the people, the urban, uh, urban farmers are taking care of uh, those plots so that, you know, that uh, urban farmers, he also they manage everything. Okay, we can choose the plot and, uh, you know, they can work on our behalf. So that is how they do. And on, also in NCR, where we've seen in Delhi, or you talk of Gurgaon, you talk of Jaipur, the same thing has happened. And we have seen that even in the north, uh, they're trying to bring roots to the roof. Okay, of Delhi people, we have seen that Delhi has really high popula uh, pollution, you know, but then uh, with this new trend of urban farming coming up, we we hope and we 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 expect that there will be, a, you know, a turning around of uh, the positive impact of urban farming on the uh, pollution of uh, Delhi. So also in other areas, we have seen how they grow in the roofs where they have vertical uh, pillars and this is where they run the hydroponic uh, system so as to have uh, healthy eating and also that people will gain from a very small space. And this is also in the Jaipur where they do the same thing uh, in the rooftop because of uh, the space problem. And then what we can see, like what I said, I've just picked up few. I didn't pick up many, uh, especially from my place where I come from, because we still have, yes, uh, we also running short of space in the urban areas. But then uh, as of now, we still have a kitchen garden. So as my topic is urban farming, a sustainable part for urban growth and development we have seen here also that the urban farming in, in fact it impacted as you've seen the screen that we talk of climate change yes they have uh, bring in the positive note to to inspire the climate change yet they slow down the environment uh, degradation when it comes to urban farming then we have food security biodiversity agricultural intensification or you talk of resource efficiency or you talk of land management like what i said this kind of a farming we need less space. It is not that we need a, a horizontal, larger uh, space for farming, but then urban farming, you can always go vertically. It also brings in public health. Now people are more conscious about eating nutritious food than because uh, everyone are running for organic, hygienic and sufficient food. So also if you look from the economic point of view, we see that there's economic growth because it opens job employment for many other people who have not known this path but then as of now we have seen that this is the hope for uh, urban agriculture or for urban dwellers or settlers in, if we look for urban growth and development so with this i end my presentation thank you so much so if any question thank you ma'am this is very nice presentation i just want to ask something that yes. you are, uh, you said in your presentation that uh, you are acquiring farmland uh, to yeah. uh, proceed your uh, project. Are yes. you acquiring free lands or uh, the uh, or asking for the people to provide their roof? Uh, roof uh, 
Okay. Uh, the one which I just mentioned just now, uh, some places like, for example, in uh, uh, Jaipur, in Chennai, they themselves, they have big farms. Okay. They go by a company name. Like maybe I can just go... Uh, let me just go just now. Yeah, this urban farmers in Bangalore. Okay. These urban farmers, they are a company who acquire well-managed farmland in the city. And what they do is that they, uh, from that farmland, they provide plots for people who want, for the city dwellers who wants the farmhouses and the facilities. What they do is they not only, uh, um, you know, uh, cultivate all the vegetables, but then in fact, they also allow them to come for retreat. They do have a kind of a small resort also so that people will distress themselves from the ordeals of the week. So this is happening in Bangalore, in uh, Jaipur, in Chennai but not in our place. Our place, like what I said, we still, although we are running short now, okay, out of uh, the city space, but yet we still have some uh, plot where we just have kitchen garden. But then most of the houses also, we have started with uh, the urban roof farming plus the kitchen garden. Thank you. Thank you for answering yeah. my uh, query. And, uh, uh, thank you for the this lovely presentation. Uh, thank you. We, thank can, you. <laughs> we can proceed to the next participant, Niveda. Yes, ma'am. So the next participant is Lilima. Lilima, are you there? Mm -hmm. ah, Uh, Lilima, can you please unmute? We are unable to hear you. Uh, Lenima, can you hear us? Uh, Lenima, are you there? I think there is an it uh, something. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Uh, you can proceed to the next participant, next participant and ask her to be prepared for. Okay. Uh, Actually, so the next uh, Twinkle is asking to represent his uh, represent uh, his present her presentation uh, again again. You can uh, take her here in this slot now. Okay, ma'am. Uh, Twinkle, are you there? Can you present it now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Twinkle. Carry on. Ma'am, ma I'm unable to share my screen. Ma'am? Uh, yes, uh, Twinkle, give me a second. I'm okay. solving the issue. Winkle? Yes, ma'am, I'm sharing. Yeah, now you can share your screen. 
Am I my slides visible? Uh, yes. Can you make it a slideshow? Yes, yes, yes. Ma'am, now it's visual? Yes, yes, Twinkle. Okay, ma'am. A very good afternoon to one and all. I am Twinkle Jenna, PhD scholar in the Division of Agronomy, IRA New Delhi. I am going to present on the topic management of soil health for sustainable agricultural production. So coming to what is uh, need of soil health and what is soil health. Soil health is mainly a dynamic extrinsic characteristics of the soil, which is mainly influenced by the anthropogenic activities. And sometimes it's synonymous to the soil quality, which is the inherent characteristics of the soil that determines the soil growth and uh, plant growth and productivity in the soil. So coming to why soil health is very important and what is the need of conservation of the soil. And currently in our agricultural system, we are heavily relying on high yielding varieties and heavy use of mechanization and heavy reliance on synthetic chemicals such as fertilizers and pesticides, which is posing a second generation problems such as soil pollution, water quality deterioration and conversion of substantial agriculture to commercial agriculture, leading to decreased biodiversity, and further agriculture is found to one of the contributor to the greenhouse gas emission amounting to 21 to 37 percent which is causing climate change and increasing the temperature of the atmosphere further hastening the process of soil desertification and degradation which is negatively impacting the food security and posing challenge to alleviate rural poverty so come this is this picture depicts how all agricultural soil, soils all over the world is showing various signs of degradation and about 34% of the land constitutes agricultural land as per UNAFU report. So soil health is mainly characterized by the interactive effect of both physical, chemical and biological characteristics of the soil and is determined mainly based on various indicators and what are the processes that is occurring in a soil and what are the functions it does and what is the soil services it is providing to us. Based on that, we can characterize what is whether a soil is healthy or non-healthy. So there are various indicators of to assess the soil health. So physical indicators has a direct bearing on the water availability due to its influence on available water holding capacity and infiltration rate in a soil. And various chemical indicators like PHEC, they are regulating the nutrient availability in a particular soil because uh, it is influencing the nutrient solubility and mobilization in a soil. Various biological indicators play a major role in nutrient cycling because it constitutes various microorganisms in the soil which takes place, takes place in mineralization and immobilization process. Mineralization mainly involves the conversion of organic form of nutrients to the inorganic form which the plant can take for its uh, nutrition point of view. So it's very important indicator as considered soil health is considered. So how the soil degradation and desertification process initiates normally due to intensive tillage operations with uh, which focuses major, majorly on removal of residue and clean field operations causing deterioration of the soil structure. Due to residue removal from the upper surface layer, the soil structure is deteriorating and the micro it is loosening all the soil particles, which making the soil prone to various forms of erosion such as water and wind erosion. So that loss of topsoil happens as a result of leaching losses and runoff losses, causing deterioration in the soil quality, further aggravating the process of soil degradation and leading to desertification process. So how this picture shows how soil degradation in an ecosystem is taking place. Normally physical degradation occurs as a result of soil compaction caused due to heavy mechanization and, uh, and subjecting the soil to a number of erosion related problems which causes the loss of about 133 petagram of carbon, 23 to 42 teragram of nitrogen, 12.5 to 22.5 teragram of phosphorus annually and chemical degradation occurs as a result of huge of high analysis of uh, fertilizers and uh, high yielding varieties which causes nutrient imbalance. Imbalance there is a mismatch between the nutrient demand of a particular plant and nutrient supplying capacity of the soil. And further, it, is it has been observed that 8 to 10 million ton of nutrient has been mined from the soil due to use of high yielding varieties. Further, biological degradation takes place as a result of exposure of organic matter to the atmosphere, which causes oxidation of the organic matter and loss of uh, various organic carbon and nitrogen to the atmosphere and causing pollution related problems. So biodiversity loss majorly uh, happened because of restriction of the cropping system to only monoculture system because of commercial agriculture and further due to use of synthetic chemicals, it's uh, impacting the diversity of the microbial organisms.
So a healthy soil has capacity to provide various ecosystem services such as regulation of climate by sequestering the atmospheric carbon and regulating the soil temperature and moderating the water holding capacity of the soil, just making the uh, system sustainable in long run and making it resilient in case of extreme events such as flood stress, drought and heat stress events, increasing the crop productivity. So uh, we came to know that soil organic matter is very important indicator of the soil health and soil health uh, uh, based on four principles to how to conserve the soil health. So um, first point is how to minimize the soil disturbance by reduction of the tillage and maximizing the biodiversity and maximizing the living root and minimizing and maximizing the plant cover. So conservation agriculture is one of uh, one approach which uh, incorporates three of the principles such as minimum soil disturbances, retention of surface residue to the tune of 30% and sensible crop rotation which has the capacity to accumulate 3.4 megagram per hectare of carbon annually and it has positive impact on soil organic carbon stock and soil enzymatic activities and soil quality index will be improved by adopting this conservation agriculture. For the regenerative agriculture is a new approach which incorporates all of the four principles, including integration of the livestock in the agroecosystem and rest reliance on the synthetic chemical inputs. Integration of the livestock supplies the manures, and as you know, that bridging will facilitate the decomposition process in the soil. And but overgrazing is always uh, not desired practice. But by grazing the saliva of the living stock, livestock will helpful in the decomposition of the uh, organic matter in the soil because of the microbial consistency present in the saliva. So here various, uh, this picture depicts a number of phytotechnologies that is use of plant to improve the soil health. So this principle mainly involves the increasing the plant and root diversity in the soil and increasing the plant perennialty. The plant and root diversity can be enriched by incorporating intercropping, cover cropping, and a various variety of multi-species perennial crops in the agroecosystem. Because a number of crops synthesis uh, exudes a number of root exudates and various en enzymatic activities and various microorganisms associated with a particular crop. So by including including a number of crops, microbial biodiversity can be enriched. Further, agroforestry can be included. So, because woody perennial trees has the capacity to sequester more carbon as compared to annual crop. So, when annual crop is incorporated with the woody perennial trees, it has the capacity to sequester poor carbon and regulate the climate change. Further, bioenergy crops and digitalized workforce can be uh, uh, can be uh, incorporated in the degraded land to remove, recover the degraded land, and it will act as a buffer to uh, remove the contamination from the soil and increase the plant perennialty and thereby decrease increasing the soil health. These are various technological options to create positive soil carbon budget, such as organic amendments also can be used like compost, various manures, biochar, vermiculture, in addition to this agroforestry, conservation agriculture, and restoration of the degraded mined land. Further, this picture depicts that by permanent residue retention, soil and organic carbon content is found to be increased as compared to minimum soil disturbance practices. So for the Newton, judicious Newton management is an important point to reduce the fertilizer load in the soil The four R, by following the 4R principle. The 4R involves selecting the right source of fertilizer and selecting the right quantity, uh, how much fertilizer is needed to be applied as per the soil test. And further, it should be applied in a proper method and in a right time. When the crop plant needs the fertilizer most, that time only it should be applied to minimize the leaching losses and runoff losses and accumulation of heavy metals in the soil to improve the soil health. Further, these are various other options that can be exploited to restore the soil health. Plant growth promoting rhizobacteria can be inoculated in a plant which will facilitate the resource acquisition in a soil and modulates the phytohormone levels by improving the plant growth and can facilitate the agriculture productivity in the long run. Further, bioremediation practice can be practiced, which involves the employment of microorganisms and plant to recover a contaminated soil, to recover the contamination by the phytoremediation practice, which involves the plant's physiological processes to recover a contaminant from the soil. For example, mustard can be used as a phytoremediation plant. Then integrated nutrient management which involves the judicious use of various green manuring, biofertilizers, crop residue, and incorporation of legumes along with fertilizers can be incorporated in the agroecosystem and agricultural practices for improving the soil health. For further restoration of various problem soils by application of various soil amendment, like uh, we can apply lime in case of acid soil, 
and in case of salinity soil we can go for gypsum application so that the soil health will be improved and all the nutrients in the soil can be available in optimal quantity for the optimum growth of plant and increase the productivity for the erosion control is a major uh, technique that can be uh, exploited for maintaining the soil health to avoid the leaching losses and runoff losses from the soil so uh, a number of options are available currently to improve the soil health but there is a lack of soil diversity information since region specific soil health is determined by climatic factors and number of and the number of vegetation which are grown in that particular region so there is a need to monitor and rap rapidly screening the technologies for soil health assessment in a particular region and accordingly for a region specific soil health management practices can be uh, developed and there is a lack of correlation studies between soil health and crop yield how the soil health is determining the crop yield in a particular region and also there is a lack of consistent sampling techniques and protocols that need to be studied further to develop strategies that aim at diversification and you know, increasing the perennialty at the farm and agro ecosystem level and further targeted phytotechnology based restoration strategies can minimize the impact of uh, degradation and make the soil fertile in long run so i conclude my presentation with the quote what we do to the soil we do to ourselves so there is a need to restore the soil for maintaining the resilience of our agro ecosystem thank you Thank you, Twinkle. Nice presentation, Megha or Twinkle. Uh, Twinkle, on which topic you are pursuing your PhD? Uh, sir, it's sulfur and micronutrient management on the effect of uh, mage and wheat and biofortification. Okay, so uh, how this, uh, can you uh, let us know uh, what is the problem of micronutrients, especially in the northern part of India? So actually in northern part of India, we are using mostly uh, depending heavily on this uh, high analysis fertilizers and using high yielding varieties and hybrids which are having uh, very uh, exhaustive crops. So they are uh, taking most of the nutrients from the soil and though we are applying high analysis fertilizers which are rich in nitrogen and potassium. So in plant normally there is a proper ratio for all the nutrients. So if we are providing nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium that are the major nutrients, micronutrients are not in, present in the soil in that much amount. And since we are applying a number of fertilizers, so they are having a toxic effect in the soil and their antagonistic effect is there. So micronutrient efficiency is nowadays very less. That is only 1 to 5%. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Twinkle. All the best. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, any other question? No question. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so the next participant is Lenima. Lenima, you can unmute yourself. Linima, are you there? Okay, so I'll go with the next participant. The next participant is Professor Gauranshi. Professor Gauranshi, are you there? Professor Gauranshi? In my list, the, the next participant is Dr. Raghavendra K. Mishra. And then Raghavendra Mishra has provided a video presentation. Oh, okay, okay, okay. No problem. Yeah. Okay. So the next participant is uh, Tejas. Hello. Uh, yes, Tejas, you can share your screen and start with your presentation. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you. 
Um, is it visible presentation? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tejas Walker from Dr. Ambedkar College, Nagpur. The topic is analytical study on the role of green bonds and climate financing in driving sustainable development. What is green bonds? A green bond is a type of fixed instrument, a debt instrument that is used to raise money for climate and environmental projects. These bonds are asset linked. Asset linked means they are backed by an asset. So they are usually carry the same credit rating as the issuer like the normal bonds. Dating back to the first decade of 21st century, green bonds are also referred to as climate bonds. So who can issue the green bonds? Green bonds are basically issued by World Bank, regional development banks, and financial institutions and governments. Uses. What are the uses of green bonds? The first basic use of green bonds, it is used to make the renewable energy, energy efficiency, clean transportation, responsible waste management. There are few principles of green bonds. In Hello? Hello? The first one is use of proceeds. Use of proceeds means the use of funds. If we take from the public, that are used in refinancing the green projects. These green projects contribute towards environmental objectives such as climate change mitigation, natural resources conservation, and other pollution prevention and control. The second one is process for project evaluation and collection. When we take money from the investors, we have to give them authority that we are in. Hello. 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 Thank you, Tejas. Uh, any questions? Last one is the reporting of green bonds. Reporting means which we have, it's the integral part of issue of green bonds. Issuer are required to report and allocate funds. They are usually communicated in an annual report. Last one is the ranking of in India, in the green bond issuance, India has ranked seventh in the total green bond issuance. As you can see, there's 2.7 billion US dollar green bonds have been issued by India. Conclusion So, India is a green bond journey starting with the initial insurance by Yes Bank and CL, CLP India has evolved to into the robust market exceeding 500 crores. 50,000 crores by 2020, 2018. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Tejas, do we have green bonds in India presently? Yes, sir. Uh, can you explain about something about this type of bonds? What is the use and uh, how they will be helpful for our country in getting green economy? Uh, they are useful for financing the green projects, the green projects such as uh, renewable energy, green efficiency, green transportation, responsible waste management. These are the projects which are useful. So whenever country has launched the green bonds, and for how much cost it is launched by the government of India, uh, Dr. Tejas? Uh, it's just one year back, January 2023, $80 billion, I think, Indian government has initiated the green bond. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you, Tejas.
So the next participant is Aishwarya Vinayan. Um, very good afternoon to everybody. I hope I am visible and audible. Yes, Aishwarya. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Um, uh, first off, I'm glad to be part of this conference. Thank you so much for the acceptance. Um, uh, the environment and uh, issues regarding sustainability have always been uh, uh, very close to heart for me. And I happen to be an avid reader. Um, and uh, very recently, I had been reading a novel called uh, The Island of Missing Trees by Elif Shafak. And I have the book here with me. Uh, this is the book, if you can see it. It's written by Alif Shafak. It's called The Island of Missing Trees. And um, while I was reading this, I was um, constantly, um, you know, uh, getting these perspectives of um, how, uh, how your reading habits shape your perspectives. And um, the novel uh, basically deals with uh, uh, an island called Nicosia or uh, uh, let's say uh, let's say Cyprus because Nicosia is happens to be the capital of Cyprus, and uh, this place has been um, strangled with war. So the people living there are in a situation of tiff because of uh, the war, the ongoing war over there. And this novel uh, pays importance to not just the human suffering but also the suffering of nature and specifically trees, uh, to be precise. Um, something very interesting about the novel is that the narrative is carried forward by a tree, a fig tree. Um, so yes, you heard me right. Uh, it is a fig tree that, uh, that tells the entire story of all the people living on the island, as well as of all the other trees and of all the other insects and animals and plants that got um that had to suffer big time because of the war and um uh, when we talk about nature or when we talk about environment in general we often um sideline its importance keeping ourselves into consideration right so my research paper deals with the same thing um the title of my research is environmental harmony versus anthropocentrism um as explained in the novel, uh, The Island of Missing Trees by Elif Shafak. Uh, I would like to uh, show a PowerPoint presentation which I have made on the same, and I'll start sharing my screen. Um, okay, I'm, I'm trying to share my screen. Um, I can't. Do we need to use the share option to do that? Uh, yes, I should. Know. There is a green option like share screen. So you can click on it and you can share your screen. Uh, all right. I'll just figure it out in a second. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience. Share. Hmm. Okay, screen. Um, are you able to see my screen? Uh, no. Uh, okay, I'll just... <clears throat> okay, is it visible now? Okay. Yes, I should you know it's possible. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, right. So that is the title for you. And uh, before diving into the presentation proper, I would like to explain the major keywords which I have used in my uh, title so that it becomes easier to understand. Um, first off, Dr. Eshwarya, uh, already you gave uh, very good introduction about the topic. So can right, you tell the, what is the concept and what is the 
key point of the book we will be very happy to know right sir right sir i'll 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 jump into that um, as soon as i'm done with this so um environmental harmony we all know uh, it's about coexistence between natural resources and humans and um to explain anthropocentrism uh, next slide uh, the image over there does it really well actually human centered or human glorifying any the, the idea that humans are, are more important than any other creature on earth is nothing but anthropocentrism uh, uh, uh eco criticism is nothing but um, a literary lens which you use to employ which you employ to your literary texts in order to um uh, sort of uh, what do i say you 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 do that in order to explain the importance of the environment through literary texts that is the study of the relationship between literature and the environment is nothing but eco criticism <clears throat> next the island of missing trees uh, coming to the novel proper it is a novel that deals with belonging and identity love and trauma nature and renewal so um, uh, several themes are explored in the novel but then um, as per my perspective it is all about human versus nature or i should say human versus the environment because humans also are part of nature so let's call it humans versus um, the environment right uh and why do i feel that this is the prominent theme in the novel is because of um uh, uh, is because of the prominent the intermittent glimpses of uh, uh, you know the elif shafak's perspectives on how important the nature is and how she um, uh, inserts those per perspectives through these uh, different characters and uh, their dialogues and their narratives um Uh, i'll just read this out for you as we navigate the complexities of climate change biodiversity loss and ecological degradation the dichotomy between human beings and the environment that is this constant othering between human beings and the environment it assumes a heightened significance that it it, it becomes the primary um, uh, goal of concern amidst this backdrop elif shafak's novel the island of missing trees weaves together cultures oh, politics excuse and excuse me aishwarya you have one minute to yes up. all right ma'am uh, i'll just do that <clears throat> so um coming to the objectives um my objective is to delve into the intricate interplay between environment and anthropocentrism in the novel and to employ an eco critical lens to explore how uh, the author navigates the relationship between humanity and the natural world um when we look at the literature review uh, there are these certain <clears throat> there are these certain lines which i would like to bring to your notice in order to make it evident to you that um environment is given a lot of importance in this novel um in order to make progress sometimes we have to make sacrifices this is something which a character called kaya says in the novel to another character while they are dealing with a situation where they have to choose between nature and between the progress of um humanity right so if we come to the technological paradox there's another line here which says we can use technology to fix what we have broken uh now as easy as that sounds it is actually quite a paradoxical statement because you cannot really uh, make use of technology without harming a single resource of um, of your environment right so as much as technology is a boon to us it also is a bane so it is a paradoxical situation that we are in and this is um, this insight and this very important perspective is offered to us by this particular novel uh, by elif shafak um there's another line which says nature is not an obstacle to be conquered it is a partner to be respected this is again um, a line which is said by a character called nitya uh, nitsa in in the novel and uh, uh, again when we talk about characters it's not this is a fictional story right so uh, it is nothing but elif shafak's perspective being given through different characters and she says that uh, through nature we life comes full circle and it is it is uh, nothing but a cycle that we need to respect it is a partner to be respected it's not an obstacle 
um and through that we can say that uh, uh, you know the novel constantly oscillates between the human need and the environment whereas it is so important for us to realize that we are nothing but one unit and we need to respect each other in order to live uh, in harmony and practice environmental harmony so the conclusion is uh, that the the, the novel uh, focuses on shaping eco conscious readers and inspiring sustainable attitudes and contributing to broader ecological discourse by means of values imparted through literature uh, that's all i want to see and it's pretty much explanative um, so i end my presentation here thank you so much uh, thank you dr ashwarya thank uh, you sir i have two questions and one suggestion for you uh, yes sir and i know the phd topic on which topic you did your phd and from where you did um so actually i have not pursued a phd yet i am not uh, dr ashwarya i am uh, the second yeah. question is that uh, can you name some of the tree plantation or tree saving movements in our country um so tree plantation movement uh, in our country is uh, one is the chipko andolan movement uh, that i am aware of and that i can recall uh the chipko movement was one that we had studied please about i add in your knowledge please that in 1730 there was a khejarli movement in rajasthan the khejri trees yeah in rajasthan right amrita mission gave out by the government of india right jashan to you and tejas because you are the new researcher and the my colleagues junior colleagues i assume you that because after getting phd it took 16 years to become professor dear so just as humble suggestion to you and tejas that you just not write professor in the name because if anybody says not having phd and writing that designation and other it's not look nice just a suggestion to you and tejas also that 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 adds value to my presentation thank you so much sir thank you so much i'll take care of that thank you so much sir the next one please the next presentation is by priyansh 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 are you there yes ma'am yes ma'am priyansh you can start your presentation a uh, very good afternoon to everyone present here my name is priyanshi makkad i am an undergraduate student pursuing ba english honors research and specification in pite ncr college affiliated to kurukshetra university i am very thankful to my mentor dr shweta sarwa who motivated me to be the part of this conference so i will further like to show you my ppt so explain to the topic should i uh, share my screen ma'am excuse yes, me ma'am yes you can share your screen so i hereby worked on the topic man made and the natural disaster and their impact on humans as depicted in shakespeare's king lear so king lear is a story it is written by a great writer a uh, william shakespeare whose works usually depict the early capitalism global trade and colonization there is a beginning of the masculine ideals found conquering the natural environment here are some of the reference pointers which will help you to have more of the information you can take the screenshot of these references yes King Lear is a political authority story about the family dynamics. King Lear is a story about the family dynamics. King Lear is a person who believe in the show off and he is one of those people who judge the book by its cover and consider to be a failure in the end of his life. 
Kai King Lear is not only a father but also a king when he gives away his authority to the unworthy and the evil Gondren and Regan, who are her eldest of daughters. He delivers not only himself and his family but also the Britain into the chaos and cruelty. King Lear divides his kingdom among the two daughters who flatter him and banishes the third one who loves him the most. And the eldest daughters reject him from their home. This is the way King Lear gets mad and wanders through the storm. This story is a symbolic of the West stance for the masculine ideals focused on conquering and taming the natural environment. Further, the story tells us how the outside surrounding environment can destroy the inner peace of a person's mind. The journey of King Lear he is left with is the story of completely destroyed by the people he trusted much more than anything. At the point where the dilemma changes, King Lear is saved and loved by those good people who were like angels in King Lear's life and he would devastate them at the very beginning of the story. In this play, King Lear's anger lead to weir and contest against the daughters. His male ego and patriarchal ideology get reflected through the storm outside. In the further, we get to know about when the, lovest, the beloved daughter of King Lear died. The symbolic representation here tells about the ideology of this. The storm and warfare are the greatest environmental disaster and gives a deeper understanding to this play. Add layers in the context of the environment relevant today. Excuse me, ma'am, I'm getting some of the disturbances. Um, sorry, give me a second. Uh, Meena, can you please mute your... His eco-feminist sensibility is evident and time again in the entire play. Therefore, the story explore, analyze, assess and critically examine the man-made disaster and their impact on human life. The paper also critically examines the effect of nature on King Lear's temperament and the change of personality at the end of play. Here are the, some of the refrains and the keywords of the story like ecology, nature, environment, the man-made and the natural disaster, and sustainability. Ecology prefers the actual environment of the story where the main mind of the King Lears destroy the outside of the uh, the outside of his environment like the war was happening the outside but in the, his mind he was in uh, he was against his own preferences like his daughters in the nature of the story when the storms comes out he has he doesn't affected much but the storms created by his daughter in his life was much affected in that in the further this ppt seeks the analyzation and much more of the molarity uh, that depends in his life here are some of the things that Shakespeare put into the story. Like Shakespeare was a person who led the main character of the story to keep his kingdom as it is in its ecology. Shakespeare was an environmentalist person. He was a person who was always being one with the nature. He showed how the King Lear devastated empire was his ecosystem disruption. In the King Lear, in the story, King Lear died for the cause of environment issues because in the grief, the daughter he loved so much wasn't the actual, we can say, the person who should Priyanshi, be loved. can you conclude now, please, your yes, presentation as you have taken so much time? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, life is very uncertain about this. We can never fully plan the eventualities and there is no substitute for the moral reticate. Upon the discovering beloved daughter died in the grief of generations, readers have found ending of King Lear unbearably sad for the century of it was considered to be tragic to perform. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was grateful to be the part of this conference. Thank you, Priyanshi. Uh, Priyanshi, you have any questions? No, I don't have any question. Okay, ma'am. Um, Priyanshi, 
Uh, yes, sir. Very, very good initiative. Uh, just one question. Can you define ecology? That ecology here refers to the environment that Shakespeare was not getting. What is Actually, the basic the meaning of ecology better? Just ecology. Sir, the basic Sir, the basic meaning of ecology is the environment of our life. And there I represented to the times where the 14th to 19th century in the golden age period, no, the story no. took place. Yes, sir. But when I'm presenting the any PPT, be yes, sir. the knowledge of basic concept, like environment. Sir, no, sir actually, I'm not like that. Better it, you just listen. We are here to help you. You are telling the wrong definition of ecology and environment. I'm sorry. Sir, no, I am going to tell you the, the definition. Next one. Thank you, Beta. God bless you. Thank you, Priyanshi. So the next participant is Lini Ma. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Shall I share my screen? Yes, Lini Ma, you can share your screen. It's visible and audible, ma'am. Uh, yes, Linima. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon to all. I'm Linima, Lucia Scholar, Department of Biotechnology, Specialization Bio Nanotechnology. In my research work, in my research work is titled as Plant-Based Nanoparticles and Their Potential Application under the su supervision of Dr. R. Raghunathan Sir. Excuse me, just a minute. Next slide is visible, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Next introduction. As we know about nanotechnology, nanotechnology is mainly concerned with the synthesis of nanoparticles of various shapes, size, chemical composition, control dispersity, and their potential use for the human benefits. Especially in biological synthesis of nanoparticles, plant-based nano, plant synthesis of nanoparticles, it is a reliable and enabling environment-friendly process for the synthesis of nanoparticles. So, Biosynthesis of nanoparticles is the major division in the field of applicable nanoscience and nanotechnology. Many researchers also reported plants with its medicinal properties. Plants are used medicinally in, medicinally in different countries and are source of many potent drugs with the process varied medicinal properties. So, therefore, aim of in my research work with the plants with the medicinal properties of there is need of an alternative drug. So, uh, uh, to fabric, so I will select three medicinal plants: Resinus communis, Sandala asiatica, and Desmodium triflorum. To fabricate the plant mediated both iron and silver nanoparticles using leaf extract of three these three medicinal plants. Then after the characterization of leaf extracts, then synthesis of nanoparticles and its characterization. Finally, the biomedical applications. Now I completed the first plant, resinous communis. Methodology. Mature leaves of resinous communis were collected and identified by Botanical Survey of India. Then after preparation of leaf extract, Then synthesis of both iron and silver nanoparticles. After that, characterization of nanoparticles uh, by UV visible absorption spectroscopy, FTR, FTR analysis, XRD analysis, EDS, SEM, and TEM analysis. After its application level, antibacterial activity, antifungal activity, and minimum, minimum inhibitory concentration against human pathogenic strains such as E. coli, Staphylococcus aureus, Salmonella typhi, Aspergillus nica, and Aspergillus flavus. By using Agarwal diffusion method and 96 well placed method. Now, I'm moving on to results. First one, phytochemical analysis. 
Phytochemical analysis of business communist word conformed various secondary metabolites, such as alkaloids, flavonoids, steroids, quinones, proteins, saponins, and phenols. Second one, antioxidant activity. Antioxidant activity of both DPPH and the total antioxidant activity of Prisnis communist mediated aqueous iron and silver nanoparticle were conformed by its significant inhibition percentage. So the antioxidants were conformed by the Prisnis communist leaf extract. Third one, thin layer chromatography. The TLC analysis of leaf extract was various phytochemical components confirmed by its RF value. Fourth one, GCMS analysis. GCMS analysis were con confirmed the 69 components, 69 phytochemical components were confirmed with its biological functions such as antimicrobial activity, anti-cancer uh, anti activity, antioxidant, viral infection, chemotherapeutic agents, and anti-diabetic. This characterization of business communist leaf extract was confirmed with the various type phytochemical components with its biological functions. Next, the synthesized carrot, uh, the next the characterization, sorry, the next the characterization of both iron and silver nanoparticles. The UV first one UV visible absorption spectroscopic. The UV visible abs absorption spectroscopy of uh, abs uh, absorption spectroscopy of iron and silver nanoparticles were confirmed by its strong absorbance peaks. Such as uh, the iron the uh, iron nanoparticles indicate the three forty nanometer and the silver nanoparticle indi indicates the four forty nanometer. Second one uh, FTR analysis. FTR analysis was used to uh, uh, analyze the functional group of both iron and silver nanoparticles. Third one, SEM analysis. SEM analysis were confirmed the shape of the both nanoparticles. Iron nanoparticles indicate the irregular anti-cuboidal shape and the silver nanoparticles indi indicate the cuboidal and spherical shape. Next. XRD analysis were confirmed the crystalline structure of both iron and silver nanoparticles. EDS analysis were confirmed the elemental composition of both nanoparticles. Iron indicated the 37 percentage of iron and 63 percentage of oxygen. Silver nanoparticle 85 percentage of silver and 15 percentage of oxygen. Finally, the gem analysis. Stem analysis, iron nanoparticles, spherical and cuboidal shape, silver nanoparticles, spherical and round shape with a 50 nanometer in size. The application level, antibacterial activity. The antibacterial activity of silver nanoparticle exhibit a strong antibacterial potential when compared to the iron nanoparticles. That is Salmonella typhi followed by Staphylococcus aureus anti E. coli. Antifungal activity. Excellent antifungal activity of iron and silver nanoparticle exhibited Aspergillus flavus followed by Aspergillus niger. Last, minimum inhibitory concentration. The minimum inhibitory concentration of antibacterial activity of lowest and highest cell death percentage against Staphylococcus aureus. The iron nanoparticles indicate the 63.09 percentage, the lowest value, and highest 26.67 percentage. Silver nanoparticles indicate the 74.18 percentage, the lowest value, and the 89.27 percentage, the highest value. These studies demonstrated business communist mediated silver nanoparticle exhibited strong antimicrobial potential followed by iron nanoparticles. Based on these results, it can be concluded that these nanoparticles hold great promise as a therapeutic agent for a range for biomedical 
applications as we know the in modern medicinal field uh, the emergence of the emergence of viral multi drug resistant pathogens and various types of cancer diseases so there is need of a alternative drug in this regard the plant with the medicinal properties are considered as one of the best alternative source of antibiotics of biomedical applications these are the references my heartfelt gratitude goes to my rice supervisor dr r rabinathan cbnr family my parents husband thank you dinima very good presentation i appreciate your research work and the way you presented all the best thank to you. you thank you sir um maybe you can extend your work uh, that you yes, can yes sir yes sir this is my primary article for bioabsorbents and other work and okay, uh, all the best very nice presentation thank you sir thank you so much thank you leenima okay the next presenter yen santil kumar santil kumar sir are you there audio is clear yes sir we can hear your voice sir you can share your screen oh clear madam yes sir yes yeah, yes madam yes madam just a minute uh, my slide is clear madam yes sir it's visible yeah okay thank you uh, myself dr n sandeep kumar working as associate professor at department of soil science and agriculture chemistry uh, anamalai university so now i am going to present my seminar topic on effect of integrated nutrient management on improved growth and yield of traditional rice variety so mapilai samba in a rice varieties so rice is a india so pre eminent crop is a staple food of people of eastern and southern part of our country so apart from being nutritionally rich rice holders a great spiritual in india more than 1200 varieties were released for cultivation suitable for a different ecosystem uh, so you know variable uh, about olden days uh, for so many or lakhs of varieties uh, find out 1970 so this uh, divert has been lost to or posterity of result of a green revolution so which is emphasis on monoculture and hybrid crops so introduce the hybrid crops so loss of uh, so many traditional varieties is a very good uh, health and uh, basis nutritional value so now only 6000 species are varieties of rice survey so destruction of rice uh, diversity of the country in contribution of a green revolution dr deb said okay now i am uh, so important uh, given for uh, mapilai chamba is a very famous for our tamil nadu area uh, is a uh, uh, told you bright grooms rice so simply told us very healthy food for the mapilai chamba variety so is a who wants to get good energy and strength here the benefits so he high fiber content present in the rice as a digestion and another vitamin b1 present and uh, rice aids in healing stomach and uh, mouth uh, ulcers so improve immunity and stamina the strengthens muscles and the nerves so so i am chosen for uh, this varieties uh, increases hemoglobin content also so good for diabetics since it is have low glycemic index little ones will achieve better growth 
so continuously application for fertilizer some impact of uh, environment or soil and water and others the continuous use of chemical fertilizer can build up in soil causes long term imbalance in soil ph and fertility so these are uh, thinking about for fixing the objectives to study the effect of organic and inorganic so 50 50 so reduce the inorganic dosage on growth and yield of traditional rice variety and another one to achieve the best combination of solid and liquid organics menus the npk consortia so with the olden days using for uh, bio fertilizer so this advanced one liquid consortia so npk so is unavailable to available form the foliar spray and increase the fertilizer on nutrient uptake and quality of traditional rice to find out the effect of solid and liquid organic manure and the npk consortia with foliar spray and inorganic fertilizer and the post harvest soil fertility status okay so these are experimental details uh, for using uh, samba season in uh, cultivation of mopli chamba so this uh, treatment details for absolute control 100% recommended dose of fertilizer so next 50% recommended dose plus fim 12.5 tons 50% recommended dose of fertilizer vermicompost at the rate of 2.5 tons per hectare 50% recommended dose of fertilizer humic granules at the 25 kg per hectare so 50% recommended dose of fertilizer fim at the rate of 12.5 tons per hectare and we npk consortia so this uh, same like this 50% recommended dose where we compost at the rate of 2.5 tons per hectare plus npk consortia uh, t five uh, uh, 8 50% recommended dose of fertilizer humic granules uh, at the rate of 25 kg per hectare at the npk consortia so t9 50% recommended dose fim npk consortia so another additional at sea weed liquid at the rate of uh, 2% in the foliar spray of two times t10 so same like this 50% recommended dose in the combined with vermi compost at the 2.5 tons per hectare npk consortia plus sea weed liquid at the rate of 2% foliar spray two times so this one uh, finally so adding humic granules for at the rate of 25 kg npk consortia plus sea weed liquid at the rate of 2% foliar spray uh, the following the treatment so this is a experimental result our field one physical chemical properties so it is a typical usto step or a sandy clay loam type of soil so average present in or available nitrogen medium available phosphorus medium available potassium high level okay so finally my result the express uh, with the effect of application of different solid and liquid organics along with inorganic sources in plant height and traditional rice varieties of mopli chamba so among the treatments t10 so 50% recommended dose of fertilizer the npk consortia and vermi compost at the 2.5 tons per hectare so plus sea weed liquid a uh, four year spray so significantly influence for the all the bio uh, growth parameters or uh, uh, tillering stage panicle and the harvest stage so other all the characters so influence with the t10 treatment okay so this a uh, so other uh, yield and yield parameters panicle length uh, number of grains per panicle number of tillers per grain uh, finally so conclude uh, uh, so uh, the data on the grain yield so compared to control treatment so 3782 kg per hectare so get the grain yield from apple chamba variety so and the straw yield also influence with uh, this treatment so this uh, showed me for our field uh, location uh finally concluded for based on the result the field experiment uh, 50% recommended dose of a combination with vermi compost at the 2.5 tons per hectare and the npk consortia so along with consortia is a uh, so sealing tip and a uh, broadcasting application uh, after a tillering and a flowering stage for a sea weed liquid foliar spray the two times 
the T10 was superior in performance with respect to growth yield attributes and yield of a traditional rice variety in Mapillai Chamba. So the organic amendment not only effective for fertilizer, the rice crop, but also have sustainable way of producing the rice. The substituting inorganic fertilizer with organic alternatives would also help to protect the environment. So this can be recommended to farmers for the fertile yield. So, so my concept is so maximum reduce the fertilizer application to increase the organic sources. So finally, thank you. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to one and all for organizers. Thank you. Any doubt and reply? Any question? <clears throat> no question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kumar. It's very nice work and a very nice presentation. Uh, just, thank you, sir. Uh, just one suggestion uh, for you, sir. The name of the species you mentioned, it must be in italics as per the scientific norms. And uh, another thing is that uh, uh, just it's a knowledge sharing. You know that uh, uh, seed mother, Rahi Bai Soma from Maharashtra, she yeah, got yeah. the Padam Shri Award in 2020 to conserve the traditional seeds of rice and so many yeah. plants. Uh, and so, uh, that is also a good for us. Thank you, sir, for the nice presentation. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, organizers, given me the opportunities for presentation. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The next participant is Hong Zen. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, let me see. Share my screen first. Yeah. Uh, can oh, you see my screen? Yes. Uh, let me start the presentation. And my title is Unlock the Personal Beauty for Women Beauty Product Review website with a customized recommendation. And this is all I will cover in my presentation. First, uh, now let us go to the background introduction. Uh, beauty products play an important role in our daily life, but beauty products have used to uh, personal hygiene or improve our self confidence. But however, now the market has a variant and efficiency product that make the challenge for customers to choose the right product for them. And now the roles are growing the demand for uh, realized and personality beauty product recommendation. And customers choose the beauty product are influenced by variant factoria first. Customer will reduce financial resource and are more concerned with the efficiency and integrity of the commercial product instead of the price. And secondly, uh, sponsor content is frequently just the through the entertainment and additional material make the customer difficult to discuss uh differentiate between the commercial and not commercial material. And finally, customers rely on the recommendations from family or beauty blogger or uh, advertising. But the problem is that the beauty product review are only suitable for the small percentage of persons. And because the different, different person have a different skin characteristic. And now some existing the beauty product review website cannot display the reviewer characteristic. So the reviewer, the user cannot determine the review is suitable for them or not. And now a lot of uh, review websites are using the long article to explain the product benefit. And some websites that not have the responsive design, they're requiring user to zoom in and zoom out to navigate the website, make on, uh, making the poor experiment for user. And my paper aim to develop the new response beauty product review website to provide the consumer with more detailed, reliable 
rival review. And I have achieved my end, I have uh, five object, uh, three objectives. And to identify the best practice and opportunity for the improvement in beauty product by comparing website. And second, to design the website functionality for easy navigate and user friendly, we will also display the user's skin characteristic. And third is to determine the efficiency of the website and characteristic recommendation. And now let us move on to the literature review. And uh, first, let me uh, different, uh, discuss the difference between the retailer and the third-party website. And the retailer website is host by the, for host the customer review, so they can control the customer review. So for example, they can remove the negative review. It said that more retailer website has an overall product review, ranking including the product, seller, customer service, or logistic something. And the third party website typically provide the information about the product packaging, efficiency, and integrity, and the consumer review. Third party website focus on the review for the product. More than 50% online customer trust the third party website more than the retailer website. And the impact of the online review website is uh, during due to the COVID-19 lockdown policy, then a lot of country temporarily closed the not necessary store to make the consumer turn to online purchase. However, to, when the customer on, uh, purchase on the online, they cannot try the product before their purchase. And the customer cannot be sure that if the product is suitable for them or not. And online review become a main information. Can you please the... uh, conclude your uh, presentation now? Okay. And in my project, I uh, successful create the successful create the online review website, and that is the responsive website. And my target user is the woman. And my um my website following the details uh, uh will provide the skin tag for the woman. They can determine the product is suitable for them or not. And for the stakeholder part, they can uh insight into the customer preference and the feedback will help them improve their uh, business. Uh, that's for, all for me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Okay, so the next participant is Professor Gauranji. Yes, ma'am. You can share your screen and you can start your presentation. Right away, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope the screen is visible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so the our topic is an investigation on employees' insight towards green HRM initiatives for environment sustainability for the betterment of the of the organization. So as my fellow presenters have already explained that green human resource management, like we are talking about the green management. Now, when we are talking about the green human resource management, it involves the integration or uh, integration of the sustainable practices into the HR strategies, which is aiming to minimize the environmental impact of organizational activities. It emphasizes eco-friendly policies, resource efficiency, and employee involvement in sustainability efforts. 
These initiatives align with the HR functions, with the sustainable, with environmental objectives, fostering a culture of responsibility and ecological awareness within the organization. So this approach, and uh, it is a, a combination of the various aspects, including reducing carbon footprint, promoting green work practices among employees, developing sustainable HR policies, supporting environmental education and awareness, and collaborating with green suppliers. So overall, we can say that green HRM initiatives aim to minimize the ecological impact of organizational activities while engaging employees in the contribute in contribute in contributing positively to environmental sustainability. So I think there are some advantages and disadvantages to this topic, which we can discuss overall. Like it definitely it helps to enhance the corporate image. It is also useful for the cost saving. It is good to have the innovations and the creativity, but it has its own limitations where, because it needs initial um, in investment, then uh, resistance to change employees are not uh, generally comfortable to any of the changing in environmental. Uh, then there is limited market recognition, there is conflict with other priorities. But overall, if we say it is a very important concept in today's world. So objectives, when we talk about uh, the green HRM, it is to reduce the carbon footprint, promote green work practices. So it is uh, to minimize the energy consumption. We are talking about the energy uh, to, en to encourage eco-friendly habits among the employees. Then if we talk about enhanced employee in engagement, it means um, like we are trying to engage the employees in environmental initiatives, fostering a sense of ownership and responsibility towards sustainable practices, then uh, develop uh, sustainable policies, that is able to formulate the HR policies, uh, formulate HR policies that promote sustainability, including flexible uh, work arrangements. Uh, then uh, when we are talking about uh, the next point, that is to develop sustainable, uh, to partner with green suppliers, means to collaborate with eco-friendly vendors and suppliers, ensuring that the supply aligns with the sustainability goals. And uh, lastly, uh, corporate to the social uh, to the co corporate social responsibility, which we are all aware of CSR, means to de demonstrate a commitment to environmental stewardship, uh, contributing positively to the community and industry. Now, the objective of the paper is to analyze the awareness among employees in organization about green HRM, how much they are aware of it, then to identify the effectiveness that uh, how effective is the practices in the organizations? There might be some limitations to identify the employee's perception towards the environment, to identify employee's perception about organization as green initiative taker, to identify the implementation of employee awareness programs and practices in the organization, and to identify the employee's involvement and participation in environmental practices in the organization. This paper is having some hypothesis. So the hypothesis of the paper are there are two hypotheses of the paper that uh, h1 as we can see there is an association between implementation of green hr practices and improved organization culture and secondly there is a relationship between employees role and a sense of responsibility towards green initiatives for the betterment of the organization for this research paper we have seen some uh, literature review also based on the literature review we have tried to do some analysis and we'll be concluding it with our own uh, perception and like interpretation whatever we have seen with these um, uh, this uh, literature review so over here we can see that there are some findings and uh, there are some findings which has revealed that how what are the uh, problems regarding the green HRM practices with the job performance. In the next, we can see that uh, there is some low to uh, moderate level of Im implementations due to some of the barriers. Now over to my co-host. Uh, co Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Professor Gorangi Munje. Uh, I would like to discuss the research methodology which is implemented to achieve the objective of this paper. The study is basically a survey-based research which was done on the basis of structured questionnaire. Questionnaire was designed with questions to collect the uh, information about the perception of employees about green HRM practices and its effectiveness on organizational culture. Uh, there are two types of data is uh, utilized primary data and secondary data where uh, <clears throat> sample size is randomly uh, picked. Uh, or, uh, through the random sampling techniques, but uh, complete 100% response is not uh, received by the uh, 
participants so 92 employees were participated successfully and uh, their response is on the basis of their personal experience the study is uh, mainly focusing on the employees perception so hrm practices uh, those organizations are only considered who implemented a green hrm practices in their uh, organizational behavior so the analysis is completely done on the basis of graphical representation and uh, graphical representation is basically a way to analyze the numerical data so there are few graphs are uh, designed uh, on the collected data uh, the structured question here is designed on the basis of a hypothesis which is divided into three part the first factor is employees perception of organization towards the role uh, in uh, green initiatives the second factor is to uh, identify the employees role in green initiatives in organization and the third factor is employee sense of responsibility for green initiatives uh, within the organization so first second and third all the sections are analyzed on the basis of graphical presentation uh so the response is calculated and interpreted on the basis of percentage and graphical presentation where uh, 80% of respondents are agreed that green initiative is implemented in an organization successfully 78% of respondents agreed that they participated in various meetings conducted for environmental safety uh with uh, and uh, implemented employee uh, employee awareness programs within the organization likewise so the uh, entire result of analysis is that 93% of respondents agreed that employee perception of organizational role in green initiative is very positive then 96% of respondents agree that employees own role in green initiative is very important and positive and 89% of respondents are agreed that employees sense of responsibility for green initiative is very important so on the basis of above analysis uh, it is proven that our hypothesis is accepted so uh, alternative hypothesis is accepted that there is an relationship and association between implementation of green hr practices uh, uh, it will help to improve organizational culture as well as there is an relationship a relationship between employees role and sense of responsibility towards green initiative for betterment of the organization oh. Uh, it is found out that respondents are very aware about the term green hr and they know how uh, green hr concepts and uh, how to believe that these green hr concepts are very effective for organization now select staff faculty select panna uh, it, it was uh, also uh, further analyzed that no efficiency people who are not aware of the term hr especially ethnic scholars irukanga uh, sorry ma'am uh, there is disturbance ஒர்கனைசேஷன்ஸ்ரீஜ்ரீஸ்ஃபுல்ஸ்ரீஸ்ஃபுல்ஸ்ரீஸ்ஃபுல்ஸ்ரீஸ்ஃபுல்ஸ
uh, through the study suggested that organization should more conduct employee awareness programs to enhance awareness about the green hrm and develop various management policies and practices towards green hrm and also develop green teams uh, for very different uh, functional departments thank you so much any questions sir no questions Neda. you can proceed to the next participant thank you so much ma'am thank you ma'am and uh, so the next participant is subeshia subeshia okay. am i audible yes am i audible okay okay uh, well just a second let me see if I could uh, turn on my PPT. Uh, just a second. Um, okay. okay. Just a second, huh? Um, documents. Documents. Okay, there you go. Select. Oh, uh, PPT is not presentable right is it like so you um, can share your screen yeah i'm trying to share the screen but they are asking only a pdf type is available can you turn this on that ppt i'm trying okay if it doesn't then i'll do a oral presentation will that be okay if i'm unable to share yes but uh, can you please try it yeah i'm trying this um i did not know like uh, they need uh, share i'm doing here then um, documents uh, madam you can send your slides to the organizers they will present on your behalf is it possible well, is it possible yeah I, I can i can like uh, the number i was given here just a second huh? I'm, I'm just sharing it mm, mm, just uh Subesha, if it take more than a minute i ask the other participant to present it then later you can present it Okay, okay, after this, uh, yes, yes, after this, I'm sharing then. Um, okay, uh, so the next participant is Pratyusha. Um, yes, ma'am, am I audible? Yes. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Pratyusha Barnik. I'm a final year undergraduate student of a biotechnology department from Sister Nivedita University. I want to thank Professor Atri Ghosh, the head of the Department of Microbiology, for giving me a chance to be the part of this wonderful conference. So I'm going to share the screen. Just a second. I'm just a second, I guess there's some issues. What happened, Patyusha? Are you unable to oh, present your presentations? Okay, my presentation is ready. If it's okay, then I can I share or shall I wait? 
Yes, ma'am. The participant can share. I guess there are some issues. Okay. Shall I wait for uh, Pratusha, ma'am, to complete her presentation, or shall I start? Uh, because my presentation is more or less ready. I can share now through PPT or video, whatever. Yeah, ma'am. She can share. I need to sort the things out. It's not working. Okay. Then I'm sharing this, and I'm I'm doing my presentation. Okay. Uh, is it audible here? Sorry, is it visible and audible? Yes, it is visible. You can proceed now. Okay, and I'll do it. Yes, yes ma'am. Please try to uh, be brief. Actually, yeah, I'll be brief. I'll just take only already one. Wasted. Yes. Okay, uh, so uh, the name, uh, the title of my paper is Role of Educational Institute Towards Sustainable Lifestyle in Youth in India. So in this paper, we have tried to um, highlight that how educational institute, it can be school, college or university, can actually um, help the youth or actually uh, spread awareness among the youth to maintain a sustainable lifestyle. So I'll just go directly to the point. That is the first one is knowledge uh, dissemination. That is the educational institute can directly share knowledge. We all know. It can be through curriculum, it can be through activities, it can be through different other means. So the very first point is knowledge uh, dissemination. Uh, they impart information on renewable energy. Research can be done on this kind of topic. Uh, the next point I would like to go is uh, curriculum. In that is the curriculum can be integrated. That is uh, the syllabus or anything. Experiential learning, this kind of sustainable lifestyle can also be uh, you know, um, taught through experiential learning. So subjects like environmental sciences, their ecology, sustainable development, they provide a kind of a foundation for understanding and significance leading a sustainable lifestyle. So curriculum integration is uh, one of the very important uh, means through which a sustainable lifestyle can be initiated. The next one is practical learning and initiatives. That means through experiential learning by um, initiating people for research or by giving projects like this way, uh, through practical learning, sustainable lifestyle can be done. Here we have mentioned gardening, waste segregation, recycling program, etc. Engaging students in uh, activities which actually, uh, which is actually the base of uh, sustainable lifestyle can also help through the process. Uh, the next is promotion of green technology. This is absolutely research oriented. Educational Institute can often serve as a hub of promoting this. A uh, different kind of research, uh, I mean, of uh, uh, sorry, research uh, funding can be done by universities, by colleges through which the sustainable lifestyle can be maintained. Okay, so uh, in, uh, I mean, uh, for this purpose, mostly the education can uh, play a big role. A higher educational institute. Next is cultural shift and mindset change that is by instilling values and ethics. This can be done in the school level where the children can be uh, taught about uh, the importance of sustainable lifestyle and uh, the cultural shift we can actually make a cultural uh, sorry cultural di uh, dynamism through this initiative next is student led initiative this can be done both in school colleges and universities encouraging the students um, and led to sustainable clubs then sustainable groups that will actually empower the students in organizing the awareness campaign tree plant planting and advocating of sustainable policies uh, next is partner and if I, uh, sorry, you can collaborate. Uh, higher education, many uh, uh, universities can collaborate with NGOs and any other national or international organization. Sustainable development or uh, uh, sorry, the sustainable development or anything associated with the environment. Next is the innovation. This institute often conduct research and sustainable technology because these are here. That is mostly this is a university level where uh, space and research to share the sustainable lifestyle among youth. This is development that is educating the sustainable and the importance of uh, conservation of uh, environment and ecosystem. This is education or making them aware daily and through leadership management. Uh, next is long. Is the impact on educational institute on fostering sustainable lifestyle change beyond it? Uh, 
Hello, am I audible? Hello. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not sharing again. It was the last slide. I would like to conclude directly that uh, these points collectively emphasize the profound influence that educational institutions process in shaping mindsets, behavior, and actions towards embracing and promoting sustainable lifestyle. So it's a very long-term impact that is uh, from school environment to immediate graduate who are educated in sustainable practices, carry these values into the career communities and daily life contributing to a more sustainable society. So this is where I would like to conclude. If anybody would like to ask me any question, I'm uh, there to answer. I'm very sorry because I'm middle of something. So I'm just concluding it like this way. Thank you, Subhesha, for the nice okay. presentation. <clears throat> okay. I have one question uh, that... Uh, yes. What the Arunachal Universities of Studying Studies is doing to implement sustainable lifestyle of youth in Arunachal? In yes, the uh, yes, absolutely. Um, as a research scholar, I got to know about there is a Go Green campaign was there. Then um, uh, there, there was a campaign that was uh, about the tree plantation that was associated with Arunachal government also. And uh, another um, campaign was done along with the border road organization where trees were uh, planted and the students of Arunachal of University, sorry, Arunachal University of Studies they have uh, taken part in that rallies happen every year okay. and uh, and many other right. things are there which uh, yeah. which country every year we do something a very important point you are missing that every undergraduate student in india as per yes. the of supreme court they have to take environmental studies course as a compulsory one yes 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 this is also correct um thank you very yes. much thank you so much thank you please Thank you, Subhashya. The Thank next participant, it's uh, Pratyusha. Pratyusha. Yes, I'm sharing the screen. Yes. yes. Um, is my screen visible? No prediction. No. Can you click the icon share screen? Uh, Ma'am, can I share my PPT with the like uh, anyone? Okay. Pratyusha, can you please try it now again? Ma'am, is it visible now? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to talk about the topic fungal pigment in textile industries. Fungi is an eukaryotic microorganism commonly known as yeast and molds. It has various use in industrial application like foods, cosmetics, medicine, waste remediation, etc. Pigments from fungi can be used as a great alternative to artificial dyes. In textile industries, since synthetic dyes are harmful for living beings in various ways as they are mutagenic, 
carcinogenic pollute soil and water posing threat to life forms now let's see why microbial my, uh, pigments more efficient and cost effective more feasible avail availability of microbes throughout the year can be produced easily on cheap culture medium with high yields easy processing and growth that is independent of weather conditions now let's see about the materials and methods here i used pdb that is potato dextrose broth which is used as a liquid medium for fungal growth now uh, here i have boiled uh, 50 grams of chopped potatoes in 100 ml distilled water followed by the filtration in two different conicals then we added 2 gram of dextrose powder in them and mix it properly followed by steam sterilization now here comes the collection of sample from unknown fungal strain giving yellow and red pigments into two conical now growing the pigment uh, growing the fungus both samples were grown separately into the conical and kept for incubation now isolation of fungus and subculture in it after the incubation we we will see a thick blanket of fungal growth on the top <clears throat> of pdb giving colored pigments as yellow and red in both the conicals. Now, both the conicals were sterilized using pressure cooker for eight minutes for two days. Then we filtered out both yellow and red pigments in reagent bottles by using cotton cloth and thick fungal layer was discarded. Now, after this filtration process, we stored the fungal pigments in minus 20 degrees Celsius refrigerator Further process are yet to be done for proper identification of the unknown fungus. Here we can see the observation. These are the results showing the formation of fungal blanket after incubation and the pigments after filtration. And here comes the conclusion. From the previous observation, it is clear that unknown fungi produce pigment in liquid medium. The red pigments became dark red and the yellow pigments uh, became orange due to the sterilization. Further spectrometric detection, toxicity of fungus and other process for identification is yet to be done. After this detection, we can apply those pigments on different textile materials to check if it's a better alternative to artificial dyes or not. So thank you. Uh, that's all. Any question? No, sir. No question. Thank you, Pratyusha, for the nice initiative because you are just starting your research. To be um, all the best for your future yes, endeavor. Sir. Thank just, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Two questions with you. The one is that uh, at what temperature you did the incubation? Well, it was in room temperature. Okay, room temperature. Okay. Yes. And can you name some common fungi available? Common, common fungi, yes. Common fungi like uh, surrounding us. Mm -hmm. uh, then we can say the mushrooms which we get, like aspergillus is common. Then, uh, then what can we say? Like ascomy, yes, ascomy yes. gota. This. Yes. Thank you, better. All the best. Thank you, sir. The next one. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation, Pratyusha. So next we can call Chaitanya for the presentation. Chaitanya, so you can start your presentation by sharing the screen. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. You can share your screen, sir. Yes, ma'am.
can you please share your presentation yes, yes ma'am trying to share ma'am Um, is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm Professor Chaitanya Sakare, and uh, my topic for uh, research paper is navigating the dynamics of recycling business, a comprehensive analysis of market trends, challenges, and sustainable strategies. Now, the main issue what we are facing nowadays is escalating environmental concerns and imperative for sustainable practices. And recycling industry stands as a pivotal player in shaping a greener and more resilient future. Now, this paper, research paper, embarks on comprehensive analysis of navigating what are the integrated dynamics of recycling business by exploring into market trends, what are the various challenges, and what would be the sustainable strategies. This study seeks to guiding beacon for businesses, policymakers, and stakeholders alike. Also, in a sense, exploring of a recycling landscape is not merely a study of material, but an exploration of possibilities for more sustainable and circular economy. Now, what are the various need why we should focus on environmental issues? Because the most important problem now we are facing is because of the industrial wastage, what we are creating and whatever amount of products we are using that are creating a large amount of waste product. Okay. So the extraction and consumption of resources have reached unprecedented levels, compelling and critical examination of our waste management system and recycling with its promise of resource con conservation and reduce environmental effect emerges as crucial solution to address the solution of our time. Okay. So now what are the research objectives of my paper to do? Number one, to do comprehensive analysis of recycling industry and market. Number second, to investigate market trends. What are the impact of consumer behavior, government regulations? What are the technological advances on demand and supply of dynamics of recycled materials? And third objective is to study the challenges as well as the sustainability of the recycling enterprises. Okay. So now we can see that the recycling industry in India, it is around uh, 58.7 million dollars as per the 2023 uh, statistics. So it is a very large amount of statistics we can see and recycling business is not an easy task. So many companies are involved into it. Okay. So likewise, some regulations have been provided by government. So we can check through it. So like around the globe, regulations have been brought for reduced waste cycling depending upon the local market and consumer behavior. And what are the various hazardous effects because of that environmental products that has been increasing more problem and the whole world is facing a more problem related to these hazardous products. So in India, we can see that some regulations have been provided like hazardous waste that is management handling amendment rules which was provided in 2003 likewise guidelines for environmentally sound management of e-waste 
in year 2008 and likewise e waste management and handling rules so these are the some rules check which the government is providing and companies have to follow those rules so what are the challenges which uh, generally are faced into this business okay so number one is poor recycling quality so whatever products which are being produced after recycling are not of very good qualities like we see uh, when we consume in a thermocol or a recycled product a tea or a coffee so that products are not a very well uh, having a good quality so that is a problem number second is a lack of education so there is a lack of awareness among various consumers what are the various uh, utility or what are the those companies who are producing that products third is safety for workers now those products which are been recycled into companies have to be prepared in a very uh, cautious way so there has to be taken some kind of safety for workers but that has not been taken so much number four is expensive and inadequate services so at times the products uh, which they want to produce are expensive and the services and infrastructure is also not properly maintained there next is low cycle a low market for recycled materials so most of the times people want to buy an fresh product rather than recycled product so that is also one of the problem which is faced next is technological advances number one is chemical recycling number second is mechanical recycling number third is thermal recycling and biological recycling all these recycling businesses are definitely going to have an impact on those workers who are trying to uh, help in the production process likewise uh, in the mechanical recycling as well as in thermal recycling and biological recycling next is what are the innovation in recycling so we can see some kind of products which can be uh, used or which have been produced number one is plastic waste sunglasses number second recycled baby clothing thereafter upcycled computer jewelry next is shoe protecting footwear accessory recycled smartphone security system next is reclaimed billboard bags likewise paper paved bike highways and eco friendly drug store cosmetics so these are some innovations in recycling and products are been made so companies are involved into it okay so in conclusion i can say that recycling is still playing a role in solving the plastic issue these challenges to recycling can be elevated if we buy products that are made of a recycled material educate ourselves on what goes into recycling bin and go into extra mile to make sure what are that recycled materials aren't going to be in the landfill this fast going waste initiated in countries and now it extends to all uh, developing countries like india also likewise overwhelming innovation technology in electronic equipment development result in rapid obsolescence which results in massive generation of e waste also mm -hmm. next is to develop an economic uh, economical and environmentally friendly recycling system for e waste likewise classification and quantification of valuable and hazardous components is a prerequisite likewise individuals along with the marketers should aim at economical uh, environmental friendly products and in the end public awareness is the key to recycling business also so we can focus that esr can also be taken into consideration as an recommendation that company should also do some extended social responsibility of taking all those uh, paper materials what they are providing as a packaging and thereafter they can use for recycling okay so this is it from my side thank you thank you ma'am thank you everyone 
Any question? Any questions, ma'am? Sir? No, sir. No question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chaitanya. I thank you, sir. I want to know what, is, what was the study area and what was the study tool of your research? Sir, most uh, in, in the central India, uh, I, I have been into central India, so I have uh, tried to collect information from various sources which are doing recycling businesses. Like uh, we have some uh, uh, Kanak uh, uh, company's name is Kanak that is involved into recycling business and uh, majorly from government websites. I have taken information. Okay. Okay. So just want to update your knowledge, Dr. Chetane, that the hazard yes, waste management rules are updated and now they are of 2016 and this still okay, this in 2023. Okay, sir. Currently, the e waste management rule are also of 2016 now. So, okay, sir. A nice presentation. Next Thank one. you, sir. The next participant is Anviti. Uh, Niti Somali. Hi, this is Somali. I would like to present on the particular chapter. That's why I will be sharing my PPT first. Okay. Uh, you can share your screen. Yes, ma'am. Just a little bit. Yeah, as we can simply say that it has been shown that the father of Tony Stark, Mr. Howard Stark, talked about electricity in MCU universe, and it really is relevant in today's world as well. When we say about electricity, yeah. it not only moves forward, but it also it... talks about moving forward with the lake of light. Ma'am, uh, is my slide visible? Are you the presenter or somebody is presenting on your behalf? Oh, I'm presenter. Uh, sir, can you please on the video? Is it visible? Uh, can you please on the video now? Just a second, ma'am. I think we should not entertain because Nidhi is a female as per the LinkedIn profile. And sir, mail was presenting. Nidhi, yes, good afternoon. Hello. Uh, Ma'am, is there any two presenter or only one? Because you have mentioned only one presenter on the registration. One presenter. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, can you So now you can present because some, yes, now you present better. Um, now you can share your screen. Just a second, sir. Is my slide visible? Is my slide visible? Not yet. No. Hello. Is my slide visible, sir? No, ma'am. But I have shared my screen. I'll try it again. Just a second.
Is it visible now? Ma'am, if you need some time, shall we go with the other participant and now we will come back to you? But I have shared my screen, ma'am. Ma'am, but it's not visible. Still it's not visible? Yeah. No, ma'am. Ma'am, will it take some time? Just a few seconds, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am, yes. Shall I start? Yes, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Professor Nidhi Samani. My topic for the research paper is revolutionizing transportation, a comprehensive analysis of electric vehicles, electric cars and vehicles in 21st century. Let's start with the, let's start with the introduction. The future of the transportation is electric. Electric vehicles are revolutionizing the automotive industry by offering sustainable and efficient transportation options. As we have seen, it is the transportation industry he is contributing to carbon footprints and is the major cause for global warming and climate change and uh, ozone layer depletion, etc. So this presentation will explore the potential of electric vehicles in 21st century. Research objectives of my study are to examine the evolution, current state, and future prospects of electric cars and vehicles, to study impact on technology, the environment, the economy, the society, to know the technological improvements, environmental impact, economic implications, sociological issues involved with the widespread deplo deployment of electric vehicles. So basically, this is a secondary study wherein I have gained the information about what was the uh, what was the idea behind introducing electric vehicles how it is being evolved what is the current state what is the acceptance level what are the future prospects what is the impact of technology on the environment and the technological improvements and economic implications benefits of electric vehicles as electric vehicles offers n number of advantages like zero emissions, like low operating costs, like low or reduced dependence on fossil fuels, like uh, uh, sensitivity or awareness or contribution towards our sustainable development goals, environmental and economic benefits, as well as the economic upliftment, et cetera. The requirement for the uh, electric vehicles is first of all charging infrastructure. Infrastructure plays a crucial role in uh, adoption of electric vehicles. So I have uh, I have studied into this area, and uh, the outcome or the finding was there is less of charging infrastructure available in India. So the adoption rate is least, and but the uh, Individuals are trying to adopt uh, electric vehicles and uh, government is promising fast charging stations and smart grid technologies uh, in coming future, uh, future years. Charging infrastructure, the development of charging infrastructure is crucial for widespread. And next is market trends. The global market for electric vehicles is experiencing rapid growth as consumers and governments are prioritizing sustainability. They are more towards uh, environmental concerns as they are experiencing 
increased diseases, increased uh, uh, climate change, increased uh, uh, breathing issues, etc. And autonomous and connected EVs are reshaping or will be reshaping future transportation. Battery technological advancements, innovations in battery technology uh, is significantly improved. The range and the performance of electric vehicles, the mileage of electric vehicles, the performance and the battery backups are being having improved range advancements in, in energy density and charging speeds are also increased. That's why people are towards adopting more uh, electric vehicles. Environmental impact as electric vehicles is towards zero emissions. So this will contribute to greenhouse, reducing greenhouse emissions and ultimately towards mitigating climate change. Not only that, but that will also contribute to environmental sustainability. And not only that, this will also help us to achieve uh, SDG number 10, that is innovation infrastructure and uh, climate change, life, life on land and life below water uh, by 2030, which is the aim of our United National uh, UN. And every country has to contribute. What are the challenges and opportunities for e in the EV industry? Electric vehicles offers numerous benefits, but there are challenges too. The major challenge is the cost issue because battery recycling, uh, charging infrastructure, uh, battery replacement, cost of traveling is high uh, with respect to traditional vehicles. So, uh, these are some of the challenges which we need to address in order to achieve sustainability and opportunities for innovation and growth. Conclusion, the, transport, the electrification of transportation re represents a tra transformative shift towards a sustainable and efficient future, but some of the challenges needs to be addressed and awareness among public towards environmental concerns needs to be addressed. And we need to drive positive environmental uh, sensi uh, sensitivity among uh, youths as well as among all the manufacturers. At, uh, and this can be done through various government uh, policies, regulations, and their programs, which will have greater economic impacts. Thank you. Any questions, sir? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nidhi. I have two questions uh, from you. Yeah. The first is, uh, can you explain sustainable development? Sustainable development is the development like uh, whatever we are consuming, we need to keep in mind that we also save that for future. So it is meeting the needs of present without compromising the needs of future generation. So we should use it very sensibly. We, we should be responsible in using and we should save everything for our future generation. Okay. Uh, this is very nice, sir. Another question is that, can you name some companies who are manufacturing electrical vehicles in India? In India, uh, Tata is Tata, uh, MG, um, and uh, second, Volkswagen and uh, Hyundai, TVS is manufacturing electric vehicles. And when it comes to two wheelers, Ola, TVS, uh, Ather, some are some of the brands who are manufacturing electric vehicles or they are procuring or importing from somewhere else. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nidhi. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi. The next participant is Professor uh, uh, Dr. Raghavendra K. Mishra. Uh, they, he has shared the video and I will share it with you.
Uh, Ma'am, is my screen is visible? Yes, screen is visible. You can proceed. Birds is not audible. Is it audible to others? No, sir. It is not audible. I'm sorry, we are facing a network issue. Give me two minutes. So do we have the co-author uh, in the presentation? Because uh, it's supposed to be presented by Dr. Raghavindra Mishra. Actually, sir, it is a video presentation he has sent uh, yesterday to okay. the uh, organizer. So the video presentation is acceptable? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Good afternoon, honorable dignitaries on the dais and uh, my dear attendees, myself, Dr. Raghavindra Mishra, working in Dr. Ambedkar Institute of um, uh, Man Management Studies. Is the video visible? Yes, sir. Can anyone please answer? answer? Yes, now it's visible. And, and audio. The audio? Yeah, okay. Th oh, thank you, sir. research Nagpur and the topic for my research paper is harnessing the harnessing digital promotion for fostering sustainable finance and before starting please allow me to share my screen okay so the research paper is all about importance of digital promotion for fostering sustainable finance and uh, as we all know, the world is changing remarkably due to digital interference. Innovative financial instruments designed to assist ecologically sustainable initiatives are becoming more and more prevalent uh, as a result of the pressing need for global action to address climate change. Now we can, this is not uh, a surprise if I say that everywhere green has become a buzzword nowadays, you can, we almost used to hear about 
green marketing, then green HRM, then green banking, green finance, and all these are related to sustainable development. And uh, in, in, the, in the field of sustainable finance, climate bonds have surfaced as an impressive instrument for rerouting resources towards climate protection projects and sustainability, sustainability oriented uh, initiatives. In this regard, the relationship between online marketing strategies or the digital promotion strategies and the climate bond investment landscape has drawn more attention because of the possible impact on investor behavior and market dynamics. Climate bonds to more popularly, popularly known as green bonds are a particular kind of fixed income securities, the revenue of which goes towards funding environmental friendly projects. These bonds are invest, intended to finance a broad range of projects, which includes uh, conservation and climate adaptation, then sustainable infrastructure development, renewable energy projects. They have been approved by independent third parties. Climate bonds are important not just because they are financially significant, but also because they help to achieve global environmental goals. Simultaneously, the digital platforms has transformed marketing and communication strategies, providing unheard opportunities for involvement and worldwide appeal. Digital marketing strategies, social media, and online platforms are now essential for spreading any sort of information or the knowledge forming public opinions and swaying customer behavior. In the financial sector, these instruments or the, these methods uh, of digital marketing, we can say, uh, are essential for advancing different investment vehicles, such as climate bonds by increasing investor engagement and understanding. In order to advance sustainable finance, it is imperative to comprehend the elements that influence investors' decisions regarding climate bond investment. The paradigm shift around investing have changed as a result of ethical and environmental concern, whereas the traditional method of uh, investing is basically based on returns and risk evaluations, where the main criteria considered uh, uh, in, traditional, uh, in traditional investment methods are how to, to evaluate the risk and returns. Online advertising has the power to sway investor opinions about the financial sustainability and environmental impact of climate bonds by creating narratives and spreading uh, information. Social media's ubiquity has exploded in recent years due to increasing digitalization initiatives and low data, data prices, a substantial uh, percentage of people in India were able to actively utilize the internet 467 as uh, the 467 million of them of uh, uh, Indians nowadays are using social media and this is for the reason the study looks into how different digital promotional strategies affect investors decision making when it comes to investing in climate bonds the result highlights how important digital promotion is in influencing the success and acceptance of climate bond investment in a sustainable financial environment. So this research generally adopts a questionnaire to collect questionnaire as a primary source of data. The, the respondents were from Nagpur city, which is having a population around 30, 35 lakhs. And out of these 200 sample of 200 respondents uh, uh, belonging to different age groups and socioeconomic categories or classes have been comprised of and data is collected from them. The questions mostly asked to them, there were around 20, 34 questions. The questions were Likert scale questions and generally uh, in a scale of agree to strongly strongly agree to strongly disagree and the sampling technique applied for this is random simple random sampling and the statistical analysis for the data so collected is done using spss software and the statistical test which is used is correlation analysis
the main objectives of this research paper is to study the impact of digital promotion on buying behavior of climate bonds or sustainable bonds by investors. Second, to know the perception about digital promotion, to study the awareness of users about climate bonds. For this, for uh, proving uh, hypothesis to be needed to be proved is the null hypothesis is there is no correlation between digital promotion of financial product and investment decisions and the alternate hypothesis is there is correlation between financial product awareness on social media and investment decisions in order to check the accuracy of the data and for the reliability of the data of the questions so asked to the respondents Cronbeck's alpha test was applied and the uh, Cronbeck alpha result of 0 0.712 which is based on 14 different questions which we are asked from to the respondent we can say that the scales are really accurate and <clears throat> we can rely on the data after data analysis we we found that there is a strong correlation between social media advertisement and enhancement in investment decisions as the pairs and coefficient for social media advertisement and enhancement in investment decision comes to the 0 .0, 0 0.804 and also the social media advertising has a direct impact on investment decisions of users here also pairs and coefficient comes at 0 0.0889 which shows a strong correlation between these two variables at five percent of so at five percent level of significance null hypothesis which is there is no correlation between financial product awareness on social media and investment decisions is rejected an alternate hypothesis is accepted which uh, say, says there is positive correlation between financial product awareness and social media and investment decisions so at, at the end we can conclude that the study clearly indicates that digital promotion has a positive impact on investment decisions of users people have become more aware of climate bonds and now paying more attention on climate bonds investment decisions it is advisable for financial uh, product sellers to maximize their benefits by exploring digital promotion for marketing their products so in this way we can say that if in the future prospects of this research is that after uh, studying we can conclude or i can i come to a conclusion that the digital promotion is influencing investors opinions and choice about climate bonds digital promotion techniques are very effective in increasing stakeholders engagement increasing public awareness and directing funding towards environmentally friendly projects Online campaigns that have been successful have shown to have the ability to pay uh, uh, have to pay the investing companies and uh, they can draw attention of the investors as well as foster deeper comprehension of the financial and environmental advantages of investing in climate bonds. Digital, digital promotion has raised public knowledge of the range of financial solutions that different financial firms provide. Majority of respondents in this research uh, stated that digital promotions are how people learn about, per, about the personalized goods that are most appropriate for them. We may conclude that digital promotion do influence investment decisions related to climate bonds and for stakeholders in the sustainable finance ecosystem, insights from the examination of effective digital promotion techniques and their effects on climate bond investment provides insightful counsel so this can be used by all financial institutions or the institutions who are interested in issuing green bonds or the sustainable bonds it can also uh, give insights to legislators and environmental groups to improve investor trust in climate bond issues improve transparency and design their promotional strategies so this is with this i come to an end of my presentation thanks a lot for having patience and hearing me thanks a lot
thank you, sir. So now we are concluding our uh, sessions. So on the behalf of 9th Green Summit, I would like to express my gratitude to, be, to our section chairs for the time and consideration and guidance throughout the sections. I would also like to thank all the presenters for their participation in making this conference a very informative and interest, interesting one. So regarding the conference proceeding book, certification and the feedback form will be shared through via mail within the working days 4 to 5. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Niveda, and all the participants uh, to present their presentation here. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you all for the nice presentation. All the best and wish all you all of you very happy New Year. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Uh, now all can leave the meeting. Thank you all. Putting that.